Okay, members of council, if you can please take your seats. We do have quorum. This meeting is now resumed. Before the recess, City Council was considering item CC 1.4 on provincially licensed cannabis retail stores in Toronto. We will return to that item after our 2 p.m. timed item CC 1.6 on engagement with the province on Toronto's transit system. I will now take the release of member holds. Release of member holds. None? Councillor Perks, do you have any releases? No. All right. So On the item for CC 1.6, we do have a confidential attachment. Um, so I would just like to ask members of council, if you have any questions as far as the, um, to our um, uh, legal department, um, and uh, we need to go on camera. If there's any questions at all on the legal advice, we need to go in camera. Is there a wish to go in camera? TTC. Okay, no. Okay, we'll proceed with CC 1.6. Do we have any questions? Questions to staff? Pardon? That was for cannabis. We're at TTC now. Okay. Councillor Robinson, questions to staff? Yeah, I just, I, I just wondered about the TTC leadership. Are they in, in, in agreement with this approach? Are they here? Is anybody from TTC here? There's a few bus drivers here, I think. So if I can through the speaker, I know Rick Leary is here. There he is right there. <coughs> okay, Councillor Robinson. Yeah, just wondering if uh, the TTC leadership is in agreement with this approach. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Yes, the uh, TTC has been in consultation all along with the uh, city manager and his office. We are in agreement with the, uh, the approach. Okay, and I just, again, wondered what protections are in place for TTC staff. You know, I understand TTC employs 12,000 full-time employees, so uh, any thoughts around that? Again, through you, Madam Chair. The, um, the TTC has not had direct negotiations or discussions regarding what is uploading, and that's really the question that we have at this time, uh, what it is and what it is not. So um, the recommendation of having the opportunity to sit at the table and determine what uploading is is important for us so that we can take those considerations into uh, account. So you have no idea of what, what's being proposed, like completely short on details uh, related to this issue? That is correct. And, and what information, uh, the province I understand is requesting uh, information. What, of all that information they're requesting, what's available online? Like what is actually public? Um, again, I'm, I apologize, but we don't have the information requirements at this time from the province. Okay, you don't have any requests for any budget numbers or does the city manager have any comments on that? So if I can to you, Madam uh, Speaker, the, all, what's in front of you is permission to engage in that conversation. So. Uh, in terms of what one would expect if we're given the approval to sit down at the table, there would be information regarding uh, the asset, uh, rolling stock, fixed asset, the condition of the asset, uh, you know, matters relating to the operation, uh, a lot of those details. Now, I'm saying that as one would expect, that would be what we would be asked for if at the table. 
So at, at this point, no information has been exchanged at this, at, on, as, as of this date? Uh, no, we have not, through you, uh, Madam Speaker, we have not provided them any of those details. I did provide, and it is in Appendix 3, uh, a response to a letter that was sent to me. And, uh, but again, we're not into any kind of uh, uh, details regarding anything related to an uploading because I don't have permission to uh, sit at the table. From Council? Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to TTC staff, uh, hi, Rick. welcome. Um, I just, the uh, question I had is, uh, as you know, one of the hallmarks of the TTC is that it's a fully integrated system where you have the buses, streetcars, that uh, subway is all seamless, like at the St. Clair West Station, uh, for example. Uh, what would happen if uh, the subway in this case would be carved off and it would be managed and controlled, owned and operated, whatever it is, by uh, the provincial government. What would that do to everyday service, uh, operation? Uh, I know in maintenance too, because I know you maintain the subway cars, you maintain the street cars, the buses. How does it affect maintenance? How does it affect the seamless operation of the system? Again, through you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the questions, that, again, we have to find out is what is uploading from the province? Um, what is very clear to me is that uh, at our role at the TTC in moving 1.7 million customers a day is very critical, and that 70% of those customers actually transfer to the subway from another mode. Um, our intent would be to secure uh, as much information and, uh, as possible you know, to prove, you know, we, we want to re rely on the mobility, the accessibility, the seamless travel of our customers, and that's the, the means of which we would have that discussion. So if the subway system was, again, carved off, operated, uh, maintained, whatever it is, by a provincial body, how would this affect everyday operation of the system uh, in terms of the riders? How could they, uh, would they feel the effects of uh, two managers or two owners? That's for you, Madam Chair. That, that would be the discussion. You know, my belief is that uh, we are an integrated system that serves the best for this city. Uh, and 89% of those that take our service come from within the city. So keeping it together is, is our intent. But again, we don't know what the upload means, what elements of the subway they're talking. Um, it'll be very important for us to get explanation on that. There are greater than 3,000 individuals that work in the subway today. In a, that's the direct number of people. There are a, almost that many indirect people that do work in that area as well. And isn't it uh, quite common then when you're doing the rail uh, repair and the signal system repairs on the weekends that you have to shut down uh, one part of the system like the subway and then you rely on the uh, seamless uh, support from the uh, buses and the streetcars to uh, offload uh, all the people that would have been on the subway. Uh, that is correct, sir. We do a number of weekend diversions, whether it's track, signal, power, uh, uh, infrastructure. So that is correct. We rely on the TTC buses and the TTC employees. So the direction to do that and to uh, meet those uh, you know, maintenance needs, uh, that comes from whom? Is it a different person in charge of the subway operations? or different people in charge of the uh, bus and streetcar? Who makes that decision to uh, do the uh, weekend uh, offload onto the buses from the subways that are under repair? So it's in internal cooperation between the executive team, those in subway that manage the control center in the subway, as well as those in bus that provide the services. And we have a divisions group that oversees all the diversions. Now, you're familiar with transit systems all over the world. Are there any models? Uh, whereby the uh, main uh, heavy rail is operated and owned and managed by one uh, entity and uh, then the uh, surface uh, system is managed and operated by another entity. Is there an example of that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, not to my knowledge right now. So this is uh, really uh, a first where you might have, because we don't know exactly what they want to do, but if you have this division of uh, operation, maintenance, management uh, into two parts, uh, 
you, you can't, like New York, for instance, uh, I, do they not have two management systems when they operate, uh, you know, the uh, heavy rail and the surface system? Uh, in New York City, they have uh, a president of New York City and they has a vice president of both rail and in uh, bus. So it's all within one. So it's combined? In those areas, correct. So this would be a first uh, in uh, major transit systems where you would have the division of a system managed or owned or whatever it is by two different uh, masters. Uh, I, I always have to revert back to the, the understanding of what uploading is still has to be determined. Uh, answer to your question, you are correct, but we don't know that that's the extent of what uploading is from the province. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Perks, questions? Thank you very, oh, thank you very much. Uh, again, to uh, uh, TTC staff, I'm looking at Appendix 4, which is the uh, terms of reference for the special advisor to cabinet. So the, the one place where we get a clue about what the province intends to do here. And the second bullet point, it says that there's a potential, the potential upload of the TTC subway system presents an opportunity to realize regional benefits. In the greater Toronto area, uh, if we're trying to imagine improving inter-regional transit, uh, does it make more sense to use commuter rail, which is not as frequent stops over long distances, or to have a subway-style inter-regional system, which is frequent stops, underground, heavy infrastructure, which, as a transit professional, makes more sense for those long-distance inter-regional trips? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, I've seen a number of structures uh, in my career, uh, and depending on what the urban makeup is, uh, I couldn't give you which is the best. Uh, regarding GO or a TTC when it comes to providing rail service. It's based on the ridership and the throughput of the right, area and the growth, as you oh, well aware. Okay, on the ridership, just for the sake of comparison, uh, the TTC carries how many people in a day? 1.7 million people a day, which about 70% of them transfer over to the... Uh, and the next biggest property carries how many a day? I believe GO is in the 350,000 range. And the uh, of a re uh, one of the... Uh, systems in the 905, what would the, one of those be like? Uh, York Region Transit, for instance, carries about, uh, I believe it's in the 90,000 a day range. We carry 85% of all the ridership in the GTHA when it comes to public transit. Okay, so, so given that, I'm going to go back to my first question. Uh, you, you said it would depend on the ridership. Is the current ridership pattern in the Greater Toronto Area such that uh, we have the volume of riders that make subway reasonable, but say, uh, Peel region does not. That would be correct. That would be correct. So the, the premise that the province has here of owning the subway system allows them to deal with inter-regional probably is flawed. Well, I would tell you that the, uh, the first bullet on that, uh, that context about evaluating the benefits and implications of uh, uploading the TCC is what I'm focusing on in the discussion with them to educate them on what, what we are and what we have. Okay, thank you. Uh, to someone from finance, approximately how much debt is on the City of Toronto's books related to the TTC? Just ballpark. Sure, through the order speaker. Of magnitude. We have uh, currently uh, $6.5 billion in outstanding debt, uh, of which about 60%, or roughly uh, $3.8 billion, is related to the TTC. Thank you very much. Um, it's, I've heard some people say that an advantage of doing this is that the province has better borrowing terms than us. Who has a better credit rating, the City of Toronto or the province of Ontario? Uh, the City of Toronto is rated uh, AA+, plus, uh, one notch higher than the provincial government. So we have a better credit rating. I've, I've heard it said that uh, the province has an opportunity to use some complicated financing, which they've, they've done, I believe, in the case of some of the expansion they're doing right now. Uh, but the provincial auditor had a concern about the way that they're treating that finance, if I recall correctly. Do you recall that as well? So uh, my understanding is that uh, the issue is related to how the province accounts for the deficit. And the provincial government, uh, one of the reasons that it purports that this would be an advantage is to be able to uh, amortize its uh, contribution and they need, uh, the claim is that they need ownership 
of the asset in order to be able to amortize the contract. But that amortization scheme, uh, the provincial auditor, as I recall, uh, indicated that they, she, had, she had problems with that kind of accounting. Am I recalling correctly? Uh, through the speaker, I'm really not familiar with the content of the auditor's report. Not the current one. It was a couple of yes. years ago. Okay, that's fine. You, you, um, to uh, back again to the TTC staff, on page 12 of the report at the top, uh, you state that uh, the future expansion of the subway system should not erode the safety of the existing network. Is that a reference to the overcrowding that exists and if we're loading more people on some of the stations within the city, there's an increased risk of people being jammed on the platform and there being a safety issue? Is that what you're talking about there? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, that's correct. As you're aware, on January 30th of last year, we had an incident on line one for heavy crowding. All right, and it's one of the things that we at the TTC focus on safety, very critical, and the crowding issues on line one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, through you to staff. Notwithstanding the questions that have been asked by Councillor Perks, which are all very good questions, um, when, were, when did the sort of discussion, when were you contacted by the province with respect to seeking opportunity to discuss the uploading? Maybe this to the city manager. Sure, if I can, through uh, you, Madam Speaker. Uh, first contact I had with uh, Michael Lindsay was in uh, uh, September 7th. I did meet with him at that point in time to get to know who he was. I think I had heard, obviously, in, in August that this uh, uh, possibility was, was unfolding. I think it was in August that they had announced that uh, Mr. Lindsay would be leading uh, the file uh, as their special advisor. Realizing that the discussion you had then with Mr. Lindsay were sort of preliminary discussions on, you were obviously of a view that whatever requirement with respect to uploading would require a framework in order to uh, start the discussion and to address some of the things that Council Perks has um, uh, addressed. Mr. Clary has uh, pointed out a number of concerns around safety and all those um, categories of, of things that would have to be discussed. Is that correct? Mr. Speaker, that's correct. Right. And so today, what we are actually simply talking about, it's not the details about questions that Councillor Cole's been asking, the question that, um, uh, you know, Councillor uh, Perks has, 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 has raised, but really about a framework and direction. Is that what's being seek, seek from Council today? Is that what you speak? You're correct. All right. And so, in as much as we have all these concerns, is, is it the province, um, uh, 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 does the province have the ability to simply, without asking us for an opportunity to meet, asking us to discuss this, to simply request that the TTC or change legislation to simply request that the, the subways be brought in, in, into their jurisdiction or into onto their um, leadership, if you will. Maybe that's to the solicitor. I don't know if it's the right. city manager. Yes, the province could do that. Similar to what we process we went through with the elections? Yes, although in this that. instance, it, it would be prudent for them to engage as, as they have uh, started to do. Right, so the province is approaching us to engage us to have some discussions to uh, help us to uh, work, as I think on one of the pages said, about negotiating a joint term of reference with respect to see how this could be done. That's what the city staff are proposing, proposing. the council recommend. Right, yes. and so that's simply what we would want to do in terms of going forward. <coughs> as opposed that's, to trying to define how operational activity is going to take place here on the floor of council without terms of reference. Yes, certainly that's what re what's recommended. I believe the city manager wants to add something. So if I can to the, the speaker, I think if you look at uh, Appendix 3, the, uh, the letter from Minister Yerk, uh, yep. he uh, uses the word partnership. <laughs> So, Is that the one dated the 29th to the mayor? Correct. Okay. Uh, just, just draw your attention to what the minister is saying to our mayor in terms of what that relationship he sees would be, and he uses, specifically uses the term partnership. So, yes, it is about a terms of reference. It is about the parties working together. Right. And uh, through you further, Mr. City Manager, would you agree that the province would, um, perhaps in your view, and, and I'm hoping that you can help me to, uh, to answer this, but have an objective in terms of not only transit improvement and betterment in Toronto, but for the region as a whole. Because we have 
uh, a variety of number of people. I don't know what the actual full number is, but it may be um, thousands and thousands of people who come into the city on a daily basis who also need better transit. If I can't hear the speaker, I just want to put a bit of a fine point on your on your word transit. I think it's again it's focused on subways. Okay. But but I will mention this though. I think if you look at page two yes. of the terms of reference for the. Uh, uh, for Michael Lindsay, it does make reference to and other strategic transit transportation assets in Toronto. So th this is why we're saying to you, we need to get to the table to understand what uploading really entails. Right. And so I guess my final question, I hope you can answer this, um, and maybe you can't, uh, but we look often at the federal government for funding with respect to transit, subways, and uh, buses, and so on. Um, we would if uploading were to take place, I presume would save some amounts of resources that could be applied elsewhere. Would that be so? I think, through the speaker, I don't want to, uh, you know, draw that conclusion uh, one way or another until we're able to kind of put the ev evidence in front of ourselves. But is that a possibility? Certainly. Uh, it's also possible that this there's there could be a deficit. So. Uh, but until we've sat at the table and, and gone over the facts, uh, we can't really conclude that. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Madam Speaker, I'll stand down. Councillor Thompson asked all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Menemwong. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know if this is to the CEO or to the finance. Can someone uh, tell me what the 10-year um, capital budget is for the, um, for the subways, the TTC subways? Ballpark it? Uh, through the speaker, the 10-year capital program for the TTC in its entirety, it's $12.6 12, it's 12 billion. I do not have a breakdown with respect to the various components within the TTC. But a large share of that would probably be for um, the subways, correct? Uh, I'm looking to the CFO of the TTC, and he's nodding his head in the affirmative, yes. So we're, we're, in, the, <laughs> we're in the realm of asking hypothetical questions. So I think I'm within, my, within the realm of other questions. But uh, one would, one, it would stand to reason that if in a hypothetical upload, if they were to take some some of those obligations off the city that we would have potentially billions of dollars to reinvest other places like housing or you name it. Is that a fair, fair proposition? Uh, again, I think through the speaker, uh, you know, that there is a possibility of that, but until we, I think, get to the table and go through the, you know, the assets themselves and, and the, uh, the ongoing maintenance uh, challenges and, and other matters, we really can't confirm. But to say that it's categorically not possible would be incorrect. Right. So, you know, the, the sky, you know, some folks might think in this discussion that the sky is falling, but it actually could turn out to our financial benefit. Do the speaker, that's correct. Um, the second question is I wanted to ask is about having, you know, a subway run by one or uh, capital run by one organization and then the subways run by one organization and then the, the, the surface routes run by another organization. So uh, this is a question to Mr. Leary. Mr. Leary, um, the subway goes up to Vaughan, is that correct? Through you, Madam Speaker, that is correct. So, so passengers disembark um, from, the, from the TTC trains and then some of them get on to York Regional buses, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. How's that working out? Um, we have a very close relationship with a number of our partners in the GTHA, Mississauga, York Region, and GO, uh, and we, it's been working very well. There is always some uh, challenges, but it's going very well. Yeah, and so we also have, um, so we, there's the GO train that goes along uh, to Mississauga. That's GO trains run by the province, yes? That's correct. And so let's say someone gets off at a station in Mississauga, they get off, they take the Mississauga Transit, yes? That's correct. They've worked out the kinks in that, haven't they? That's as far as I'm aware, yes. Thank you. Gonna pay two fares. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. I just wanted to review for a second exactly where we're sitting. 
and what you're asking us to do today, Mr. City Manager, as the City Council, vis-a-vis -vis any conversations, negotiations with the provincial government on this matter. Uh, if I can, through the speaker, I mean, there's been no negotiations. I mean, the, the position of council, I think, was made clear early this year in May when there was a, uh, a motion passed by council that specifically talked about uploading and that was not supportive of that. Um, so anything that I have done is really to introduce myself to the individual who's been charged with this file uh, to get a sense of uh, what are some of the priorities of the government. Uh, but keeping them, uh, you know, clear in his mind that I have, I'm in no position to negotiate or even to engage in any kind of meaningful conversation about terms of reference or anything like that. So, uh, and what, what are you asking us to do here today, to give you what authority? Uh, through, the, through the speaker is to give me the authority to working with the head of the TTC, to meet with Michael Lindsay, uh, to meet with the uh, CEO of IO, and uh, as well as Phil Verster of Metrolinx to begin a conversation about uh, the potential of uploading a subway. But clearly, uh, in my authority only goes as far as sitting at a table and discussing a terms of reference and, and, uh, and discussing the uh, individual items that would have to be uh, considered before any decision about uploading would be made. So I have no authority to make any decision about uploading. That would be up to council. And in your report, there is the attachment two, which is the guiding principles, I believe, of, of your work. That includes uh, good governance, policy and operations, and funding. And there are a number of concerns about safety and security of the system. I see you've included that here, but safety with uh, multi-organized uh, or multifaceted, non-integrated TTC, is that something that you would be specifically looking at, the implications of that around safety? So again, through the speaker, I think uh, similar to the question asked before, and I think the CEO of TTC has indicated that uh, we do have a, a substantial capacity problem uh, on uh, line one. Uh, our concern is in terms of any work that's done on the subway system that uh, first and foremost that the safety of the entire system be uh, priority one, hence the reason why both the TTC and the City of Toronto staff support making sure that uh, the operation of this system and whatever decisions are made that safety is going to be given top priority. And as far as funding is concerned, it says financial sustainability. I'm, I'm not sure and I may move that we augment that to really understand is that of the transit system or do we also have to look at the impact on the city's finances as a whole. Uh, someone asked about our credit rating. Would that affect our credit rating in any way, our ability to borrow, our bottom line uh, for the city? Is that something that you'd think would be a good idea to have looked at under financial sustainability? Through the speaker, I think that's reasonable. And um, the, also we have the public consultation process. It just says that. And I'm wondering if you're thinking that would be, I guess you'd report back every once in a while. How would you report back on what's going on? What's your, how do you anticipate doing that? Well, certainly through the speaker, we're committed to coming back in the first quarter. So, um, you know, I, I think it's important that, uh, um, aside from having permission to engage in this process, that uh, where there is, uh, and we believe and firmly believe that the, there should be opportunity for the public to weigh in at appropriate times. And uh, any reporting back to you within certainly that first quarter would reflect what we've been hearing from the public or well, certainly reflect what we've been hearing at the table. And how would you gather some of, do you have a plan to gather some of that information as part of your thinking, what people might identify things that maybe you haven't thought about or be able to augment some of your positioning? Sure. Well, I mean, again, it would, hopefully it would be something that all the parties could agree to in terms of a consultation approach. City of Toronto has done some very advanced consultation work, so uh, we would certainly bring those ideas or methodologies to the table and see if we can't get agreement from the province, obviously TTC and ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'm going to direct my questions to the Chief Planner or uh, to others as he see fits. I want to ask some questions related to the integration of land use planning and transit planning. So can you describe from a land use and a housing point of view the integration between our transit planning and our housing planning and the need to see them in concert? Well, uh, through the speaker, really whoever owns or operates a transit system, be it the TDC, Go Transit, or other transit operators, uh, one would hope that that arrangement is uh, beneficial to the goals, the planning goals that we have articulated in the official plan, namely that we have an integrated planning and transportation official plan. It's a hand in glove relationship really between uh, the way we plan transportation and the way we lay out and grow and manage the growth of the city. Uh, alignment of, of uh, provision of either existing or planned transit along our avenues and our centres in the downtown. Uh, laying out a grid of uh, planned transit across the suburbs. Among the goals that we have in the transportation side of the official plan and where we encourage growth to happen. So managing that whole transportation land use planning relationship is uh, critical to the betterment of the city and that's basically what the official plan says. Yeah. So our official plan says where we plan transit is where we plan housing and vice versa that's to support it. them both. And yes. if we can't plan transit then how can we plan housing I guess would be my question. And again the, the, the relationship between the two, the, uh, again uh, when you think about who owns or operates it, what's critical is that we, that we build a relationship uh, between the planning of the city, the land use planning of the city, the planning of the transportation system and that's uh, taken into account uh, with the, the operators and, the, and the, the people who actually run the transit every day. So we talk about this deeply connected integration between land use, housing, land use planning and transit planning on mobility. We often talk about the first mile, last mile. And so how does the integration between our transit planning and our mobility planning, getting people to the bus or the streetcar or the subway, how do those intersect and where is the challenge if they suddenly don't? Uh, through the speaker, so increasingly we would, we would use the word mobility to capture the broadest uh, range of mobility choices that we plan for, be it walking, cycling, um, uh, last mile issues related to bringing people into transit stations where they're, where they're planned or built, um, uh, the, the road network, all of the modes that support a, uh, ultimately uh, goals around uh, providing more choice and uh, frankly getting more people out of cars and, uh, and broadening out their choice to move around the city, uh, which have better impacts on, uh, obviously, on the environment and, uh, and build up the, the access to opportunity across the city that we want to see. <coughs> so, in effect, how, where and how we plan transit and the, through the TTC directly connects to where and how we plan the design of our streets, our cycling infrastructure, our pedestrian and sidewalk infrastructure for that first mile and last mile. I ideally, it's all connected through uh, our initiatives around complete streets and shared streets, yes. And so just building on that in terms of the mobility, perhaps I'll go to the CEO of TTC, uh, is how many weekday trips do we have on the TTC? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, it's 1.7 million passengers a day. 1.7 million passengers a day. And just for clarity, is that the largest and busiest of any transit agency in the country? Uh, that's correct. It's the third largest in North America behind Mexico City and New York City. All right. Now, of those 1.7 million weekday trips, what percentage of them are on the subway versus buses and streetcars? Uh, roughly two-thirds uh, for the subway. But they 70 percent of all the ridership takes a, another mode, bus or streetcar, to, and then uses the subway. All right. So we are the largest and busiest transit agency in the country, and 70 percent of trips utilize streetcar or bus. That's correct. And so if our ability to plan an integrated system for subway, streetcar, and bus directly connects to our ability to plan our transit system. That's correct. All right. Those are all my questions. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff. Um, currently, there, there is a major um, capital transit project being built by the province in the city of Toronto, and we call that the Eglinton Crosstown. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. And 
I'm reading this report and I'm reading the correspondence. And I, if my memory is correct, when, when that deal was put in place, we had a master agreement, but it wasn't as divisive and politicized. How is that different where prov the province has, has taken on a major capital project, is building a transit line from, from what they're proposing here? So through the speaker, it's not necessarily clear that the Crosstown model is what is being proposed here. Uh, in the Crosstown model, it's clear who is paying for operating maintenance. Uh, the province paid 100% for the capital. It's clear how service policy and fare policy will be set. These are exactly the kind of questions that we are looking to clarify through this engagement process with the province. So th these are the commencement of the negotiations. So when it comes to our subway system, there's also major real estate holdings and, and air rights. Is that, is that part of the discussion as well as a potential upload? Is there an evaluation put on that? Through you, Madam Speaker. So right now it's, um, it's too soon to tell. I think the first step is to understand what's in the infrastructure, which will translate into what that means from a real estate perspective. Now, when it comes to cross-jurisdictional responsibilities for transit system, New York City uh, comes to mind where, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the MTA is actually run out of Albany, uh, whereas it's primarily a, a, a greater New York City uh, transit system. Um, what are your observations of how that relationship works between uh, Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio? And I'm wondering whether you've heard from uh, Mr. Byford lately on, on how he feels in between those two. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, my understanding of what's happening in uh, New York is based on what I hear in the news, to be honest with you, sir, about some of the, uh, the ongoing uh, issues that they're having there with the capital investment requirements to improve the, the transit in the city. Would you say that's a, is that a successful model? Down there, um, right now in the industry, New York um, is having some significant issues with funding and its operations. So when people talk about models, I think it's not one that right now would, would say is, is, uh, has excelled as of, uh, as of late, I would say. You know, it's a, it's a fabulous system. It's well run by Mr. Byford. Um, but the question of funding and capital needs is still huge in the city of New York. It sounds similar to here. So um, no matter what we decide, um, and this, I guess this is back to legal, um, and, and, and it was touched on earlier, at the end of the day, does the province have the powers to expropriate the whole system, and can it be done without compensation based on the real estate assets? Under the current legislative framework, it cannot be done without compensation. However, the legislation is provincial legislation, so it could be changed by the province. And I, and I assume that accumulated debt that would go along with it would be offset by any kind of compensation for, for valuation. The, um, the debt is general obligation debt, so it does not attach to the assets. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor Tory. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, through you, uh, it may, well, this one may go to our financial staff. Mr. Frag, I think, was answering questions earlier. It's really just following on and perhaps clarifying uh, some of the answers coming in response to uh, Councillor Perks's question. And I think we were just hearing a second ago uh, about uh, the debt, and I, I just wanted to know, is, is any of our debt actually secured by the transit assets per se, uh, or does our debt structure operate differently than that uh, in the context of, of whether we would be in any way affected by the ta transit assets changing ownership and that, whether that would somehow have a negative effect on the city? Uh, through the speaker, uh, we have issued general obligation debt, so th this goes, it's not secured against any particular asset of the city. Um, and so the bondholders rely on the city's covenant uh, to service that debt and on the taxing authorities primarily of the city. So would it be fair to say, uh, and I, I heard the reference to our credit rating, which I'm proud, of, I'm sure as we all are, is, is of the fact that it is higher than that of the province, but is it fair to say that um, given that the TTC itself is actually 
uh, something that requires our subsidy, it, it, require, it operates at an operating loss, that the bond uh, issuers uh, would be unlikely to, uh, and given the debt structure, unlikely to uh, be particularly concerned about the transfer of this, uh, of this uh, asset uh, somewhere else if that ended up being the case uh, as a result of these discussions? Uh, through the Speaker, I think it's really, really premature to uh, provide you with a definitive answer in that respect. Um, I think the terms of whatever realignment of financial responsibilities at the end of the day, once those are decided, we can better provide you with an assessment of how that impacts our credit rating and how that's viewed by the bondholders. Okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, the next uh, thing uh, Councillor Perks referred to, the amortization scheme of the province. Uh, maybe rather than calling it a scheme, they have a different uh, accounting method at the province and perhaps it, it would be worthy uh, for all of us just to explain the difference between how they account for things and how we do uh, simply so that people can understand the contrast between the two and then I view it as this process uh, being one that would explain whether that's good for us or not, but perhaps you could just explain the difference between how they account for things and how we do and how, that, uh, how the two contrast when it comes to, say, paying for transit. Um, certainly through the speaker. Once uh, 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 the province makes a capital contribution to a municipality, that capital contribution, in effect, is expensed in the year that it's made and all other things equal, it would impact their deficit. Um, on the contrary, though, the, the position that they're taking is that should they make that contribution to an asset that is owned by the province, then they have an ability to amortize it, and therefore the consequential implications on their deficit are minimized. So that could mean, and again, this is part of what we need to find out, that, that by, by amortize you mean that it's spread out over a period of time. Am I right that it could be as much as 40 years? Uh, yes, it's typically amortized over the useful life of the asset. So it could be longer than 40 years, but the bottom line is it could, theoretically, and this is what, what we have to go and find out, uh, uh, allow them to give a lot more to, to an asset they own because they could take that amount that they had and spread it out over a long period of time as opposed to giving us a check to build a subway or whatever we're building. Uh, through the speaker, I, I think that's certainly a, one model that we need to um, do our due diligence on, but there may be others, and you know it's really too early to speculate on what other models could be could achieve the provincial objective without transferring uh, ownership in its entirety to the province. I, I don't have any particular opinion on this at the moment. I don't know enough to have one uh, about this particular aspect of it, but I'm just trying to get on the table here. This is one of the things that they will argue that's worthy of listening to their arguments. I want to ask one other question through you, Madam Speaker, that is, I don't know whether it goes to planning or to legal. Um, ordinarily, would the owner of the land uh, of, of the land, say, around a subway station, a uh, transit station, would the owner of that land be, be required to follow our, our, our planning and approvals process and apply for anything they wanted to build there? Uh, through the Speaker, yes. The, uh, subject to the Ontario Planning Act, any owner, private owner, would be subject to this Council's determination of the permissions on that, that land, other than if the province or the federal government, for that matter, invoke crown right, and they, have, they would have jurisdiction over our bylaws. So uh, you got to my second question, Madam Speaker, which is the province or the federal government, uh, they have the right to either a, a torrent to our jurisdiction, in other words, recognize our jurisdiction over planning and apply like everybody else, or not. Am I correct in that? Uh, that's correct, and there are examples of both. So they could theoretically develop some piece of land like a around a transit station uh, without regard to our uh, planning uh, regime. They could, yes. All right, and then would I be correct in saying that as well, with regard to any benefits that came from such development, if they did it on their own, if they were the owner of the land, uh, they wouldn't necessarily have to share any of that benefit with us because we would no longer be the owner, unless it was by agreement that they, would, uh, uh, that they wouldn't have to share any benefit from that. I would agree with that summary, yes. Thank you. Those are my questions, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You say that with so much enthusiasm. Uh, my questions are for the. Uh, <laughs> my questions are for the uh, the city manager, please, uh, through you, um, Mr. City Manager. Uh, I know you haven't been with Toronto that long, but you have the experience as a city manager. And would it be fair to say that, you know, a big role of yours is uh, to do intergovernmental relations, to deal with various orders of government in trying to organize systems and. Uh, and, and agreements. 
uh, through the speaker, that's absolutely correct. Now, are there a lot of things in the city that are multi-jurisdictional? Uh, let's take our roads. Um, there are uh, provincial level highways, there are city level roads, there are local roads. Uh, there are rail systems that are, are owned by other, and some are private entities actually to move goods and things throughout here. Is this the only transit, op is the TTC the only transit operator in the city of Toronto right now? Uh, through the speaker, no. no we've, got, we've got Metrolinx, we've got UP, we've even got Via Rail and, uh, and, and other rail companies. So is there anything radical that's proposed here or is this, is this something that you know, is par for the course in the very complex world that we live in? I think Councillor Minin Wong, uh, or Deputy Mayor Minin Wong alluded to it that you know, our subway doesn't even stop at the 416 border. Is this, is this surprising to you or something that the city manager's office isn't equipped to look at? Well, I, I certainly, through the speaker, believe our office is equipped to look at it. Um, is this radical? I don't know if I'd use the word radical to right. describe it. And I guess, uh, you know, would it surprise you? I mean, I'm somebody that gets on the subway out in the West End on, you know, Kipling or Islington, Islington most days. Um, would it surprise you that I don't believe that most of the riders that I'm getting on with are actually live in my ward or Councillor Grimes or Councillor Ford's ward out there? Perhaps they're from Mississauga and there's a, a regional importance to the subway out there and hence there's a regional discussion about this. Um, certainly uh, through the speaker, I, I think most people just want great service and are probably indifferent as to what the logo is on the side of the vehicle. Um, Clearly, Toronto is, uh, benefits from having a regional transit system. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously a lot of jobs in the city are accessed from outside of the city of Toronto. So um, hopefully that answers your question. And in addition, would it be helpful to have planning at a regional level? I think about, do we know even our LRTs in or out of the mix? And is the answer I don't know? Say that, ask that question. Are, are LRTs in and out of the discussion? Um, and it's okay to say I don't know. Well, I appreciate your comment. I, you know, again, I think, you know, once we're at the table, we'll really know fully what it is that they have in mind. Um, in your report, you talked about a lot of lenses to look at this in. I, I know we talked a lot about financial today, but some of the things that I see in the report are safety and security, uh, mobility options, Councillor Cressy talked about. You know, a big one here is about alignment of the city's uh, infrastructure investments and the city's planning objectives. You know, and I'll give you the example of, uh, let's say, an LRT that's heading out along Eglinton out in the West End where I live and where I represent a community. Um, you know, any changes uh, are, are quite fundamental to city planning over the decades to go forward. And I guess maybe to round it up, my question to you is this. In your advice as a city manager in dealing with intergovernmental issues and with the whole gamut of things that are of concern to this city, is it your advice that we stay back and be a wallflower in this entire discussion with the, with the province? Or really that you, city manager, get your experts to the table? And there's quite a number of categories here, and their chief planner, our infrastructure people, the whole gamut of people to get in on the conversation and identify those issues uh, as detailed as possible or to I guess the other option is just hold back on them and, and leave them to chance. So through the speaker, uh, clearly the recommendations that we put in front of you is for us to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much, Madam Speaker. Um, through the chair to the city manager. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more uh, about how the existing guiding principles were developed? Uh, through, the, uh, through the speaker, we, we certainly did have a look at the terms of reference as guiding uh, Michael Lindsay uh, from the standpoint of gaps, uh, gaps that uh, would concern us as city builders. And, uh, and certainly a number of us, when we look at the growth of Toronto, and when I say growth of Toronto, the million people that are going to be residing here or thereabouts in the next 20 years, you know, the development patterns that are going to be necessary in order to accommodate that growth and the transit support that will be necessary in order to sustain that population. So we, we looked at all of that. Uh, we looked at, you know, the importance of engagement uh, of our citizens. Uh, these were things that were not evident in, in the in the black and white of the documents we're reading from the province. 
um, as well as uh, obviously our financial concerns. So all of that, I think, uh, we want to make sure that those principles and related objectives were clear to you and that we'd be taking forward to the table if given the direction. Great, thank you. Um, you're right, a lot of the conversation today has focused on the financial element of this. That's, that's hugely important and that relationship. Um, but there are also other pieces and I'm heartened to hear you talk about the city building uh, component of this because we know transit is really about access to opportunity uh, and that's why it's so important here in Toronto and in fact the region. Um, were there any, any considerations uh, for including values such as equity, accessibility as part of this, this framework? Through the speaker, um, I think that's a very important term uh, to bring up in this debate. Um, because the other part of this is the seniors that are that we want to live out their lives in their homes and uh, their ability to address issues like social isolation uh, and the ability to have a transit system that enables them to you know go to their appointments meet with their friends stay active in the community so that that to me is an equity as well as the ability to access a job uh, is another element of equity so um, you know, I, it, it does strike me that in terms of the words we chose, uh, that's one word that is probably an important addition. Yeah, I, w I would just agree, agree with that. And, uh, you know, it is the notion that we're ensuring that we're delivering transit across the city and, and in fact, to those neighborhoods that, that really need it. So thank you very much. That's all. Thank you. Councillor Layton. <coughs> Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, can someone, I'm, I'm not too sure who will be best equipped to answer this question. Uh, Metrolinx recently changed their approach to determining where stations would be located along the existing go lines and the expansion in their expansion. Can someone explain to me what changed? So through the speaker, there, there's not necessarily a change in the process, but what has happened is that the new go stations have been drawn back from the Metrolinx procurement process at the time in order to pursue uh, third party agreements, market, a market driven approach to see if there are development opportunities that may be able to go hand in hand with the stations. So a market driven approach, can you explain that please? So uh, through the speaker, uh, councillors may be aware of the deal that was announced by Metrolinx related to the redevelopment of the Mimico station as an example where uh, uh, an arrangement is being negotiated with, uh, with a third party developer of an adjacent property to contribute to the, uh, the costs of refurbishing that station. Our understanding, which is still very sketchy, is that Metrolinx is wanting to pursue a similar sort of approach with all new stations on the GO system. Sure, then maybe uh, you can, don't, don't, don't go anywhere, because okay. I'll be right back. Uh, to our chief planner. Um, was the, we expected the transit pattern in South Etobicoke to go and be built out a certain way. Were urban planning, land use planning decisions uh, made based on that expected pattern of growth? Expected in terms of a land use plan, things change. And for example, the Christie site has closed and we have interest there for mixed use development. So things do evolve and change, but yes. But we make our land use plans based on uh, the, the, the transit plans that are in place try to do them as much as possible hand in glove. We have to make adjustments on both sides of the ledger as we evolve. Sure, but let's talk city place, Liberty Village. South Etobicoke was supposed to be, and South Etobicoke was supposed to be served by the Waterfront West LRT, which was on the books for many years. At, at one point in time, a funded project, is that correct? I believe so. What changed? What changed? Who made a decision not to fund that project anymore? <laughs> Through the speaker, um, that was, as I understand it, part of um, Transit City and decisions were made not to... Uh... But who made the decision not to pursue the Waterfront West LRT? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have, have the... Uh, At one the point in time, the previous government headed in the plan to fund, the previous provincial government headed in the plan to fund the Waterfront West LRT. Correct? Is that correct? I thought it was correct. They canceled the funding in, in, in 2000 and it was Jane was funded. So the Jane, the, the Jane LRT was a funded project and that funding, who, whose decision was it to change the funding model? 
so the provincial government withdrew or cancelled a lot of funding for some of the uh, transit city projects a number of years back. Um, so Eglinton has a sordid history of transit planning. Let's look at that. Who made the decision to cancel the original uh, higher order level of transit on Eglinton? Was it the city or was it the province? Through the speaker, that was the province that cancelled that. So uh, something that was shaping our land use decisions at the city, a project that was cancelled. Uh, and that project was moved to a different line. Who chose where that would be moved? Through a different line. Through the, through the speaker. Could you clarify the... The, the transit line that was an east-west transit line that was supposed to be on Eglinton mysteriously uh, appeared on Shepherd. <laughs> through, through the speaker... Who's got uh, the Scott. deepest his, historic knowledge of the subject? Through, through the speaker, uh, there were changes made in the 1990s, as you describe, where some projects were unfunded and others were changes. In the end, uh, many of the decisions would have been made by Metro Council, but fundamentally they came from the province Thank and you. held the funding reins. So we have a, po a pattern of land use decisions being made based on transit lines, and then the plans changing at the provincial level to suit whatever needs they had. Was a market-driven approach used to determine the, uh, the location of stations along the Shepherd Line? Does anyone know? Through the speaker, I'm not aware of that having been a, 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 a factor in the planning on that one. Now, does the market-driven approach calculate in what densities would it, were, or, or how we would serve existing neighborhoods, or it all, is it all focused on future growth potential? I think, I think the, the words market, through the speaker, the words market-driven approach, which is word choices made by uh, Metrolinx and their communications. Uh, I take it to mean involving the market in helping to fund the construction of transit stations as opposed to where you may or may not put a line. So they're trying to invite, as we, as we would, uh, opportunities to engage the market in and around transit stations to facilitate the development of those transit stations or at least connections to those transit stations better opportunity that presents itself. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Wong Tan. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, and through you to the city manager, uh, at, in your meeting uh, with, uh, I believe, Ministry of uh, Transportation officials, um, you would have expressed to them that council had taken a previous position in May 2018. Uh, that we should continue to own, operate, and maintain the Toronto subway system. Uh, and you made that evidently clear to them in that meeting. Is, is that correct? Uh, uh, through the speaker, in the meeting and in writing. Okay. And uh, what was the, the, um, the response of the province uh, in, in the meeting uh, when you stated that? How did they respond to that statement? Through the speaker, there's no response. No response. Um, but yet they expect you to go into some good faith negotiations when they couldn't even respect that one clear statement that you provided them. I, I think through the speaker, in fairness to Mr. Lindsay, I think he's been asked to undertake a certain line of work of which the goal is to engage us, in fact, to go further and have us participate as a partner of some form. Um, so that's his mission, and uh, I think that's you know, that's what he's doing. And at that meeting, uh, in your personal meeting with uh, Mr. Lindsay on November the 5th, uh, did you ask him to clarify what uh, uploading meant? Um, I, I think at that point, uh, I would probably be in contravention of, of my limited uh, reign or my limited ability to kind of uh, start nego I don't want to go negotiate without authority, basically. So uploading, I think as we understood it, there's a lot of holes in it. Uh, we're not clear on what exactly is meant, and so I think that's, again, the reason why we need to get into detailed discussions to understand the limit of uploading. But wouldn't it make sense, uh, because you were sitting across from each other uh, from a table, that a very simple question such as, what do you mean by uploading? Uh, that should just be very s simply answered. Um, through the chair, I, I, it, it may seem simple, but I think it's probably a little bit more complex. Um, Certainly matters related to stations uh, were uh, part of the conversation. Just, you know, is this simply a matter of, of the land under the track or does it go beyond that? 
And really, I think the, those kinds of details, I, I think, are really what we have to sit down and talk about as to what does this really mean. So in the letter from uh, Mr. Uh, Lindsay, oh, sorry, Mr. Th Mr. Thompson, um, uh, sorry, Mr. Lindsay to, to yourself and uh, Mr. Murray, um, it, it outlines discretion and confidentiality and how data and information should be shared and collected. Um, and it clearly says that the TTC and the city representative should be required to execute non-disclosure and confidentiality agreements prior to participating in the exercise. But it also says that the MTO would also consider exercise, exer, uh, executing a reciprocal confidentiality agreement. So my reading of this is that the city has to sign a confidentiality agreement, but the, but the MTO would consider it. Is that your reading as well? Uh, I think at the time through the speaker that was our reading, but we, we did mention to them, I think in the letter that I sent them back, that there is already a vehicle for us to share information between the province and the city. Um, it is the Toronto uh, Ontario uh, Cooperation uh, Communication Agreement. And, uh, you know, that does allow us to certainly exchange information. But I, I must admit, I did have some concerns, the tone of the you know, confidentiality. I mean, there's, there's so much information that is available that would be, you know, accessible through FOI or any other means. I think our point is to make sure that this is done in, in a transparent manner as possible and that, you know, only those things that would be deemed legitimately commercially sensitive would probably be subject such as maybe matters related to real estate that one might argue is a confidential matter. But beyond that, our goal is to be as transparent as possible. And for the amount of information that the province is requiring from the city and the TTC, uh, a lot of work will have to be done in order for you to provide the information that they're looking for. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, what can you just give us a scope of the work that that will that will need to be done, and then who, uh, and do we have the the, the capacity to do all that work uh, within the staff complements that are here, and uh, and if not, then who should pay for that? Um, I think a lot of the people that you see here right now answering questions would be the kinds of skill sets that we would need to participate in this in this exercise. So clearly, legal, planning, real estate, government relations, uh, you know, transportation, transit. I mean, all of us. The province has so indicated a willingness to compensate the city for not just our time, but I think as well if there's, there's outside specialists that would be needed in order to. Uh, ask the right questions and, and participate meaningfully in this process. So there is a willingness for them to pay. Thank you. Okay, that's it for the questions. To speak, Mayor Tory. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion which I think has uh, been circulated. And, no, uh, uh, just one sec. Pardon me? The mayor is speaking first, Councillor Matlow. Okay. Uh, Mayor Tory. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have a motion that I think has been circulated and that's in front of you now, uh, and uh, it, it uh, is meant to sort of encapsulate, I think, the concerns many of us have uh, about uh, this process. And, and uh, I, I want to begin by thanking the city manager for the fact that he's been helping us to uh, deal with this correspondence and with these uh, uh, these encounters that we've had uh, since uh, uh, since this matter first emerged, really, I guess it, if you go all the way back, it emerged in discussions uh, and, and comments made by the previous Premier, uh, and then uh, it came out again in the platform of the Conservative Party before Mr. Ford was the leader, and now uh, he ran uh, during the campaign and said this was something that he was going to pursue. But um, while it did come up, it only came up as what I'll call a political slogan. It was just, we're going to upload the subway, and, and there was no detail, and there still isn't any. And if you ask me, Madam Speaker, whether I want to end up ever again, ever on any matter, in a situation where um, we are finding ourselves as the recipients of what was a profoundly unacceptable process that got us to 25 people in this chamber, uh, I would say no. And I think the best chance we actually have of ending up in that position is if we just say, forget it, we're not going to talk to you, there are going to be no meetings, we're not going to give you any information because I think the result would be very similar. And we've seen. Uh, the legal opinion coming from our solicitor uh, about that and I think that as a result I'm certainly of the view that we'd be well advised to uh, sit down at the table and start, try to find out as our order of business 
what does uploading the subway mean? And we've heard repeatedly from some of our staff, we've even heard in many of the questions here today, um, answers that are very non-specific, not because they're trying to evade it, but because they're saying, as I'm saying, as we know, nobody really knows what it means. So we've got to find out what it means and then uh, determine uh, what we think about the answer uh, when we hear it uh, from a number of different perspectives. And so I've said all the way along in, in answer to questions about this that go as far back as when Premier Wynne uh, may have mentioned it or did mention it, and certainly Mr. Brown had it in his platform when he was the leader of the opposition, uh, that you know, you'd have to see what the deal was, but that the bottom line for us was we are not looking for a solution in search of a problem here. Um, so we would have to see a deal or, or the makings of a deal that were beneficial to all of uh, the employees of the TTC, the riders of the TTC, and the citizens of the City of Toronto. And we, we have no idea whether that deal is good, bad, or indifferent. We, we don't know. Uh, some of my questions were meant to, to obviously illustrate some concerns that I have going into this, for example, on the matter of uh, development rights, both in the context of uh, controlling uh, the quality and scale and, and design and all the things we manage here through our development approval process, but also the benefits from it. Uh, from, from land that has been in public hands in the ownership of the TTC, which effectively means the City of Toronto for a long time. And so I have no idea what the answer to that question is because you heard our chief planner answer that, uh, frankly, if they wanted to uh, go along with our planning process, they could, but they also could thumb their nose and say, forget it, we're going to build there whatever we want. That should obviously be a matter of deep concern to everybody in Toronto and certainly to every member of this council. So I think in the end, the best way to protect the, the transit system for now and the subway and protect all of these various interests including development on these pieces of land around transit stations and all the rest is to go to the table and get answers to the questions. There's probably been 200 questions asked in here and I said the other day there were a thousand so there's another 800 we haven't asked in here today that we would want to ask at a table but you can't ask those questions and get an answer if you're not sitting there. And so I just believe that uh, it will allow us, these discussions, to come to a detailed understanding of what uploading is. Uh, I have in this motion tried to set out some reasonable parameters around our participation in those discussions so that we will have uh, a, you know, a defined group, uh, including the city manager. There will be some reporting expectations that come from that, uh, that we've indicated from the outset as a council, as we've done before, uh, our continued support for uh, public ownership of these things, uh, these assets, and, and so on and so forth. I think it will also allow us to uh, take a look at the valuation of these assets, which may be something that's worthwhile to do in any event. Perhaps we should have done it uh, some time ago, uh, just so that we would know. Um, so I believe that going forward to participate subject to the reasonable kinds of conditions that are set out in my motion is the best way to go, so that we can both protect our interests, uh, represent our interests, understand how our interests would be affected by whatever their plans are, understand what their plans are in considerable, uh, if not excruciating detail. Um, and I think uh, that um, uh, to simply refuse to take part in this exercise would be to invite, would be to invite a fate not unlike what happened with the council. And, and, and I think that was something where we just viewed that process and rightly so all of us, I think, well not all, but most of us did as a profoundly unacceptable uh, process and I just don't think we want to repeat it and I think this allows us the best chance to find out how our interests would be affected and to stand up for them um, sitting there with the very people who have initiated this discussion with what as I say amounts to nothing much more at the moment than a political slogan. So I, I, I commend people to, to this motion. I hope they will support it and look forward to hearing the other speakers as we go through uh, the balance of the debate. Thank you Madam Speaker. Thank you. We do have questions. Um, Clarification of the motion, Councillor Kerjianis. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The mayor has talked about political slogans. I don't want to say about political slogans and smart track and everything else and standing up. Mr. Mayor, my question to you is this. I didn't see anything in there about the Shepherd uh, subway, the extension going in Scarborough or going west to Downsview. Would um, you be prepared to a friendly amendment that if we were to put that in there that you take it up with the, uh, uh, with the Premier? No, uh, the reason I wouldn't, uh, Councillor Karajanis, is simply because, through you, Madam Speaker, because we have a transit plan at the moment. Um, what he's talking about here is uploading existing subways that exist, uh, of which the Shepherd subway is not one. And I'm not passing any judgment on a, a future Shepherd subway and saying that I wouldn't go along with that friendly amendment, but simply saying that I don't think we want to complicate agendas here. This is complicated enough. And what we're talking about is taking existing subways and uploading them to the province, whatever that means. And I would like to go to the table, um, and I would like to 
uh, to uh, um, find out what it means. There is a statement in my motion that talks about them moving forward with the relief line, uh, and that is based on comments they have made uh, as recently as last week about this being their top priority, and this is really just meant to confirm something they said that I think should hearten uh, the minds of a lot of us, that they're finally saying that this is a top priority for them as it is for us and that we all can move forward on it together, whereas the Shepherd subway is a long way back. I mean, they've even approved the, the relief line uh, through their environmental uh, assessment process and so it's at a stage that it's never been at before and really this is just meant to make sure that in discussing the uploading uh, that we don't in any way delay uh, proceeding <laughs> with the relief line and that we have their enthusiastic uh, commitment to ex expedite that if possible. Um, the Premier has made an enthusiastic commitment about Shepherd. Relief line is not existing. Relief line is something that we, we started working on um, and we certainly talked about it, uh, starting to work on Shepherd but that fell by the way line. So if this is not existent, the relief line, and you want to take it up, and the Premier is uh, encouraged by this, and he's talking about the Shepherd, why don't we uh, put them both together, or is it that you don't want to build the Shepherd subway? No, it, 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 Madam Speaker, through you, the, the, my concern is this, that the, the relief line is a project that's been approved by the Council as part of our, our transit plan. It has gone an extensive way down the road in terms of the regulatory process to actually receive approval to proceed to the next phase, which is construction, uh, on the part of, of the partners, the city, the province, and the federal government. And to me, to put a, a, a transit line, whether it's frankly the Shepherd subway or any other one, that is not at that stage and just put it in here now and say that we're adding this to the mix of something that's already a very complicated uh, uh, complicated matter of, of the potential uploading, um, I, I just think is a mistake uh, for us to do that, notwithstanding whatever the Premier's enthusiasm may be for the Shepherd subway or any other transit project. The relief line is because we're going to have development along the way. And I'll tell you, uh, Mayor, we're going to have something like six or seven towers coming along Shepherd. That should also be in there. The Shepherd subway should also be in there. Well, I, I, uh, Madam Speaker, I accept the member's opinions on this as being his, and I accept his uh, I understand and I've heard him speak before passionately about the Shepherd Subway as I have Councillor Lai. I just think for purposes of this motion, on this day, on this matter, uh, to put that in now, given the stage that it's at, which is simply nothing more than a very prominent discussion point among a number of elected representatives provincially and municipally would be a mistake. It doesn't fit the, the slogan. Councillor Wong Tan. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and uh, through you to the Mayor. Um, thank you very much for this motion. I wanted to just ask you to clarify point five. Um, you're asking City Council to direct the City Manager to retain a third-party validator for the City to determine all asset values. Um, can you just unpack that for me? Well, I think, uh, Madam Speaker, through you, I think uh, that one of the issues that will obviously come up here in a number of different contexts, it could be simply if, if they're going to upload the subway, uh, you know, and this was covered in part in some of the discussion that took place with the city solicitor, would they upload it for value? In other words, would they write us a check and say, well, you know, it's worth this much and, and, and we're going to write you a check? We obviously, none of us, I don't think, know what the value of it is without having it uh, validated, uh, uh, e evaluated. Um, I think what this is meant to say is that we would want to have, if, if they appoint, for example, an evaluator and come back and say, we think it's worth X, we would want to have some ability on our own part through a third party, mean, meaning not their validator, uh, to, to, to uh, assess that valuation to make sure that it's fair. And so I think it is simply one of those things, and the same would apply to development rights. If, for example, they said, well, we're, if we upload and we're going to own this, and we are going to see those lands developed around the transit, which we probably sometimes, subject to the form of the development, would think might be all right for affordable housing and other things, uh, then uh, what, what is it worth? What are the air rights worth? So it's just saying just, that just to if, clarify, if you Mr. want to have these assets valued and they appoint somebody to value them, that we would have the authority here to, to the city manager would to retain a third party to I check those to, valuations. Th thank you for, the, for that very full answer. Um, I just want to ask one more point. Uh, under the, under the early uh, preliminary conversations between the city manager, the, uh, the, uh, the TTC staff, as well as the MTO staff, I think there, the, the implication there was to have the city uh, pay for valuation of the TTC infrastructure, their assets, and also to determine its liabilities, um, and that they would somehow compensate us uh, for that cost. Uh, is your motion now in, uh, intending that we no longer provide that information that's requested and only only when we are needing to validate information that they provide us no i think that, what that it we says do that. fairly clearly 
is that the City Council direct the City Manager to retain a third-party validator for the City to determine asset value. So then, then just it could frankly be either way. Then, then just to clarify, because I think they're expecting us to, to evaluate the, the assets and the infrastructure. Uh, so therefore, you're suggesting that we then hire a third-party validator to uh, verify, peer review our, our own work. Is that what you're doing here? I, I think it may well be a belt and suspenders thing in the sense that if the, val if the valuation is actually done by a shared valuator or by their valuator, that we would have, the city manager wouldn't have to come back here to get authority to look at someone to assess on a third-party basis those valuations. I just so want to make sure that we're not paying for something twice. No, I, I don't think that would be the intention at all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is that actually a correct answer? Councillor Lai. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, uh, through you uh, to uh, Mayor John Tory. And uh, I just uh, wanted to ask about the point number four on your proposal that uh, the relief lines that we built as a priority and as quickly as possible. And I just wanted to uh, echo uh, Councillor Kerjana's uh, point about uh, that uh, Shepherd Subway is being not overlooked, and uh, the citizens of Scarborough really ha is hoping to have that. And I actually got elected for that platform, and I just hopefully, uh, I don't know whether you have a plan for that. Maybe you can share if you do have a plan. Madam Speaker, I thank uh, Councillor Lai for that question, and, and uh, I'm well aware of the, of the very um, uh, keen and, and repeated interest that, that these two councillors, Kara Janice and, and, and yourself, Councillor Lai, have shown in a Shepherd Subway. I'm simply saying we would be going back to the old ways of transit planning if we just stuck into a motion like this. Uh, our uh, great enthusiasm for building the Shepherd Subway immediately when we went to all the trouble last term of developing, our staff did, and we approved a transit plan. And the relief line, of course, is a very important part of that approved transit plan and furthermore has been through an extensive part of the regulatory process to get it to the stage where it's almost ready for construction. And there's work being done, pre-construction work now. And so if we want to have discussions with the province about the Shepherd Subway, given that they too have expressed interest in addition to what you've said, I'm only saying the place to do that is not here. The place to do that is for us to say, all right, um, if we're going to have that discussion and it's a priority of theirs and we believe our transit plan should be amended uh, to include that, well, then that's a discussion for another day, not here. Okay. And Thank so you. I'm not ruling anything in or out. I'm just saying this project, the relief line that is referred to here, they have also expressed interest quite recently in really getting on with and really speeding up. I was thrilled to read that. It's one of the things that made, has made me happiest since they took office. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just don't think it's the time now to start adding in either projects we think are important or they do or everybody does and just start amending our plan on the fly like that. I, we have a plan and I'm interested in getting that plan built and there's a lot in that plan that we haven't built yet and we've got to get on with doing it. Thank you. And through the speaker, and I, I totally agree with you, um, Mayor to uh, Tory, because people ask me if we're going to build a shepherd, shepherd line and then they're going to be so congested in the downtown, it's, it's not going to really serve the purpose. So I do agree with you, but I just wanted to raise the point that uh, we, the citizen of Scarborough really deserves uh, uh, quicker and better service. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank, thank you. <coughs> Councillor Billion. Just as a follow-up to Councillor Wong Tam's question on point five, um, who is it intended that the validator would provide the information to? I think I'd be correct in saying perhaps that it would be to us, uh, simply to assure us that the valuations, whoever they've been prepared by and received by, I guess there may be, there may be less need. He doesn't have to. We've directed him to do it, uh, to determine asset values, but if he's satisfied, I suppose, or we all are, because he's going to be reporting to us on a regular basis that the valuations we've paid for and received are adequate and fair, then I guess you don't need to have this. Uh, you don't need to appoint this person. I mean, we're simply giving him the latitude to do it. It is a direction, but I mean, we're doing it, I guess, in the event he feels that he has the need of that advice in order to be able to assure us that the and valuations it's, are and fair. And it's for us only. It's not for anyone else. I don't think we would. Yeah, it's for us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Baila. Sorry, it, I'm just going to go um, following up on those questions. I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Is this, um, I mean, this, this will be a negotiation that, that might be some points that we don't agree with the province and the value of these things might be one of them. So is this a tool for you to 
uh, use and safeguard the interests of riders, employees, and uh, uh, the people of Toronto, that you actually can turn and say we have a third party that is evaluated that is actually helping the city to put those numbers on the table so that there's no argument about them? For you, Madam Speaker, it's a bit awkward for me because while I support the need potentially to have this uh, at our disposal, for the city manager to have it at his disposal, it, these might have been questions more properly directed to him in terms of the detail of when you might use it or when you might not. But my understanding of it is that it is a tool that he might choose to use. We've sort of directed him to do so in the event he believes that it is necessary for us to have somebody to validate the evaluations that have been received. And I suppose that need would become more uh, acute in the event there was a disagreement about valuations. And I'm just assuming that's a circumstance in which we would want to have a third party, party validator say that the values we believe to be true for our assets are, are correct or in the zone. Uh, and I think uh, he, he's giving the he head signals here uh, because he can't answer questions at this juncture, but that's the purpose of having this here. Thank you. Oh, um, Councillor Thompson. Sorry, I didn't see your name there. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Mayor. Uh, Mayor, your motion and um, the um, answers uh, to the questions that you have um, responded to, you're not today saying that you are in any way, shape, or form giving any um, uh, uh, thoughts to giving up the subway to the province. You want to go through a whole process. And in item in uh, number one here, you, you're looking at reaffirming the support of keeping transit as, as, as owned by the City of Toronto for the residents of Toronto. Through you, Madam Speaker, I've said many times publicly since this first came up, even before Premier Ford, that uh, you know the status quo, while it has its problems, with mainly that have to do with operation and not enough money to do everything we'd like to do to expand the system and even keep it up, things have gotten better with some money from the federal government and the province, but I've said often that I think it's working quite well as an integrated system owned by us. But this discussion was initiated by somebody else, sure not me. I mean, I, I didn't go, as they say, I, I, until further notice, I would view it as a solution in search of a problem. Um, but the further notice is going to come when we sit down at the table and find out, well, what, what's the good news about this? If you are an employee, a rider, or a taxpayer in the City of Toronto, we will get an answer, and then it'll be up to us to evaluate that answer. But as of the moment, uh, I'm from Missouri on this, just in the context that I'm saying that I think the status quo you know, works reasonably well, subject to the fact there's never enough money. Um, and, and so, uh, so we'll, uh, that's, that's why I want to go sit at the table and hear why this is good news for Toronto, if in fact it is. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Perks, question. Thank you, Speaker. I hadn't intended to ask a question, but I'm, I'm sitting beside the very sharp-eyed Councillor Fillion, and he pointed out that in number one, it is not absolutely clear. City Council reaffirm its, uh, reaffirm its support for keeping ownership of the Toronto Transit Commission in the City of Toronto. Uh, do you mean that to mean and the subway system? Well, the Toronto Transit Commission to me is the whole thing. The whole thing, including the subway system. Yes, it's a whole, yes the there you go. You've made Councillor Fillion a happy system. man. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I believe that that's it. <laughs> okay, Councillor Matlow held the item down. Councillor Matlow, you're next to speak. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I have a motion. You can put it on the screen. And uh, I believe the motion works in concert with much of the mayor's motion, except for one item. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be asking for uh, the mayor's uh, motion to be uh, separated when we vote on it. And what I would do is I would strongly support items one, two, four, and five on the mayor's motion, but I would uh, essentially delete number three and uh, replace it with the entirety of my motion. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, I don't believe that uh, we should be, what I'm concerned about is that we just go to a process that was sort of thrust upon us, filled with lawyer, lawyer's boxes of information that's going to ultimately help expedite a process that we didn't ask for, nor do we want nor did we even want to start. And, um, sorry, I'm just having a little trouble, if, if I may ask uh, clerks, sorry, if I may just, thank you. Um, and um, our subway system uh, is not only the spine of our transit system, 
but the land value and the potential air rights that we have are incredibly uh, uh, important assets to the City of Toronto, our ability to both not only support uh, our, our many priorities, but also to move forward in the future, I hope, better than we have in the past, on providing affordable housing and other uh, priorities that we have that we should be better utilizing our, our, value, our land for. Um, I'm also concerned about uh, the, the, the Premier essentially using the subway system to score political points uh, for voters in the regions when perhaps the existing GO Transit or improved GO Transit really would be a better regional uh, transportation solution for them than simply building subways from Perry Sound to Pickering and everywhere in between. No, no major city and no province or no jurisdiction in the world does that because it doesn't make sense from a financial or a planning perspective. I'm concerned that if, uh, that if the Ford government uh, takes the subway and puts it under Metrolinx, you can ask uh, Councillor Cole uh, uh, how well uh, Metrolinx is accountable to the residents when they're making decisions. Can you name a single uh, uh, person who, who actually is elected or represents Toronto who sits on the Metrolinx board? Where do people go when they're having service concerns and complaints uh, to Metrolinx in a genuine way where there's any accountability in a way that they do here to Toronto Council and to the TTC board. It doesn't exist. There's no accountability and certainly no accountability to the people of Toronto nor the mayor and council. Um, I'm concerned about uh, land use planning and community planning. What, you know, when, if we develop uh, or, or, or work with uh, partners to develop lands, we would want to see uh, that it transitions into neighborhoods, that there's community benefits, that there's community centers, affordable childcare, what have you. The heights and densities be reasonable. Do you think that uh, the Ford government uh, will, will care as much as we would when we understand the context on the ground? Um, as you know, Councillor Holliday asked about seamless uh, uh, regional connectivity. There already is connectivity. People take the bus from uh, other regions and they get onto the station and they get onto the subway and it is working that way. We need to have a conversation with the Ford government about improving that regional connectivity, better fare integration, and making sure that uh, we actually build transit in an effective, cost-effective way uh, that actually gets it done. So I support going to the table now. And by the way, I also disagree with anyone who would say, let's pretend that we don't need to go to the table. They have enormous legislative powers over us. Enormous is an understatement. Well, we we are, yeah, we found out during the election, we are a piece of legislation at Queen's Park. That's what we are. But we also, as councillors and mayor, we are advocates for the people of Toronto. And I believe that we should go to the table to have a discussion about what is stated, which is improved regional transit and building transit. And then once we see the legislation, then we go back and we give the city manager authority to have that discussion on that specific issue. But we don't just rush in there. You know, if somebody wanted to steal your house, if you owned a house, you don't go to the table and say, can I give you the number to the alarm and I'm going to cut you a key? You don't do that. So I'm asking that we support the preponderance of the mayor's motion, but what my motion does, it is simply puts the narrative and the timeline in a way that is better for the interests of the people of Toronto, and then we work together on negotiating where we go in the future. But I don't want us to just rush and capitulate to unreasonable demands on a policy that's not thought out, and may I add, we do know what uploading means because Doug Ford has already told us. He wants our subway. He wants to take our subway and the uh, land and the air rights thank with you. it. Thank, thank you, you. Councillor Matlow. Okay, we do have a question for you, clarification of the motion. Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. So, uh, one, two, four, they look good, your recommendations. My question to you is, uh, in your opening statement here, you talk about deleting the recommendations from the city manager and the city solicitor. Mm -hmm. So th I'm just confused by that, because you alluded to being at the table, but those are within the recommendations from the city manager of being at the table, not having our hands yeah. tied, being strategic, <laughs> you know, being able to negotiate and discuss this. Yeah, so no, I, I just what, wanted to get clarification. I, I, no, I certainly agree with the, with the, the sort of the, the, your characterization. The, um, so uh, just to reiterate, what I'm suggesting is in, in the mayor's motion, yeah. uh, certainly I, you know, I, I can't imagine most of us wouldn't agree strongly with one, two, four, and five. Yes. It's the nature of how we are going to proceed 
with, with going to the table. You and I will agree we need to go to the table. What I'm suggesting is rather than simply just kind of going and discuss all matters and kind of just go there and then report back to council with, you know, with the term, you know, report back as necessary, I'd rather take a more staged approach where we discuss what is stated and what we know and certainly what I think the Ford government and city council will agree on, even if we d disagree with ways to get there with respect to better regional transit and more effective building the transit. We might have our, you know, different, different ideas of what to do. But let's go there and start those discussions because we should have those anyway. What I, what I disagree with, or what I'd prefer rather, really just to say it in the positive, is that we need to, uh, 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 rather than just kind of rush to discuss what uploading means before we see the details of the legislation, let's see some legislation, let's understand exactly what they uh, want to impose. And we need to first determine the risks, the liabilities. In other words, we go in there with our story, with what we need to talk about. And frankly, I think it helps us discuss as I mentioned to, to the mayor, with the community, with the public, really, you know, what our position is, because I'm concerned as well, and if I may add, uh, Councillor Robinson, what I'm concerned is that, that the Ford government, like they did with the election and other matters, is that they're going to come out with a narrative as they already have started, which is, you know, we need better uh, regional transit and this is the answer. Well, how do we know that? I mean, uh, cities around the world and regions around the world don't build subways to places in, in low density area, they just don't do that. Okay, so, but I just, I need okay, to clarify. Okay, let's try to be a little specific and just answer Well, no, but that, I'm, I'm actually, this yeah, is the so rationale. Because but specifically, I want to, to bring your attention to the fact you've deleted all the recommendations from both the city manager and the city solicitor, according to the way you've framed up this motion. So I just, I think that there's some confusion around that, and I just wanted you to clarify that piece. Because yeah. the one to four look good, but that opening statement uh, I think it draws some concern around this table. It, it, okay. it's, that was it's, your last it's, question. It's, to, to, just to be clear, uh, Councillor Robinson, where the mayor's motion and my motion meet, and where we agree, is that we can't ignore that we should go to a table and that we need to have discussions with the, with the provincial government. What my motion does, it, has a, it, it offers a different approach than what is in the mayor's motion. It's and we thing. can choose between the two approaches as to whether or not, uh, you know, what, we're, what our comfort level is. Thank what the mayor you. and I will agree is that we can't ignore that there's a table that we should go to. Th thank you. Councillor Holliday, clarification of the motion, please. Yes, clarification, of course. Um, um, through you to Councillor Matlow. Uh, in the questioning uh, to the city manager today, one of the responses that he provided was that he had not had uh, discussions or, no, or deep negotiations with the province because he didn't have direction to do so. Uh, in fact, I think on the books it says in the report that there are, in, in our records, his council has a position against any upload. And uh, in the recommendations uh, by the city manager and solicitor, it's very, very specific. It mentions it more than once to negotiate a joint terms of reference. Uh, and so my question is, do you acknowledge that your motion doesn't contain the words terms of reference? And is it your intention to not allow the city manager to negotiate a joint terms of reference? I think it's premature. I think that we need to uh, see the legislation, understand specifically what they want to do and how they want to take Toronto subway from us, uh, and, then, and then take next steps. I think it's premature at this point to start discussing, and I, to say it sort of in a, in a, in a, in a uh, I think in a very candid way, what, what I'm concerned about is that we go there now and start really helping them take the city of Toronto subway that's owned by the people of Toronto away from us. I don't believe we should rush to the table to help them. So you would acknowledge then that this direction to delete the recommendations of the city manager and the city solicitor essentially stands down the city manager? It's not about standing down. We have a terrific city manager who's giving us very, uh, very um, sound advice from a staff perspective. I'm adding in, uh, I, uh, I, I would characterize it as a strategic uh, 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 contribution to help us achieve our goals. And uh, some of it I, I have shared. Uh, uh, part of it, I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to you know, advertise to Premier Ford, but I believe that we shouldn't be rushing to expedite a process that we don't support. 
So in other words, as I put in my questions, we would take the wallflower approach and stand back and watch things unfold. Oh no, Thank you. Uh, not a wallflower, uh, a, a defender and a fighter for uh, our own assets and in the residents of Toronto. By not authorizing the city manager to go forth and, ne and negotiate joint terms of reference to ensure that the city manager has a seat at the table. I think we're both uh, um, uh, characterizing this the way that we choose Thank to, you. but I, I, you know. Thank you. I respect you enormously. Councillor Fletcher, clarification. Uh, thank you very much. In one of your answers, Councillor, you said this is replacing the mayor's motion, but this is very clear that this deletes the recommendations in the report, which are before us, and it um, replaces those. And you are now putting new recommendations in the report instead of the ones in the report. Have I read that right? Here's the report. So Those would are I, the recommendations. Would my, That's what, the wording I'll, there. I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. I support one, two, uh, uh, four and five strongly uh, uh, in the mayor's motion. Um, uh, I'm referring to it as the mayor's motion simply because that's what I have before me and, he's, and, Sorry, and he moved it. Which one? Are, uh, no. So, okay, I'm referring to uh, the motion uh, where he has uh, uh, written one to five. And yes, it's from the report, but uh, what I'm what I'm what I'm what I'm what I'm saying is, if we replace number three, city council authorized the mayor and the chair, Toronto Transit, etc., and then replace it with the the strategy that I've uh, proposed in in my motion, I, it's a different approach to getting to uh, I, the I table. I hear that, but I'm looking. I have here in front of me, I have a city council. Uh, consider certain recommendations. There happen to be five of them. And then I have a motion from Mayor Tory in front of me. They're not identical. They're two separate sets of motions that we have in front of us. And I'm a little surprised at your answer, Councillor, because this very clearly deletes the recommendations in the report and replaces them with your recommendations. That's all we have in front of us from the city manager. Then we have motions from the mayor. So I find this to be extremely confusing in the approach. I, 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 I'll try one more time, uh, Councillor Fletcher. Well, three, it's three, I'm really if, I, if I may just answer, really Madam speaking. Speaker, hmm? Madam Speaker, if I may have your attention, with, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, if I may just answer the question. Um, uh, so I'll just try this one more time. The mayor has a motion, motion one, that has five items. What I'm saying is that I agree with uh, one, two, four, and five. We don't support three. I'd be asking for this to be a separated vote. Oh, you're talking I'm asking about for what you support in the mayor's motions, and then you're replacing the city manager's motion. <coughs> city manager doesn't move a motion. Sorry, there is a, there is a re recommendations yes. here that have nothing to in, do with in, the mayor's motion. In motions. the report. In yeah. the report. You're I'm, replacing the yeah. report with yours, and you're telling us what you'd support in the mayor's. Is, yeah. Have I got that right now? Yeah. What I'm referring to is the, the <coughs> mayor's motion, okay? I got it's, that. It's, Honest, it's, I can follow okay, that. Okay, that was your last motion, question. Motion I, one, getting very and rather than no. support item three Sorry. in the motion. It's okay. still too confusing. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Very simple. Thank, okay. We're, we're getting totally confused. Councillor. By law. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, through you, Madam Speaker, I'm just trying to understand if you agree to be at the table or if you want to set up a new table. <laughs> because we're going to. So, is your recommendation to ignore the issue of the upload because you understand what it is and you? can go to residents and say what, what it is and what it means for the city and for the network and for everybody and say this is not what we need to talk about. What we need to talk about is just the cost effective construction of rapid transit and improve regional transit service. So uh, sorry, what's the question? That was the question. The question is 
Am I? There's actually several questions. Is there a am I asking for a different table than the table? Yeah. That so you, you you feel like we have everybody knows what implementation is. It's decided. We know. No. The, no, not at all. So I just said that. Um, so through through you. Uh, so don't you think that we should? impact uh, uh, the, the definition of what is going to define that and implicate that? Um, okay. Through you, Madam Speaker. Shouldn't we have the right facts and figures at the table, the evidence? Madam Speaker, uh, let me know when uh, it's time to answer the question. If yeah, you... I, uh, the, the, clerk, the clerk will clarify it with Councillor Matlow, Councillor Bailal after, because this is totally confusing for all of us. So, Madam Speaker, I'd be happy to answer the question, and thank you for your editorial from the Speaker's Chair. So, bottom line is, um, I don't, I personally, and you can, you, can jump, you can come to your own conclusions on this, I don't believe for a minute that Premier Ford and his government, uh, in, in any real earnesty, want to negotiate with us as a partner. I believe that they want to take our subway system and they want to use our land and potential air rights to raise revenue uh, against any of our objections. I believe that we will be, uh, if, we, if we go to a table and offer information that will help them, that we are capitulating to their demands and actually helping accelerate uh, uh, an objective that we don't share, or at least I believe the majority of us don't share. What I believe is that if the government wants to help us, they should be offering support for operating and, uh, and, and building transit, but, uh, and dealing with the overcrowding challenges and repairs. They should not be just trying to steal our subway. Now, I understand that they've got the power to do that. So that's why I'm not suggesting in any way that we ignore that there's a table that we need to be at. But I also don't believe that we should be there lined up with lawyers' boxes with information to help them do it. So uh, what I'm suggesting is that we have a strategy to go to the table and not just sort of go in there and start helping them out, but slow it down in a way that um, doesn't uh, uh, expedite a process uh, that may or may not take uh, four years. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Cressy. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. Over the course of this debate, we've got into the details and a lot of the questions. I'd like to broaden it back to the spirit of what we're talking about. And for me, what this is, as a so-called TTC upload, um, it's an election promise in search of an objective. That's all it is. The mayor described it as a solution in search of a problem, and I think that's apt as well. I mean, for goodness sakes, I don't think the province knows what they mean by upload. I don't think they have a clue. It was an election process, uh, pro promise, and that's about it. And so we've heard from our city staff today in this conversation that transit is very much at the heart of how we plan and build a city. That where we build transit connects to where we build housing. That where we build transit directly connects to how we promote economic development. How we build transit connects to the mobility of how people get around. In a system where 70% of trips involve buses and streetcars, there is an immediate connection between transit and how we design our infrastructure and our streets and the first mile and last mile of every trip. And, and so, you know, how you plan a city, transit delivers more than people, it, this is, it delivers equity. And so this is, this is a big deal. And it just seems to me that for the city of Toronto, as the fifth largest government in Canada, as the fourth largest city in North America, where we have a transit system that is the largest transit agency in this country, moving 1.7 million people every day and increasing, we need a province who will work with us on how we improve it. And, and that's just not the case. I mean, on this upload, we already, as a council, passed a resolution in opposition to the upload. We, this chamber, did that a few mere months ago. And the province, meanwhile, has said they're continuing anyway. And so this pattern we see again and again since June the 7th. We tell the province not to cut social housing repair funds. They cut social housing repair funds. We tell the province not to cut city council in half. They cut city council in half. We tell the province not to propose or continue with uploading the TTC. They continue with uploading the TTC. 
It is a pattern of disrespect that is unacceptable. And, and I just, for the life of me, as the largest city in this country, as the economic engine of this province and country, our ability to own and operate the transit system is central to our success. And I see absolutely zero benefit to giving control of the TTC, whether it's in its ownership or operation, to Doug Ford. Do we need the province there as a partner? Yes, we do. Do we need them there as a funder? Yes, we do. Should we be ceding control of our ability to plan and build our city with the vital component and role the TTC plays? We should not. And so I believe we should use absolutely every tool that we have, every tool at our disposal to fight this. And that includes, based on our legislative framework being at the table, <clears throat> on the outside and on the inside, we must use every tool. And it is for that reason that I've seen Councillor Fletcher's advanced circulation of her amendments to the staff recs, and I'll be supporting those. And I will be supporting the mayor's motion because we have to fight this. And whether we're fighting it in the boardrooms or whether we're fighting it like the demonstrators outside before this, we have to stand up for our city, and that means standing up for the TTC. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a little bit of history with uh, subways and the province and everything. Uh, some of you may know I, I served as the TTC chair for a number of years, and, uh, and someone asked about the Eglin subway. Wow, what a uh, nightmare you bring back. You know, he had started building that in 1990. It was a uh, City of Toronto uh, Metro Council uh, decision. We dug the holes. We ripped up the street for five years. We had a change in provincial government. They decided, I remember at the time, it said very clearly, subways are a thing of the past. What? Uh, we don't need them anymore. So they filled in the hole. Uh, they wouldn't even mothball it. They filled it in with concrete. Uh, and uh, they walked away. And you know what they did? They, the province went out and built a subway called Shepherd. I call it the Stubway. It only goes halfway, and it wasn't even on the list of the City of Toronto's list of uh, projects back in 1990. It was uh, an afterthought because Mal was really pushing for it. So out of the five, six projects we had, uh, guess what was built? The Shepherd line was the only piece that was built of the six that the city recommended. The point being is that this, the province's objectives, the province's mandate is much different than the city's. So therefore, if you give the province uh, control of the subway, you're basically giving them control of transit in Toronto. And, and not to say it's going to be the end of the world or there may not be some benefits of that, but just remember that. They have a different constituency. Their constituency is the whole province. So, you, you know, it's very clear to me, they said to Mayor Scarpitti, we're going to build that line up Young Street to Markham. We're going to build it up to Richmond Hill. They, they promised everybody in York, that's what they're going to do. They want to do that because they have that constituency. It's not our constituency. So, but when you do that, what happens to the people in my riding who have to wait for five subway cars to get on in the morning? Is building the line up to uh, Richmond Hill, wherever they're going to go, going to help people get on the subway in the morning at Young and Eglinton or Young, it ain't going to help one iota. And we are going to build the relief line, but the relief line, remember, is how many years away? 10, 12, 15 years away? And, you know, I used to be a big supporter of subways. I mean, I was in the streets when they closed the subways. I fought to get it back in the budget in 2003. But, you know, I, I think... Uh, people got to remember, when you vote for subways, I know you want that Shepherd subway, you want everything, it means 10 years of construction hell. 10 years. We're into our 11th on Eglinton. We've got 100 closed stores on Eglinton because of the construction. All the jobs are supposed to create. We've lost all the jobs in all the mom and pop shops on Eglinton. So if you, so if you want to build subways, just tell your people, as the province should tell the people up Young Street or wherever they want to build them, 10 years of construction hell, 10 years of traffic hell, 10 years of drilling, pounding, uh, calls to your local councillor about uh, things going on. So I, we have no choice because, as the mayor said very clearly, if, if we don't go to the table, they're going to do it to us. They definitely will. 
So we have no choice to try to do our best to say, listen, there are certain things that you've got to understand. 85% of all the transit rides in the Greater Toronto Area are Toronto people. The 85%. You know, the Dufferin bus. Listen, if you look at the bus routes, we carry more on the Finch East, Finch West, Eglinton East, Jane, than most of the GO system and all the transit and all the uh, regions of Durham, Peel, if you look at our bus and streetcar systems, they carry more than go or more than anything they're going to carry because, you know, they don't have the density. So, and, you know, we could talk to them and say, listen, subways isn't the best way to do this. But, as you know, people now love subways to the point where, yeah, you want to spend uh, 10, you know, the Eglinton line was going to cost $800 million to go to the airport at that time. Now it's up to $6 billion and it doesn't even go to the airport. So this is what happens when, again, provinces have different mandates. And, you know, I could go to examples like, for instance, the Scarborough RT. That wasn't a city decision to build the uh, linear induction motor high-rise uh, transit system out there. That was the province because they wanted to sell that technology to Malaysia and to the muggers in Detroit. They call it the muggers line in Detroit. It's the only SRT left. Uh, running around in circles in Detroit. Thank you. Okay, thank sorry. You, okay. Councillor Karagiannis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I do have an amendment to uh, the mayor's motion that I'd like the staff to put up, please. Basically, I'm adding in there the Shepherd Line Subway Extension to Scarborough. Madam Speaker, over the years, I've noticed um, the last four years that I've been here, we have three sections in the city of Toronto. Everything south of Bloor, Bloor to Eglinton, Eglinton to 401, and everything north of the 401. I have to tell you, Madam Speaker, I'm finding as a resident of north of the 401 and speaking to a lot of my constituents and the rest of the people, north of the 401, we're treated as second-class citizens. It's about time that um, we start taking the people north of the 401 seriously. Shepherd Line Subway Station to Scarborough. When you look Victoria Park East, there's something like about 40 to 50 towers supposed to be going up. Victoria Park and Shepherd, there's uh, on both sides, on, on the south side, north side, there's about 15, 20 towers. You go to Victoria Park, and, sorry, Shepherd and, uh, and Pharmacy, all three corners are going up with towers. You move along over to Ward, more towers coming up. You move over to Agent Court Mall, more towers coming up. You move over to Kennedy on the south side. There's seven towers just north of the hotel. There's two more coming in front of the hotel and another six on the north side. Madam Speaker, these people are looking for subway. I had a class that visited me when I first, first elected here, and they brought me down a, 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 a Bristol board, and it's still sitting aside, across, outside my office. And these are kids now that are going to high school. And they said, respectfully, we're looking for a faster service to downtown. It took them one minute and 15 seconds at that time. Now it's even longer. So I'm supportive of the relief line going up Victoria Park or up Don Mills, wherever it's going to go. However, we cannot forget the people north of the 401. If you live north of the 401 and you want to go, okay, I think that's my time, right? And if you want to go across, if you want to go to the airport, well, the only way that you can go to the airport by public transit is by coming down to the city of Toronto, downtown here, and then going back up again. There's nothing on the north side that goes across, or you will have to hire a taxi cab, or you have to get a, a Uber or Lyft, or you'll have to go along the TTC. There's no TTC line that goes right across the north side of Toronto. So I implore you, and I'm asking you, stop treating the people north of 401 as second-class citizens. They also pay taxes. The one thing that really set me off when we were discussing the Shepherd subway line and a, a woman was in, uh, in committee uh, making a deputation, I asked her, I said, where, how far do you live? She lived downtown. How far are you from a subway line? I'm four blocks. And I said, don't you think that my people in Scarborough Agent Court deserve the same? And the answer was, well, you live in Scarborough. Well, excuse me, don't I pay my fair taxes? Don't my people also contribute? Don't these stars that are coming along Shepherd and going on to my colleague Cynthia Lai's award, don't they count? Or are these people second-class citizens? I see the development at the bottom of the Don Valley. Fine, let's build the relief line to go in and, and help them. I see the development happening 
at Scarborough, uh, uh, Scarborough Town Center. Let's build a one-stop subway to look after them. So what the heck are we going to do about the people in Shepherd? They just don't count. This second-class treatment of the people north of the 401 has to stop. I talked to my colleague, uh, Councilor Pasternak, Ward 6, is it? Ward 6 now. 6 now. And he wants to get the subway extended along Shepherd all the way over to Downsview and even farther. So why are we ignoring these people? I can't believe for the life of me, we talk about political slogans, and the mayor says political slogans. Well, I'm going to remind him, political slogans. Did not anybody forget Smart Track, 22 stations? We're now down to six, and it depends what happens. Let's be honest about ourselves. Let's be honest. Let's be honest to our citizens. Let's be honest to our people that we represent. Coming in here and not bringing on the light and on the floor of this council, what happens along Shepherd is a tragedy. And to say, don't worry about it, it's happening. Well, so is Christmas, and it's coming. It's going to come sooner than the subway in Shepherd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, well, it's coming two weeks, so. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I've, I've been struggling with the, the staff report. <laughs> There's a lot in there. Um, but I had a little insight. I had a little insight. Uh, basically, what all this is about is that Doug Ford is trying to trick us. And the way I know that is I've seen this identical movie before. For those of you who weren't on council when Rob was the mayor and, and Doug was the uh, some other kind of mayor, um, <laughs> we went through this exact thing. The, the mayor said, I know I can get more transit in the city of Toronto for free. Mm -hmm. And he created something called a Transportation Toronto Infrastructure Limited, put a couple of councillors on it, he hired Gordon Chong, and he said, go out and you tell me how to make my fantasy about building free transit come true. And we all went, well not all of us, but enough of us went along that a whole pile of money was spent and a whole lot of time went into it. And what were the outcomes at the end of creating Transportation Toronto in Infrastructure Limited to, and telling them, you go figure out how to make my dream come true? Well, we built no transit. We put all of our other transit projects on hold for a whole term. And we didn't even pay the consultants or Mr. Chong at the end of the day because we ran out of money. This is the movie that Doug Ford is trying to get us to live again. He has no idea if uploading transit helps us build more. He just has some vague notion, a little bit of a pipe dream, and he wants us to go and do all the work to tell him whether or not his dream can come true. So, I say, instead of getting tricked by Doug Ford, why don't we outsmart him? It's actually not that hard. If you look at if you look at the motion, uh, the second recommendation of city staff, it says conditional upon a joint terms of reference having been developed in accordance with some of the other stuff in there. In other words, we only participate if we get to a terms of reference that is acceptable to this council. So what would you want to see in that? Well, maybe the terms of reference could be how are we going to have long-term stable operating and capital funding for a transit system in the city of Toronto? How are we going to arrive at a place where transit planning is actually done based on evidence and not something that happens in a closed door cabinet meeting? How are we going to get them to take the Gardner Expressway back and pay for that? So let's give the city manager this moment, but also give him the eye. We want you to actually make this work for the city of Toronto. We want you to have this work for getting better transportation, we want this to work on a financially clear basis. And most of all, and this is the least diff difficult part of it, we want you to outsmart Doug Ford. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. I have a motion that City Council requests the federal government to hold a summit with representatives from the federal, provincial, and city of Toronto governments as soon as possible, recognizing the national significance of Toronto's transit infrastructure with a goal of developing a long-term plan for investment in transit infrastructure, including both capital and operating funding. I'll get that uh, back to that in a second. 
Uh, but, but first, I think that we've lost sight in this debate a little bit about the implications of it. And we're talking about levels of government, who should be in control of what. But I think what we've lost sight of is the, the people that matter most in this debate, and that's transit riders. And what will best, what will best serve those transit riders? What will best ensure that we have an affordable transit system? What will best ensure that we have an equitable transit system that, that delivers people across our city in a, in a fair and equitable manner? I will add an, as an aside with respect to uh, my colleague, Councillor Karagiannis, who mentioned one of the various airport routes. There's actually three that have the terminus at the airport, not just one, um, but that, that's just a correction. Um, then finally, uh, what happens to the power of transit riders in an upload? I think this is very important because if you look at who the day-to-day -day operation of transit riders, matter, transit system matters most, it's up to those that depend on it every day to get around, to get to school, to get to work, to get home, to see their family, their friends. And none of this has really come up in this debate and I don't think it's supposed to because I don't think, I don't think that Doug Ford cares at all about the day-to-day -day function of that system. And worse, I don't think his caucus is going to care at all either. And this is where I think it's a really important point. Who do we want controlling the fate of the TTC? A system that serves the people of Toronto most. Yes, it serves other people that work here, and that's fine, but it serves mostly people that live in the city of Toronto. Who do we want in control of that? And with no disrespect to the people, the good, the good residents of North Bay, of Thunder Bay, of Bayfield, of, uh, I was going to say Bayview, but that's in Toronto, of Bayfield, with the, the, a bit of it's in my ward now too, yeah. Um, the, uh, the, with all due respect to them, their MPPs don't have the best interest of City of Toronto transit riders at heart. They don't. The power of these transit riders rests with us and us alone. And we need to make sure, we need to make sure that we send that message loud and clear down the street to those at Queen's Park who want to take control of this, who have upped the street, who have for years, for years, sat at the side by, by cutting funding to our transit lines. And I checked, it wasn't only Jane. It was Jane and the waterfront, the line that was supposed to serve City Place, Liberty Village, South Etobicoke, cancelled by a provincial government. After we built communities there, this is not how you plan transit or a city. You don't let one agency, one level of government, disrupt the plan after it's already been set in motion. We will be years, if not decades, until we start getting people in those neighborhoods who, who depend on public transit on the correct level of transit and getting people moving around this city. And that brings me to my motion. We need to bring the federal government to the table. We need to bring both their, their money to the table, not only for the capital projects that they, love to, that they love to fund, but also the operational implications. Because when you have 1.7 million passengers a day, the third largest transit system in North America, you're, you have federal national importance. And they need to step up with their level of support. They need to come and bring both their maturity as a level of government, and their money. Because they're also involved in the changing of plans on this floor of council. Because their money being contingent on one project or another, based on whatever the, the whim of the provincial government uh, is that day, we need to stop that. We need to start focusing again on those, those people that de depend on transit the most, and that's, that is those who are riding it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, there's been a, a lot of conversation in the chamber today here and uh, as well I've heard from many residents and folks online that today's discussion is really about the recommendations uh, and the report that's in front of us in Council. It's not about whether we're uploading or not uploading. It's about tooling ourselves to enter a discussion. Now, we don't have to accept an upload as a negotiating position. 
Um, I think it's, it's, it's interesting if, if we think about the times right now, uh, you know, there's opportunities to learn from what's going on over in, in the UK right now. Uh, and that when you're trying to negotiate with very little bargaining power, uh, it's a very difficult position to be in. So City Council articulated their position uh, in opposition to an upload in May through former Councillor uh, Mahevic's motion. And uh, the provincial government has not listened to that. Um, City Council has articulated positions before that, that the provincial government has not listened to. Uh, so I join many of you in fighting for Toronto and our right to have a say in how we run our transit system and other aspects of this city. But I do think that the report and today's debate is not actually the place to articulate that fight. Today's discussion is about giving our city manager the direction he needs to do his job and represent the city of Toronto with the province. I'd like to make it clear that we should be negotiating for scenarios that do not include an upload, but it's also my view that it's always better to have a seat at the table to stand up for our values. So let's be pragmatic about this. We gain by engaging in discussion. We are better able to prepare and influence a situation and outcome that ultimately uh, could be implemented unilaterally. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. Uh, Speaker Nunziata. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I turned it on. I, I figured that part out. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure. Um, thank you very much, and I, I won't speak long, but I just wanted to make a few comments. Uh, first of all, I, I uh, will be supporting um, the mayor's motion, and I'm pleased to see that his um, recommendation one is to reaffirm um, uh, the motion that was, uh, that was passed by this council in May of 2018 as well. I believe that that covers that motion. Um, just to give you a bit of history, Councillor um, Cole, uh, you mentioned uh, the Eglinton line. So, in, in, in Councillor Layton, um, when he asked us questions, he asked staff. So, in 1995, the Eglinton subway was cancelled by the province. And at that time, they cancelled the Eglinton and built the uh, Shepherd subway. It was all political. We all knew that. Um, I was the mayor at the time, and Councillor Cole was on Metro Council. And, um, and it cost us $150 million to cover a hole at that time because the subway was cancelled. And then in 1998, we amalgamated, and when we amalgamated, uh, the province downloaded to the municipality, um, and, uh, which downloaded social services and ended transit funding. And at that time, we were told that it was going to be revenue neutral, but of course it wasn't. And here we are, um, 20 years later or more, um, that now we're being uploaded. So first we were downloaded, and now we're uploaded. Uh, I don't think the province can make up its mind what it wants to do. But, at, you know, it's really important, and, um, um, and, and I agree with the mayor and the city staff, that we need to get clarity on exactly what the province, what the province means. So what do they mean by um, uploading and exactly what it would mean to our transit users and to the city. And the motions that we have before us and the report from staff and, and the mayor's motion, I believe covers that and that uh, we should um, find out exactly what we're fighting because right now we don't know what we're fighting. And once we find that out, then we can uh, we can proceed on you know what the uh, what we will be um, advocating for and on behalf of our transit uh, transit users. Um, so I will be supporting that motion and um, and um, I hope that uh, members of council will endorse that as well. And Councillor Cole, do you remember when we when that Eglinton subway was cancelled? You were protesting on the Allen Expressway and you blocked all that traffic. Yeah, you almost got run over. Yeah, so you you were right in there with the protesting. Um, you know, you almost got run over. You pushed me, I think, on the Allen Expressway. You pushed me in the middle of the highway. Uh, you you were very vocal, and you, and you still are. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Councillor Wong Tam to speak. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
I rise um, with, uh, with a lot of encouragement um, in my heart based on what I've heard on the floor today. Um, what I'm drawing from the comments uh, from this conversation and debate is that uh, there's enough reservation on the floor of council that one should not rush into any type of negotiation, especially not with a, a gentleman like Mr. Ford. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very, very encouraging because I think it's going to tell me where, uh, where the heart of council will be uh, when it comes time to defending the city's assets and the, and the, and the uh, position of the city as it pertains to an integrated TTC system, including the subway uh, system for the riders. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, I, as, as I sit and, and, and listen to the conversation and, and, uh, and take another read of the city manager's report, uh, I'm prepared to support the city manager's report based on a conversation that he and I have had about uh, what he would like to do and, and the outcomes that he hopes to, to achieve on behalf of city council. We have to empower him to do that. I do, and I am also encouraged by the, the motion from the mayor, especially the, the first and second portion uh, where, the, where city council once again in this new term reconfirm our commitment to owning the subway and operating the subway and all of the TTC um, uh, commission. Uh, I think that uh, we, we didn't get into the too many details of why um, letting the province uh, take the subway uh, is a bad idea. So I, I wanted to just sort of put that on the, on the table just to, to reaffirm uh, why uh, this conversation is so important. Because although we are giving the city manager and the CEO of the TTC the power to go ne negotiate, I think we should also remind ourselves what's at stake. So what is at stake? Uh, we paid for, built, and currently operate a transit system. We did that. The residents of Toronto, the, 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 the folks who came before us, uh, we're basically trustees. Our job is to make sure that we run it, run it smoothly, make sure it's integrated, it's connected, and that it's a reliable and as, 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 as it is accessible for the ridership. And, and our job is to make sure it's in good shape so we can hand it off to the next generation of, of trustees and operators. Um, and we can't do that if bits and pieces are, are going to be taken and stolen. And I don't think that we are ever going to get fair market value. Because how do you put a price on the, on the heart and the spine of, of, of the city. And let's remember 75 stations that, that weave this entire city, north and south, east and west, connects through many different neighborhoods. If Doug Ford was to occupy the subway, take ownership of all the land, all the air rights, everything below, and call it his own, where would that leave us? He's literally taken the city. So that's, that's really what, to me, what's at stake. This is actually the hill to die on. If you ask me, there have been, been many debates uh, this floor of council that have been important, but I think we're about to, to get into the biggest fight uh, in this term if, uh, if, if, if he is uh, successful at taking this away from us. Um, we also know that the system has to be entirely integrated. It doesn't work if it's, if it's broken off and fractured off into pieces. Uh, we've already heard from, uh, from different members of council and also from TTC staff about what happens when they're not operating uh, all those modalities together. Uh, when the subway breaks down or if it's, uh, if it's down for whatever reason uh, for service, uh, who's going to pay for all those bus supplements as we have to continue to keep uh, people moving through the city? We also need to recognize that Uploading, taking, stealing, buying, whatever you want to call it, it's not going to result in better service. Um, there are MPPs that have no idea what the city of Toronto looks like, what it's like to live in our city, what's it like to work in our city. They've never ridden the TTC, and then they will have power and jurisdiction and control over our transit system. We cannot let that happen. It will also become much more expensive far more expensive because things have never gotten cheaper, especially once we open the door to privatization. And we do know at the end of the day, there have been moves over this last two terms, I recall, where we tried to, there were some attempts, let's just say, uh, from the mayor's chair when it was occupied by the former mayor uh, Ford to try to privatize cleaning services, try to privatize maintenance services, and little bits and pieces would be broken off in, under his, uh, his watch. And it was council that had to defend that. And they're sometimes successful and sometimes not. Uh, and it would, of course, lead to the loss of those good jobs. 
For all those reasons and so much more that's already said, uh, this is why I do support the city manager's report. I'll also be supporting portions of the mayor's um, uh, motion as portions as well as uh, Councillor uh, uh, Matlow's motion. I cannot support the deleting of the staff recommendation because I think it's actually going to weaken our position at the end of the day. And uh, I'll be supporting Councillor Layton's motion and I will not be supporting Councillor Barry Jan's motion. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Wong Tan. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just rise to uh, speak my support of um, the staff's recommendation. I think anyone that lives in this city and uses transit knows it's a pretty complicated matrix. Uh, there's a number of agencies, there's a number of uh, people on board trying to move people throughout the region. And, um, you know, I'm a user of public transit and I, you know, I think about my daily routine and, and the routine that I see others go through and, and I'm pretty convinced the vast majority of people that are riding the subway don't really care who's operating it. I mean, they care that the subway comes on time, they care that there's some change or some progress in, in the options and the infrastructure. Those are really important things though, those are big ifs. And, uh, you know, this government, uh, this provincial government has shown resolve before to try to make some changes. Um, and I'm very concerned that we sit on our hands and uh, watch these changes occur. We may not be in the best position possible. I think if there's some changes on the forefront, you know, I want that guy over there, the city manager and, and his team, frankly, uh, into the room. Because we have a lot of things to be concerned about that are connected with the subway. And it's not necessarily just public transit. It's about city planning, it's about our roads, it's about bicycle infrastructure, Councillor Cressy talked about, it's about development. And uh, I want to make sure that all of those issues are brought forward into the discussion early on. Um, I don't want to see, I don't want to wait to see what the legislation is until we react to it. I want to be proactive. And I think the best bet is to make sure that we've got our best negotiating team, that's the city manager's office that has a lot of experience in these type of things, to do the work that they have to do and make the connection points through the various parts of the government, through the public service, and the, the connections will be made at the political level. But uh, my fear is, if we take a position of that of the wallflower, to stand, stand back and watch, um, these changes will be made without our say, and they won't be to our advantage. And therefore, we should be quite proactive in what we're doing. And I guess the saddest part that I, I see in all of this is there, you know, I just wonder if some people are, are around here that you know, are afraid that things might actually be better at the end of the day. But we don't know what we don't know because we don't even know what has been proposed. I don't think they know. I heard we don't know many times from our city manager. And I think it's very important that this council get a good appraisal from our city manager after dialoguing with the province as this gets sorted out. And you never know, we might end up with a model that actually works better. I don't know why we're afraid of taking that step. Thank you. Councillor Bailao. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm actually going to pick up on something that Councillor Holliday said that I was, I was going to mention, which is, um, and I, I've, in, in getting ready for this council meeting, I, I usually take the subway and I thought about how many people on my subway ride actually would care or understand who owns uh, the subway and you know the level what is important for them is the level of frustration that they sometimes get when things don't work but I feel like it is my job to make sure that they care it is my responsibility as an elected official to make sure that we have all the facts and the evidence to have the best results for them and that is why it is our duty to make sure that we validate the information. And it is to make sure that, you know, we come and we looked at all these potential uh, risks and outcomes and, and that we have the right information with the reports validated and be, by being at the table that we can have these conversations with the public so that they do care. And when we go out there, we don't go alone. We go with the citizens of, of Toronto and with the right information so that they, they do care and they, they, tru they truly understand who and how can we have a system that will serve them better. Because at the end of the day, I think no member in this chamber wants anything else other than that. 
It's how do we provide a system that is reliable, that is effective, that you know, works in our city, that is a good employer and provides good service in our city. So how do we do that out there, having the right information without being at the table, without trying to influence legislation, without trying to have all those questions, the, the questions from our employees, the questions about the impact on the finances, the questions about the impact on our bus routes, on our streetcar? I don't know. I can't, I can't honestly, and obviously we all have our biases, so I'm very biased. And the first thing, you know, I think that you know, we're, we, we have a long way to go, but we're doing a pretty good damn job. But I, if somebody asks me what is the impact on the upload on my Dufferin bus, I don't know right now. I want to be able to tell them. I have my bias. I think it's going to be pretty bad. <laughs> but I want to be able to have that information because I want to make sure that everybody that rides that bus is going to be with me when we, when we need to put those arguments forward. So I think it is extremely important that we go with a strong position to the province. I think it is extremely important that we have a really strong vote on, on the motion put forward by the mayor. I think it is really important that we reaffirm our commitment to run, to operate, to own the entire system of the TTC, that what we need is a partnership to continue to invest in the, in the construction and the building of more services for the citizens of this region, this region, but that we sit down at the table and truly understand what is this implement, uh, upload, what it means for the citizens, and that we have true, real values to have the conversation moving forward. And so that is why I will be uh, supporting um, the mayor's motion. Um, uh, I think Councillor Fletcher's motion is also extremely uh, uh, helpful, and I think these are motions that will bring us uh, more information and will set us up to, to fight uh, for uh, the City of Toronto, our assets, uh, you know, our employees, uh, our, our TTC riders, uh, and our system. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I do have a motion. There it is. Um, that the nature of the co public consultation process that's in the staff report is a meaningful one with all of who we would identify as key stakeholders. Uh, and the opportunities are raised in a transparent manner so we know what people are saying. And secondly, the issue of the financial st sustainability, uh, just augmenting that, obviously the guiding principle is about the transit system, but as we had discussed earlier, had in questions, there may be implications overall for the city's financial st situation, and that really needs to be looked into because we have the chance to look into these kinds of things. So I do see that in the, there is a terms of reference for the special advisor and that that is, uh, you know, initial maximum, one year term, and then additional maximum, two year term. So we actually have some space here. And what we have in front of us from the city manager is how will we fill that space in the best way in the interest of the citizens of the city and of the TTC and of future transit? Because if there's one thing that we don't want to do, it's to bump from one thing to the other to the other. And one of the things that's actually in one of the letters, and this is quite a very short, sweet, but comprehensive package, says that uh, We've established, you know, we have paralysis and we can't get transit moving. Well, because things just keep changing. And we have one plan and then it gets changed to another plan and then somebody moves the motion, we've got a different plan. One's funded by the province, then that's gone. Then the province says RER, now we're back to subways. So there's a lot of things with our planning that are related to the province and have been as well as things that we have simply done ourselves here in this chamber. Uh, I know everybody's very, very nervous about this, and rightly so, because we did have a unilateral move from the province in the summer which said we're changing city council, and that's that. I'm a little encouraged because that could have happened here too, and it didn't happen here. We've had letters, we've had an exchange of letter, we've, we've had a terms of reference that's quite generous. It's not in four months, tell us how we're going to do that. It is, how are you going to explore that? What are you going to do? 
and its opening of the discussions. There's it, it, even within here. There's a scope staged in this mandate to the special advisor. There is a scoped staged consultation with the key stakeholders. And I asked the city manager, do I need to elaborate on that? Or will you take to the table who the key stakeholders are, who have the knowledge? Um, those who run the system have a lot of knowledge. The TTC has knowledge. The ATU has knowledge. The riders have knowledge. Councillor Cole has a lot of knowledge. I'd say he's a key stakeholder here because he's got so much history, as does our speaker. There's such rich history on how we got to this place and how we're going to move forward from this place. And I think that um, we have assumptions that have been made and we need to really pare that back and look at, yes, if there have been paralysis, well, are we just going to finger point or it's all together that we've not been able to break through and build the transit that we've set out to build. And I think that one of the things, and I'm not going to support Councillor Karagiannis's motion because we've never done an environmental assessment on <coughs> Shepherd. We've done one on the relief line. We've done one on the Garborough subway. And I don't even know if we've finished one uh, to the north, but it's underway, that that's how you build transit. It's, it's not that you just say, I'm building it. It's hard to build. The cross town, which the province is building, is over budget off time it certainly wasn't as easy as it looked and so for some reason it's a lot harder to build <laughs> subway north was harder to build the cross town is harder to build than anybody had anticipated and so we just need to establish a benchmark here with our terms of reference sending in our team and i'm glad the mayor augmented that team so he'll be in the mix there and I do support the motions that you have made, Mr. Mayor. And thank you very much for reiterating this council's really firm, firm support for a Toronto-owned uh, Toronto Transit Commission. Thank and you. And that's one of our important points. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Peruzza. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, do I believe that Doug Ford and the provincial government is going to take our subway system? Absolutely. I believe it. You should believe it too. We shouldn't go into this from this naivety. We, I've been sitting here listening to the conversation today and I got to tell you, it's pretty freaking naive to think that Doug Ford isn't going to take the jewel out of the crown. That's the one that has value. He's looking for value. It's a no-brainer. Leave you the lemon, take the crown. Take the jewel. That's the part that makes the money. The subway system hauls like 300 rides a year, 300 million rides a year. Land use, densities, all of those wonderful things that come with it. It's a no-brainer. You can't reason with a guy who sees the world in black and white. Daddy, take your subway, daddy knows how to do. Save jobs in Oshawa and daddy don't know how to do. It's as simple as that. The plan today shouldn't be about, oh, you know, how, how uh, 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 we're going to be better off. That's pretty naive, Stephen. That's pretty naive if you think you're going to be better off at the end of this process. They're looking for money. They're looking for coin. They know where to get it. They're coming after you. You want to you wanna fight this? Cut fares. Cut fares. Lower TTC fares. Bring the fight on. You want the subway? 
as a Torontonian, as a premier elected in the city of Toronto? Go to the people, tell them you're going to raise fares again. You want the jewel? Make people pay for it. If you got the guts. Daddy don't have. He's got the guts to take it. But he ain't got the guts to bear the pain. So I think what we really need to do, if you want to, to begin to really have a serious conversation about saving our subway system, is we need to say, you know what, well, we're going to develop a, uh, you know, a multi-year uh, plan here to slash TTC fares in half. Grow ridership. Make the, the system more affordable. That's what we should be doing as a city council, and then dare them to come after it. It's all we got. It's the only thing you got. You ain't going to do it through negotiations. I'll support the motions we have in front of us, not, no, not a problem. I'll do that, because I think they're well-intentioned. I believe that we have been mandated with a particular job. We do land use planning. We do transit planning in the city of Toronto. We're a jurisdiction. Does that mean the province can't do it? Of course they can. They can do all the things we do. Get rid of us, bring in a manager, let, let them do a job. They've taken steps to do that. But we also need to say to Premier Doug Ford, and we need to say it very early and very hard, we are not going to be your punching bag for four years or eight years or whatever long it takes. We ain't going to do that because you've seen the pattern. It's all about grenades. He just keeps, you know, lobbing a grenade, boof, you know, and we're all like scattering about. That's what he's doing. It's just a dumb political tactic, but it works. You gotta stop catching up. It works. So what we need to do is we need to say, here you go, take it back. Throw it back. Thank you, Councillor Peruzza. No applause and no encore. <laughs> Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think it's all been said, so I'll be very brief. I just I understand the staff recommendations are on the floor. Otherwise, I would have happily, wholeheartedly moved them. Uh, as well, the mayor's uh, additional motions I will be supporting, and I think they really add. They're a huge asset in this debate. Clearly, there's a lot of uncertainties. Uh, we're all getting emails. I certainly am, and uh, people very concerned about what's unfolding. I really want to thank staff today for answering questions about something that no one really knows how to define or to uh, frame up. So that was a tough uh, Q&A, but you did a great job. Uh, we certainly heard from Mr. Leary today and from staff that there are challenges um, that come with integrating services at different levels. Uh, for example, integrating GO Transit with the TTC system. And I have to say, I've, lo I've learned in the last 24 hours a lot from Mr. Leary, and I. I expect to learn a lot more. Um, but uh, my understanding is it's a lot of effort to better coordinate these services. I don't think we truly appreciate how much and how integrated it all is. As we all know, the TTC is vital to the daily lives of hundreds of thousands of residents uh, who use the services daily to get where they need to go. I am one of those transit users. I use it every day. It gets me back and forth uh, from home to City Hall. And uh, beyond that, the daily lives of our commuters and our residents, it's a critical and important asset to our city. And as I said earlier, uh, we do not have a clear picture of what the province means when it says upload. P partnerships, funding, uh, where we can make assumptions. We've heard things alluded to, but what does it really mean? And so that's why it's critical, I believe, and I hope you do too, that we are at the table, that we're strategic, 
that we have a terms of reference that guide the discussion, and the report before us has the blessings of the TTC manager, general manager, the city manager, the city solicitor, and within those recommendations, and Councillor Fletcher has just added to it, but our clearly lays out public consultation, which many of us agree are, is a part of civic life. And I would hate to see that any, of, any or all of that deleted. So I hope you'll support the uh, staff recommendations and um, that we get moving on this uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Speaker, I, I just wanted to, to rise and to um, say that I will be supporting the, uh, the Mayor's uh, motion, and I think Councillor Fletcher's motion as well. In fact, I'm going to support Councillor Layton's motion as well. I think it's an interesting one that if we could have those dialogues and discussions, that would be very helpful. Uh, Speaker, I really wanted to thank the City Manager. Um, this is a very thorough report dealing with a very difficult issue and an issue that's critical to all Torontonians and I think it's also critical to all people who come from varying parts of the province into the city on a daily basis and they leave whether it be by Go Transit or the actual subways that we're actually talking about here today. The report that we actually have in front of us is a report that really helps us in terms of it frames what we ought to be doing as part of this particular process. The City of Toronto was founded in 1793. John Grave Simcoe founded this city through, obviously, the process at, 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 the, at the, the time in terms of legal process, in terms of legal frame, creating the City of Toronto. It's a challenging uh, situation in that we don't have all the authorities and the ability to simply make our own decisions. We still are creatures of the province of Ontario. Like it or not, the fact of the matter is that there's a relationship that we have to deal with on a daily basis with the province of Ontario. It seems to me that the province had choices. They could have simply said, we want basically to take the subway system to upload it and no discussion with the City of Toronto. They didn't do that. It seems to me what the Premier did was to hire um, Mr. Lindsay to say that um, he wanted someone who would be his special um, advisor to the cabinet looking at the uh, transit upload. Well, while we may dislike that fax, many in this room, the fact of the matter is that they are in the process, or they're in the process, they've established a, a mechanism to look at and make some determination. They've offered the opportunity for dialogue to take place with all of our experts, and we are going to simply today give them direction to take that step. The mayor's motion helps that process. And I think that what we ought to do, while we may disagree with it, many have spoken to that, let's not get personal about this and, and, and uh, attempt to castigate. What I think we ought to do is to follow a logical process which has been laid out in the reports of the, that's in front of us. Legal has also offered their opinion on this. The city solicitor has responded to questions that we have asked and so on. And while we may not like it, there have been times that many of us in this room have basically said maybe the province should take not just the trains, but all of transit and upload it and take it and allow us to be able to use resources for other means. I know it's extremely important to us with respect to having good transit in this city. It's good for, obviously, economic development. It's good for all of the social things and concerns that we actually have. But because we are a creature of the province, I do think it's prudent for us to have those discussions with them. They're opening the door for us to talk about this. I don't know whether or not it makes sense. Apparently, none of us does. The city manager, the TTC, and so on. But what they're actually saying is, we're putting a framework. We want to basically develop terms of reference in terms of how we discuss this particular critical issue to, that's critical to all Torontonians. Let's do that. I think it's a prudent thing to do, and we are, I hope, going to do that today. And so, Mr. City Manager, 
I want to thank you and your team for an excellent report because this helps us, along with the mayor's motion and leadership on this file that is critical to Torontonians, clear a pathway for that process to take place. And the Premier has established a way because he has put people in place with expert um, abilities and so on to have dialogue. That's what the people of Toronto want, and I think that's what the people of Ontario want to see, that there's this discussion. And as Councillor Bailao says, people don't care what the mechanisms are. They just want better transit, improved transit, be able to get home, get to wherever they're going in a timely way, reducing the stress level that people are experiencing on a daily basis with that system. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. So we're ready to vote. Okay. The order of the motion. Our first motion would be motion number two by Councillor Matlow. Recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Karajanis, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 3 to 22. Our next motion is motion number five by Councillor Fletcher. Recorded vote. Councillor Pasternak. Councillor Pasternak, I'm sorry, we closed the vote. How do you vote, sir? The motion carries 24 to 1. Our next motion is motion number 3. Councillor Kergiannis. Recorded vote. Councillor Peritza, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 3 to 22. Our next motion is motion 1, revised by Mayor Tory. Recorded vote. Which one? Okay, so Councillor Holliday has asked that... Um, one be voted on separately and you want five. okay let's vote on all of them separately then motion number one recorded vote Part one carries 23 to two. Okay, part two. Part two. Recorded vote. Councillor Crawford, please, thank you. 
Part two of the motion carries unanimously, 25 in favor. Part three. Part three carries 24 to one. Part four, recorded vote. Councillor Pritza, please. Part four carries unanimously, 25 in favor. Part five, recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Part five carries 23 to two. Okay. Motion four by Councillor Layton, recorded vote. Councillor Karagiannis, please. Part five, or sorry, the motion carries 21 to four. Okay, item is amended, recorded vote. Councillor Karagiannis, please. The item is amended, carries 24 to one. Okay, before we go back to cannabis, uh, <laughs> oops, um, can, can we take can we take some releases so we can speed up because I don't think members of council want to come back tomorrow, right? Okay, how about doing some releases? <laughs> Councillor Cressy. Uh, yes, thank you, Speaker. On page four, item CC 1.15, 485 to 489 Wellington Street West, I have an amendment which is for a construction management plan to be added to the confidential attachment. This can be and with that, I can, uh, I can release it. Okay, that's on page four, CC 1.15. On favor, carried. Councillor Mallow, item as amended, on favor, carried. Councillor Mallow, you wanna release yours? Page. I believe it's uh, page five. Page five, yes. Yeah, CC 1.20. You're releasing? Yes. Okay. Page 5, CC 1.20, Councillor Matlow's releasing on favor. Recorded vote. Councillor Bradford, please. Councillor Layton and Councillor Cressy. Councillor Crawford, Councillor Peruzza, and Councillor Wong Tam, please.
The item is amended. Carries 22 to 2. Councillor Layton, are you ready to release yours? No, not yet. Sorry. Not yet? Okay, we do have the supplementary report. Okay. Deputy Mayor Minam Wong. What? Yeah. Um, page 5, MM 1.13, initiating an urgent needs assessment for additional community facilities in the underserviced Thorncliffe Park, Park neighborhood. I, I, I was concerned that Flemington, the Fleming community wasn't getting the same attention, but my understanding this is all going to be dealt with through the facilities master plan, so I'm satisfied and I can release this. On page 8, MM 1.13, you're releasing? Yes. Okay. On favor? On favor. Carried. All right. No more uh, releases? Okay. On which? Yeah. No, but which? The one that, uh, the, on page six? I mean, uh, sorry, page eight? Okay. Recorded vote. The item is adopted unanimously, 25 in favor. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we're going back to page three. CC 1.4. We'll wait for a minute for the staff to put up the, uh, the list on the screen. We were still asking questions. Okay. Councillor Pasternak, questions. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff, um, access to medicinal marijuana has not been mentioned in the report nor in any of the questions to staff. Is anything we're voting on today impede the ability of uh, the use of medicinal marijuana? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, no, it does not. The medicinal marijuana regime still stays intact as is uh, governed federally. Uh, Backdoor sales, uh, that is a fear that comes out uh, when, it, when we have a private sector retail outlets. What are the um, safeguards against backdoor sales? Illegal. Illegal. Through you, Madam Speaker, the entire regime, which includes the federal and provincial uh, statutes, deals with the distribution and the production through distribution, so really from seed to sale uh, regulatory regime. Go uh, governed and enforced both federally and provincially. Is it 100 percent or, or gets close? It gets. <laughs> uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I can never give 100 percent, but certainly the regulation governing where the product comes from and how it's distributed right through to the retail store front uh, is governed and regulated. So um, when it comes to police enforcement and are they ready, there are media reports as most recently as the middle of October, that Toronto police and OPP are not ready. Um, now, I realize police services are probably not here, but can anyone um, say with some certainty that they're ready? Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, certainly I will not speak on behalf of the Chief of Police. I can say so far as enforcement related to illegal storefronts, we have been working with the Toronto Police Service since March of 2016 and continue to do so up till today. Uh, so far as police forces are dealing with any increase in drug impaired uh, driving offenses, they're all managing those processes and certainly that will be a question best responded to by the chief. But isn't it the roadside technologies that are the problem, that they uh, don't have the technology and the rollout 
for enforcement on our roads? So through you, Madam Speaker, certainly the, the matters of impaired driving, whether it be by alcohol or drug, have been a criminal offenses for a long time. The Toronto Police Service has been dealing with impaired driving by drug for many, many years. Uh, I know that the federal government has given some consideration to what the police services need, and there are tools, further tools being developed to help test for certain levels in the blood, and that's a work in progress. I think anything further in respect to police readiness on an impaired driving perspective ought to be answered by the Chief of Police, and I apologize he's not here today. So when it comes to price regulation, I understand that the legislation uh, forbids sellers from deep discounts. There's, a, there's sort of a floor on, on what they can charge for various products. Is that, no. is, is that no. correct? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, we're not aware of any set regulatory uh, floor for pricing. So uh, they could deep discount if they want. Uh, certainly through you, Madam Speaker, I think that's going to be one of the things we see as the regulate, if a regulated or as a regulated regime unfolds, if additional regulatory tools are required. Uh, you know, the principle, and the doctor spoke to this earlier, is the concern around access for youth. Uh, and certainly through the discussions from the federal task force till now is about how to implement tools to ensure that that policy objective is met, which does include dealing with pricing. So on, um, on page, uh, page six, it mentions hours of operation, uh, but it doesn't mention days of the week. Is that, is that seven days a week? Yeah, through you, Madam Speaker, it, it is. It's 9 a.m. till 11 p.m., and that's captured in the regulations that the AGCO as the registrar has under their authority. And when it comes to the federal excise duty, uh, it's written on page 9 that if Ontario's portion of the federal excise duty on recreational cannabis over the first two years of legalization exceeds $100 million, the province will provide 50% of the surplus only to municipalities that have not opted out. So what kind of sales figure do they have to get to capture $100 million in excise duty? And maybe that's... Yeah, so uh, through you, Madam Speaker, we, we do know there was some reports, and I believe our CFO has recently uh, identified a ballpark of uh, 1.6 to 2.3 billion dollars would spin out a considerable amount of excess tax in, it, in and above the 100 million dollar mark, uh, and there would be a share. So uh, I think we're still trying to determine, based on an average price, tax collected. Uh, when they would, at what sales amount they would hit that $100 million threshold, how much over. I had it here. Councillor Perks, question? Uh, thank you. Uh, my first question was for the clerk. Was, ah, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Clerk, Madam Clerk, yes, if we could just wait. Da, da, da. I'll reset your time. Okay. Um, so currently it's among the duties of the clerk's office that when we get an application for a special occasion liquor permit or uh, a new restaurant seeking a liquor license that the clerk has to get involved in the process of notifying council and handling the paperwork. In this instance we've been told there's a I think 14 or 15 day period. Will you be able to provide the same level of notification and support to council for this as you currently do with the liquor license system? No, and I don't believe that the legislation is the same and it doesn't necessarily delegate to the clerk that process. And I believe that municipal licensing and standards is still working with other divisions on operationalizing the entire matter. But just given this, the scheduling of council, if there's a 15 day notification period, the likelihood of us being able to deal with it in a council cycle is pretty much next to zero, isn't it? Yes. That, that, that is without question. Um, to the city solicitor, uh, we um, currently have a system of, uh, under the AGCO for liquor licenses which allows uh, people to talk about local public interest. Yes. It's similar to what's proposed in this legislation, I believe, right? Thank you. Um, to yes. municipal licensing <laughs> and standards. 
So over the years, we've had a number of moments when city council and, and individual councillors and neighbourhoods have tried to raise broader public interest issues. Uh, hours of closing, uh, the number of seats available, noise, uh, violence taking place and so on. Have we been successful in attaching conditions to licences to deal with those problems? So through you, Madam Speaker, certainly there's been a change in the approach the AGCO has taken in respect to applying conditions that they believe are municipal responsibility to the liquor license sale permit. Okay, because not everyone works in the public service, maybe we can give a, a, a simpler answer. A councillor or a member of the community or city council goes to the AGCO and says, we want to limit the hours of operation. We want to limit the number of seats. We want to have them do some work in the community. Are we able, in current practice, to attach those conditions to liquor licenses? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, as a municipality, no, we are not. Right. And when we go to the AGCO and ask them to attach them, do they? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, that's on a case-by-case -case basis and adjudicated through the registrar. And, and you remember the, the last time they did? Itself. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I cannot recall the last time they did. And when we bring one, we, we often will go to the adjudicative body, and we, at least for the last five years, we always lose, correct? Uh, through, through you, Madam Speaker, I think that the results of those appeals at the License Appeal Tribunal would be best answered by our colleagues in legal services who have actually been attending. I actually can't speak to whether we always lose. I would say that's probably a little bit of an overstatement. But I know that we have had some difficulties convincing the AGCO to attach the conditions that Council requests. So does, does the uh, AGCO have a uh, position, a formal position, which they take to consistently oppose every application by the City to attach conditions other than you will post a, no a notice saying, please do not disturb your neighbour? Do they or do they not have a position of opposing every other condition? We, we have had some difficulty consistently with the AGCO in accepting city conditions, yes. Does anything in the new legislation give us hope that we would have better footing in getting outcomes that we wanted under the public interest section in the legislation? Is, have, has anyone got a memo? Is there language in the legislation that makes it look more likely? There is some language in the regulation that defines public interest, uh, and if you'd like, I can tell you what that but is, Madam Speaker, but uh, uh, given the very short period for providing comments and the fact that there is no guarantee that a municipality will itself receive notice, uh, the notice requirements are that the notice be posted on the website and on the facility. Um, now, the registrar can add additional notice practices and procedures, but we don't know what those will be yet. So given those two things, I, I would suggest that we uh, should not necessarily hope for better results. Okay, thank you. And finally, to the Medical Officer of Health. I know you've been asked similar questions before. I just want to make it really, really clear. In the best of all possible worlds, your advice to this Council would be that there should be public ownership and operation of retail cannabis sales. Through you, Madam Speaker, that is correct. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, just picking up uh, from Councillor Perks's questioning regarding the notification, a 15-day notification period is required to receive uh, public input. Um, does that allow staff enough time to assess whether or not that's a viable location? I'm looking on page five. Perhaps, Madam Speaker, if you don't mind holding my time. Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, I'm sorry, I th wasn't sure if the question was being directed at myself. Uh, the period of notice, the 15 days, is a requirement for a placard to be placed and it gives us that's the period of time that any member of the public or the city has an opportunity to provide input. The uh, notice of application is also going to be posted on the AGCO website. And, so fi and 15 days is not, a, is not a significant amount of time for, for even staff to, uh, to assess the site uh, to determine whether or not 
sorry, Councillor. No, it's it's okay. Hold, hold. Council, uh, I'm going to put your time on hold. Councillor Peruzza, please, um, and Councillor Grimes. It's hard. Councillor Wong Tam is asking a question, and you're talking right in front of her. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Okay. Just just to confirm, 15 days notification is not sufficient time for staff to investigate, to provide input or counts, uh, or guidance to council. Uh, or even have time to write a report if, if that was deemed necessary, is it? So through you, Madam Speaker, we've not discussed the operationalizing of how we would offer public, um, our information regarding public health and safety on the public interest consideration. That's certainly a discussion that we are going to have as staff on how to operationalize that if the city opts in. And just for a point of clarity, currently at this point, the AGCO has not committed to pushing notifications to us to start that clock. We are, however, having ongoing discussions with them and have indicated very strongly uh, our expectation that we receive such. So, uh, it, so and th therefore, it's actually premature for us to even assume that we would be given any formal notification aside from what would be posted on, on the proposed site. Is that correct? So through you, Madam Speaker, yes, for clarity, there currently is no written commitment that requires notification to the municipality of an application. The requirement for notice is posting at the store location, posting on the AGCO uh, website, and then it's open for 15 days for the, any member of the public or the city or whomever else to offer input in respect to their concerns on public interest basis, and that can be done online through their website. And if, uh, if members of the public are not able to respond within that 15-day period, uh, what happens then? So through you, Madam Speaker, the registrar does have a series of due diligence exercises that they undertake, back, back checking, <laughs> ensuring that the people who are applicants are free and clear of criminal conduct, et cetera. So there are a series of checks and balances put in place by the registrar, but as per the legislation, they, they have a 15-day period for people to, to send in information, send in their concerns, and for them to adjudicate on it. And after that period of time, they make their decision based on the fulsomeness of the investigation they've conducted. And can I ask, uh, with respect to the, the provincial uh, legislation uh, and the regulatory framework, um, is it unusual for the province to go out of their way to, st to stipulate that a city or municipality uh, should not have any land use control over uh, the sale of a particular substance? Is, is, this seems to be a big long reach because they don't do this with necessarily uh, alcohol that we're not allowed to provide uh, uh, zoning or, or, uh, or have any land use planning say over the sale of alcohol or perhaps the sale of tobacco. Um, but they, they seem to reach really far into municipalities on this one. Do you want to speak to the retail? Retail use? The, uh, the, typically they're not differentiated. They're, it's, a retail, it's a retail use. Uh, it's, un, it's a bit unusual. To answer your question directly. Yeah. So, is there any is there any other product or substance or um, that that they have that they have done this with um, that they would go so far, reach so deep into municipality and say we actually strip you of your land use uh, uh, land use powers. We're going to prohibit you from actually passing any zoning bylaws or any land use uh, 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 local planning framework. You you just take it as we as we deliver it out. It just seems really quite unusual. I think an example I could think of is, would be through a minister's zoning order, but otherwise I'm hard-pressed to think of an example. Okay, thank you. And have you, uh, have you heard about the, uh, uh, the that I understand that there's, there's potentially there may be an announcement from the Premier tomorrow uh, about changing the, the specific legislation that we're actually debating today, that perhaps there may be a restriction of the number of operators, uh, operating license. Have you heard anything of this sort? There's a pending announcement tomorrow, apparently. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I'm not aware of any That'll information that, of that regard that I can share. Yeah. Thank you. But that would certainly change what we should do today if there might be a surprise announcement tomorrow. That will be the last question. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, certainly the report that we've placed in front of you is based on the information that we have in hand at the time the report was created. Yeah. Uh, as I indicated previously, I understand this is a bit of a shifting landscape as far as a new regime, you know, we're ending prohibition of a substance and the expectation of there being some change over time uh, would not be a surprise to me whatsoever. 
Uh, and certainly, I would hope that any information that can be uh, brought into the discussion to benefit Council's deliberations, that we ought to be receiving that in as timely a fashion as possible. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, Speaker Nunziata to uh, ask questions. Thank you. Uh, so, to Tracy, um, would they need? Uh, uh, would uh, they be required to have a municipal business license? Uh, to you, through you, Mr. Chair. I don't know, Mr. Mayor. To you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the legislation has actually prohibited us from in implementing any business licensing regime, so they will not require a business license from the City of Toronto. It will be a license to operate, a retail operator license, a retail manager license, and a retail store authorization, all three issues uh, issued by the AGCO as the registrar. And so they don't have to meet any of the requirements that any other business in the city would have to, parking, any of that. They just can open up anywhere. Oh, there's, so no, there's no rules. So certainly through you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, uh, or Mr. Mayor, they, they still, every business is still required to meet the standing regulations of the city. So certainly the zoning bylaw and compliance with any applicable laws in that regard uh, are still required to be met, irrespective of the type of operation that is, is being uh, opened. So we won't be getting any revenue from any of the licenses then? From a li through you, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, through the licensing? No. No. Every other business needs a license? Well, no, actually not, Councillor okay. Cole. There are businesses that don't need a license. Um, so if we move the recommendation in the report, I, I have a number of um, uh, dispensaries in my ward illegally that I've had for a while, and we've tried to close them down. We, in one in particular, we have raided five times. I personally, as well, with the police, raided. They're charged. They go to court. They reopen. Uh, they got signs out, out on the front saying that uh, proceeds go to Black Lives Matter. They're urinating all over the streets. So how is this going to help me? How, how can I was told by I was told by the police, I was told by the city that we cannot close them down, we don't have the tools to close them down, and five times we've raided. So how, could, how is this going to help me with the, with the ones that I have that we can't close down? So through you, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, the new Cannabis Control Act does provide additional enforcement tools for the municipality and the police, which includes an interim closure order, orders to bar entry. We have conducted those. We've moved from 36 open and operating illegal storefronts on October 17 to approximately 12. We've been conducting search warrants, undertaking enforcement. There are also significant fines attached in the Cannabis Control Act uh, legislation to 250000 to 500000 to $1 million, continuing offense fines as well. But you do articulate the challenge that we have had with, with trying to combat the illegal storefront operators since March of 2016. This statute has given us additional tools, tools we asked for, to try to address this proliferation of illegal, unsafe operating storefronts. So these 12 are in my ward. <laughs> uh, okay. Through you, Madam uh, it feels like so, it, but through you, Madam so Speaker, they're across the city. We, we have raided these places. We have bashed into the door. We have done everything, and, and they reopen in three, in, three, uh, in three days. So what, what, no, I have, personally, I've raided them, myself, yes, with the police. I'm, listen, I'm very, I'm very right. proactive. I'm very proactive. I don't have a I gun, but I raid. Um, please continue with your questions. So what? What, uh, uh, you say that the landlord gets charged, so how much? <laughs> so through you, Mr. I Mayor. I mean, is it only $50 or is no. it thousands of dollars? No, through, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, certainly you're, you are one of our secret weapons now in this battle <laughs> against illegal storefronts, Councillor Nunziata. Uh, we will get her a badge and a uniform to assist in the endeavor. I'm happy to do that. Uh, there are significant fines for operators and for the landlords. We have charged a number of landlords that are continuing to allow these illegal operations to occur. Uh, the fine amounts are? Uh, through the mayor to uh, Councillor Nunziata. For a corporation, the fines are a minimum $25,000 for a first offense, up to a million dollars for subsequent offenses, as well as the um, risk of imprisonment for up to two years for individuals. 
So the penalties for violating of the Cannabis Act are much more substantial now than they ever were, as well as a landlord risks having that property frozen for two years upon conviction of a charge under the Cannabis Act. So not only do they face the monetary penalty, but also that property will then be, they will not be able to derive any revenue from it for up to two years upon sentencing. Okay, Madam Speaker, okay, thank, thank you very you. much. And uh, that brings us to questions of staff from Councillor Matlow. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, uh, some of, the, some of, the, some of, the, some of the, the best questions that I could ask come directly from residents in Ward uh, 12, Toronto St. Paul's. So, uh, these two are from Olga Fowl, who's been a real advocate in, in the neighbourhood. Um, uh, uh, so, the first question from Olga uh, is, uh, if I can ask you, uh, uh, Municipal Licensing Standards, how will the public be able to engage uh, in decisions on license issuing? They won't be. So through you, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the application once received by the AGCO will be made public on the website, as well as the requirement for it to be placarded at the property. The, uh, the resident who wishes to make a submission can do so online to the AGCO within that 15-day period. <clears throat> Would there be any public meeting at all? Or? Through you, Mr. Mayor, no, sir. And um, are there any controls, um, I'm paraphrasing, but are there any controls that we would have now uh, to avoid clustering of, of these shops in any sort of, you know, one retail strip? No, through you, Mr. Mayor. Currently, the only buffering in the uh, Act is the 150 metres from schools. Uh, there has been no specific language in the statute or the regulation indicating uh, concerns around concentrations or density. Are there any... Are there any uh, uh, perhaps to you or to planning, I'm not sure who would be the, the right uh, staff, but uh, with respect to sort of zoning controls and... Uh, now, they may, they may come out and they may be fine, but if there are issues that we would have addressed, are there any other tools in the toolbox that haven't been raised to the legislation that we, that we would be awarded if we opted in? Uh, through you, Mr. S Mr. Mayor, I can indicate that the legislation provides the registrar with an authority to revoke a license if in the public interest the uh, issues around public health access for youth or uh, the illicit market is, is providing evidence, uh, they have that right to, re to revoke the license or but the authorization. No, but no zoning tools, though, in particular? No. The, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, it's considered a retail use, so it's subject to the standard retail use provisions of our zoning bylaw. Um, uh, two other questions. Um, you mentioned earlier about the, the additional um, <coughs> enforcement powers uh, that, that the province gave through the legislation. Would that be provided to us um, regardless of whether or not we opt in or out? Yes, certainly through you, Mr. Mayor. Those are statutory authorities that we have irrespective of the decision taken by council. Okay, so we could opt out and they'd still be supporting us with enforcement on the, the, those cowboy operators? Uh, no. So through you, Mr. Mayor, the responsibility for enforcement in respect to illegal, unlicensed, yeah, unregulated yeah, yeah. solely resides with the municipality. Yeah, that's and the funding for that is currently provided in the implementation fund uh, that I mentioned earlier, $3 million in the first tranche. We believe a minimum of $3 million on the second, subject to being opted in. If we are opted out, then that will be $5,000. So there will be no longer funding to support the enforcement efforts but, but in it, the next but two but years. Isn't illegal illegal? Like what, what? Do you understand the logic? But like whether a municipality opts in or opts out, shouldn't illegal operations be addressed equally, I mean, it's illegal. It, through you, Mr. Mayor, it certainly is. It has been, sir, since March of, well, long before March of 2016. That's when they started operating, but the responsibility for the enforcement uh, has, has fallen squarely on the shoulders of Municipal Licensing and Standards and Toronto Pu the Toronto Police Service that, wow. in respect to the illegal um, storefronts. How far advanced the, uh, the, the, the Liberal government, uh, the previous government, how far advanced was their, their model, uh, you know, to have the, you know, the cannabis store and, and to have it sort of more regulated like the LCBO? Was that kind of ready to, ready to go? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, certainly the, uh, the Ontario Cannabis Store's uh, operation did have challenges in finding locations to, to site their stores. I didn't... Regardless of the challenges or, or ease, mm -hmm. did they have sort of the model set up? Like, was that, was that going to be what was going to happen? 
and then and then it kind of just went to the wayside. Uh, certainly, through you, Madam Speaker, the federal government did give a deadline for provinces to sort out their approach to retail, yeah. and the province did work diligently to de to develop the regime that they chose that this council supported, which was a provincially uh, run store model. Here's the nub of it. Um, again, the hypothetical, perhaps, but. Um, it was confirmed earlier that we couldn't impose a sales tax, <coughs> but could Toronto, the city of Toronto, create a city of Toronto cannabis store and then actually bring in revenue, uh, you know, rather than a, a tax, but actually, you know, yeah. bring in revenue and then, and then re you know, be self-regulating about where it put it and, and, and be responsible about that and bring in enforcement to ensure that they're or, you know, monitoring so it's not sold to minors and it's not near schools or child cares. I mean, could Toronto do that if it chose to? So through you, Madam Speaker, if the City of Toronto chose to create a separate corporation to become a cannabis retailer, uh, we would be subject to the provincial regime that deals with the cannabis licensing, uh, where it does outline a certain number of those things. Uh, other than uh, any legal concerns that I'm sure our good city solicitor may raise, we would be subject to the provincial statute the same as other, other operators. Thank you. I have to be eligible. Yeah. And pass a criminal. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam <laughs> Speaker. Uh, through you to the Executive Director of MLS. <coughs> Give her a second. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I, Are we I, good? I, we do your... <laughs> Somebody get her some water. It's their doctor in the house. <laughs> All right. If you can uh, just give me a second, Madam Speaker. Um, uh, through you to the Executive Director. Uh, earlier, uh, there, was a, there was a statement about there's a reduction in the number of these illegal uh, uh, stores. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think we've ended up to something like 12 now. Is there any speculation on what's happened? Why, why did these people pack up shop and leave? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker. You know, certainly we've had a sustained enforcement effort in this regard. Uh, as well, the province was very clear, and it's in the conditions uh, in the statute, that people who are operating post-October 17 in an illegal storefront would not be eligible for a license. Um, so I'm sure the combination of the enforcement, the additional tools that we have, the, uh, the risk to property, as, as Director Schraga mentioned, as well as the risk of not procuring uh, a legal license may have been the factors that have contributed to the reduction. Would it be a reasonable assertion that maybe the f there's not a financial model if there's going to be all of these legal places where people can go uh, without risk, um, that you know, going to an illegal place really, you know, the same reason why we don't have is you know, a proliferation of underground uh, booze cans that, that make moonshine in the basement when, as a consumer, can just go to the LCBO and buy it? Certainly through you, Madam Speaker. The, the opportunity to have a properly regulated, safe regime uh, was the foundation to our recommendation that Council not opt out of this regulated regime. The concern related to public safety, certainly the quality of product, the, the lack of tracking back on where the product is coming from, the, the uh, ingredients, any things that may be cut into it are all significant uh, public health and public safety concerns that we have. Certainly, and that has been the foundation for why we've made the recommendation we have today. Now, I want to understand, what, it, what, what is this thing that we are not objecting to or are going to object to, these stores? Uh, are, they, are they really big establishments in, in our experience or your research? Uh, are they fairly compact places? Is there a fairly low bar to entry of the market, assuming I'm an operator and I get a license through the provincial government? A straightforward thing, or do I have to deal with tractor trailers coming in and out? Like, in comparison to, say, an LCBO. Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, there are no requirements on store size, though if we are to take our learnings from the illegal storefronts, they generally were smaller operations. Okay. Uh, there are certainly a series of requirements that any operator needs to meet. I would say that the barrier to entry after you've gone through the due diligence and the rigor of the background checks, right. uh, opening a storefront, there are requirements that must be met that include ser um, security provisions and training by the AGCO. So there are a fair... There's a fair regime uh, around ensuring that they're operating properly. What I'm getting at, though, is uh, there's perhaps a fairly good profitability in these stores, that there isn't a significant in infrastructure investment, and therefore uh, the risk to operators for non-compliance is high. You'll lose your license if you did something wrong. Uh, you're really giving up a lot of money. 
uh, through you, Madam Speaker, certainly the extent of the proliferation we've seen of the illegals and the sustained manner in which they've operated in the city is a very good indicator of the, uh, the revenue opportunities okay. that they're seeing. So I'm still a little confused about what these things are. I know Councillor Perks was asking about the AGCO objection process and posting in 15 days, but that's for bars. We're not talking about consumption establishments. We're talking about places that sell the product and the product is fairly compact in nature right like it's I don't know what they are envelopes or jars or packages so through you madam speaker uh, yes these are retail locations that also as we mentioned earlier is why they fall under the retail zoning provisions uh, consumption is not permitted in the premise persons under 19 years of age are not permitted on the premise at all uh, so there are a number of factors that are that go into how these places operate and do we have a track record or experience from anyone about the types of issues that we might see around a liquor store where it could be anything from consumption to panhandling to lots of traffic, that sort of stuff, or, or uh, in our experience or best guess, a lot of those physical issues around those stores might not be seen in a cannabis, cannabis retailer? Uh, certainly through you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm not aware of any specific uh, additional concerns related to liquor stores. Certainly that is a conversation we could have with the Toronto Police Service, but certainly uh, there is a dis definite distinction to be made that these are retail locations. They are not places of consumption, and consumption is not permitted on those, in those premises. And last question uh, again, because I don't know what we're looking at. Um, <coughs> let's say I had a, a really bad day at council, or I had a really good day at council a year from now, and I decided that I wanted to partake in this. <laughs> Could I bring my kids along to the store? Uh, and, and if they couldn't go in, could I leave them outside for them to watch me through the window? Or just how secure are these places in comparison to a liquor store That was youth? your last question. Oh, so through you, Madam Speaker, the statute is very specific that no persons under the age of 19 can access the property. And I would strongly suggest against leaving a six-year-old in front of the store. <laughs> Thank you. And they yeah, can't be visible from the outside. Okay, that's it for the questions. Um, Mayor... <coughs> Councillor Perks. Uh, on, a, on a point of privilege, I'm, I'm sorry I missed my moment on this. I was uh, having a word with a fellow member of council. I understand in your uh, questions of staff, you suggested that the proceeds of cannabis sales go to Black Lives Matter. I think that that's uh, unacceptable and it impugns an entire group in the city of Toronto. And I think that it, it speaks to uh, a characterization of marijuana use in the city of Toronto, which frankly, should not be in this chamber, and I ask you to withdraw that. Well, uh, Councillor Perks, I believe that maybe you didn't understand my comment. What I said is the one that I have in my ward, they have a sign on the window that says that. And, and Speaker, I understand there's yeah. all kinds of ways we can ask questions about this, and the fact that you chose to do it in a way which targets a specific racialized group I think is inappropriate, and I would ask you to withdraw it. It's a fact. I'm just commenting on what's there. Point of order, Councillor Grimes. Yes, Madam Speaker, uh, it's 5.30, uh, half an hour to go. I think there's five no, items. No, no, I'm sorry, Councillor Grimes. That time for 6 o'clock is for the next council meeting in January. So we're going to what time tonight? Till we finish. Till 8? Okay. Okay. Uh, to speak, Mayor Tory. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, first of all, I, I think it's important for us to put it in the context as we now have debate after all the questions of staff that this is not a, uh, a situation of our making. Uh, we are where we are, uh, thanks to the fact that the federal parliament decided to make a change to the law uh, and that the provincial uh, parliament uh, decided to put in place a regime uh, which we are here discussing in terms of the consequences that it has. Uh, for us. Mayor, do you have a motion? I, I do indeed, and thank you for reminding me of that, Madam Speaker. And I have this motion here, and I hope the clerk's uh, uh, department is more efficiently than I have will put it up. And it is meant to deal with a point that I've been uh, making in the public and that I think a number of people in this uh, chamber have been making in a number of different ways through their questions and in public discourse on this uh, in preceding days. Uh, and I will get to that uh, in, in my remarks. I uh, understand the fact that this is a sensitive matter with a lot of residents in Toronto, some of whom even support uh, the legalization of marijuana but have continuing concerns with respect to 
the safety of their neighborhood, the safety of their children, uh, the uh, sanctity, I'll call it, of, of retail uh, strips where, frankly, uh, a lot of people think it will be disruptive to have one, let alone a cluster, of, uh, of marijuana outlets. And, and so I think this is uh, a sensitive ma matter with a lot of people. But I ask myself in deciding how to vote on this and, 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 put, and in fact, uh, how to formulate this uh, very, I hope, very concise motion that I put forward, what is in the broader public interest ultimately when you look at all the different considerations. And when you look at uh, safety and health, when you look at compatibility, when you look at uh, the existence of, of uh, frankly, organized cr criminal elements that control today, uh, well, up to October 17th, did control and still have an involvement uh, in the retail sale uh, of marijuana, a now legalized product, um, I believe that it, that it is in the broader public interest in terms of protecting and advancing all of those things to opt in so that we will have a regulated system. We can have a debate about the merits of this regulated system that this government has put in place at the provincial parliament versus other options, including the one uh, that was um, proposed to be put in place by Premier Wynne and her government, but that really isn't uh, on the table uh, because the provincial government has indicated uh, and passed legislation and regulations dealing with the kind of system they think uh, should be in place. I will say that while I respect that decision in the sense that they made it at the provincial parliament, um, I don't think that uh, system in and of itself and the decision making surrounded it uh, paid adequate respect to us. And by that I mean not a personal thing, uh, but I mean rather that they didn't pay adequate respect to cities and to this city in particular, which is a bigger, more complex city with a lot more challenges uh, that are uh, potentially uh, in front of us uh, on fronts such as safety and health, uh, compatibility with neighborhoods, uh, and uh, even the presence of, of uh, criminal elements uh, in our midst. I am not going to conjure up uh, you know, examples, and I know he was doing it in part for uh, purposes of emphasis, uh, when Councillor Cole talked about 100 um, marijuana dispensaries in, in one place that the AGCO could permit. Um, they have a process that's in place. We heard earlier on about how people can get involved in that online, 15 days and so on. That is a process that to me is inadequate. Uh, but I have enough faith in the AGCO that I don't think they'll just be licensing every application that comes in to the point where you could get 100 uh, regulated, legal uh, cannabis outlets in a, in a given block or a given neighborhood. I will say this, though. Uh, if we opt out, if we choose not to opt in, then we go back to, I believe, not only the 100 or so uh, marijuana outlets that did exist illegally in the hands of organized crime, and I think uh, whatever other arguments there may be about what Speaker Nunziata said in her remarks, the fact is she talked about five outlets in her area that just keep getting raided and just keep reopening. And I think even the fines that uh, the Premier and others talk about as being a major deterrent to these people sort of being and staying in business, I think a lot of them are corporate shells and so on that would never pay those fines and there would no, be no ability to execute against them to collect that money. And so I think the consequences for us of not opting in which Ottawa, by the way, did today, whatever may have happened in other places like Mississauga, uh, are first of all, that we will be back to the true Wild West, which is where illegal operators will open up in huge numbers all across the city uh, and will be having huge problems trying to enforce the law because that is, as was pointed out, our responsibility. And secondly, we will have opted out based on conversations, and I asked the question on your behalf three times when I was on this conference call with the ministers because I wanted to be sure I heard right that if you opt out, uh, then you never requalify for the money based on the current regulations and policy. So that the millions of dollars that they are sending our way, which by the way uh, is an inadequate sum uh, given what we told them were our costs of enforcing the law, uh, even the millions we are proposed to get starting with three million in January, we will not receive not then, not after we reopted in. And so I would just say, uh, Speaker, uh, through you to conclude that um, I don't think uh, that, that the right approach is for us to sort of say we have some bargaining position. I think if it, when it's this government, I'm just not sure that that is a valid argument to make. And I think the risk of that in any event out, are outweighed uh, by the risks of the uh, going back to the Wild West and having dispensaries open willy-nilly all over the city illegally and us trying to enforce the law at great expense to us and at great expense to the public interest, which says safety, health, compatibility, and so on should be placed first. And so I think my motion, which asks them, and I, I mentioned to the Premier we would be considering a motion such as this, uh, to, to ask for this kind of uh, latitude to uh, do what we need to do in a big city to properly address and protect the public interest. And I hope members will support this. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you.
We do have a question, uh, Councillor Karajanis. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm surprised, to, uh, and I'm delighted, surprised to see the mayor coming in, in this fashion. Really appreciate this, um, Mayor. You know that I'll be coming up with a motion regarding wards being able to opt out or opt in. I think uh, I'm not sure if your staff have canvassed, but I've talked to a couple of people, and they are certainly uh, in this fashion. And you say, based on proximity to other ca uh, or farther restrict the location of cannabis retail stores based on proximity or other city identified uses. Would you be willing to support on um, that we are able to um, identify neighborhoods that don't want it and they are able to opt out as large cities have been done doing this? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker. Councillor, I'd like to be able to find, because the second day time today you've asked me a question of whether I'd be willing to support something, and I'm afraid I'm going to answer this one in the negative. And it's not because I don't understand your concern, but it's because I think that, that an impossible situation for us to be in as the people, again, who will have the responsibility and the cost of enforcing the law would be to have a patchwork quilt of neighborhoods all over the city where if you cross one street, uh, you know, the cops, the police officers will, will have a different set of laws on the north side from the south side, depending on what neighborhood you're in. And I just don't think that kind of a, of a regime is, uh, is practical for us. Again, it, it falls back to us uh, to be the ones actually enforcing these laws, not the province. Nobody's going to call the OPP uh, or the RCMP. We're going to get the call. And uh, so I would have to say no just because I don't think it's practical. You realize, Mayor, that in neighborhoods where there are bordering uh, municipalities that have been barring this, uh, like Markham and Mississauga, like Etobicoke, uh, there's going to be an abundance of shops that will be opening up in order to cater to those municipalities that have closed down, and those, and those, and those neighborhoods will uh, be put at risk. I, I agree that's a, that's a prospect, but I think it's covered by this, uh, by this uh, motion through you, Madam Speaker, because it says that one of the things that we would identify as a use that we would seek to uh, restrict would be uh, proximity to other cannabis retail stores. So to me, uh, I would say that is a, pr a prime example of where I want us to have the latitude to say, you know what, on Steeles Avenue on the south side, there are not going to be six or four. Uh, there might be one, and uh, that one might be really busy because it's close to Markham, but at the end of the day, we're not going to have six cannabis shops uh, all in a row on one block of a, of a street. That part I can see. I just can't see a part where we might have 23 neighborhoods or 18 wards in the city that say they're out and seven that are in and, and the police and, and, and the licensing authorities are trying to figure out, you know, how they enforce the law. And, and I just don't think it'll work. That's just a practical. But we approach. have had a precedent set in this, in, this, in this thing where wards opted out or we were allowed wards to opt out. You're, you, you're aware of that. And which uh, regime? The Airbnb. Councillor Fragadax brought it up and we allowed her to continue. For words to opt out. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to well, ask somebody. Whether I, I that's don't think that true, that's anything to do with what we're discussing today. Okay. Thank so. you. So. Okay. okay um, Council Wong Tam. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just <coughs> want to clarify with the the mayor. The the intention is to to adopt the staff recommendations to opt into the uh, to the new program, and then at the same time. While we've asked, after we've opted in, asked the province to allow the city to have uh, further authorities to restrict the location of uh, potential stores. Is that correct? Yes. Madam Speaker, yes. Th does that put us in a position of strength by opting in and then asking for uh, additional powers when they've stipulated very clearly that the, pro the province's regime will, does not allow municipalities to determine the number, the location, the concentration, or the manner of operation of uh, private cannabis retail stores? Well, Madam Speaker, I tried to address this in my remarks, but I believe that if you're sort of looking at our relative positions of strength, I'm not sure how it puts us in a position of strength with a government that I'm not sure is that interested in, you know, sort of changing their policy because we don't opt in. Um, I think that we might be more likely to persuade them that opting in was the right thing to do to have a properly regulated business here and not the Wild West and not a whole bunch of illegal uh, dispensaries and that we might persuade them that at least in the case of the City of Toronto, if not all cities, they should have some latitude then within that regime to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, further regulate the proximity to other things. And uh, there's also the financial consequence. And, and you know, as I mentioned, uh, there's millions of dollars coming our way uh, that won't come if we opt out. And they told me very clearly that if we opt out and then opt back in later, that we will not get that money. The, we won't, the, get, we won't get it retroactively or recover that money. 
But I believe that the province already is aware of the city's position by way of MLS reports uh, as well as the Board of Health reports. Uh, both of them have gone to the, the province of what our preference would be, uh, including some of the stipulations that we would want with respect to se separation distances to schools and other sensitive areas. Um, and they have still said, no, you can't have any of that. Uh, but you're still choosing to opt in and then coming back and, and asking very nicely. We, we once again reiterating that you want the option of choosing your locations. Yes, because I believe, as I said, I believe if you looked at the relative risks, uh, the risks through you, Madam Speaker, the risk of having the Wild West here, where we have a whole bunch of illegal dispensaries <laughs> popping up in greater number than ever before across the city, with the massive enforcement job that then uh, uh, puts on our doorstep, uh, is, uh, is, is worse than the option of opting in and going to ask again admitting that this discussion has been ongoing between officials for a while, that we be given some greater latitude uh, beyond the fact that we can just show up as stakeholders in front of the AGCO with our online submission saying we don't want this. And so uh, I believe our argument is actually quite persuasive, but I agree it hasn't been successful so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cole, questions? Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, 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 Mr. Mayor, I uh, agree with you uh, that uh, we don't have that much leverage, but uh, I uh, am one who uh, knows the inevitability of these can cannabis stores are coming. And I I'm just trying to say, don't you think it's better that we had some kind of power? We've got uh, the MLS here, uh, our licensing department, our public health, they basically have lost any power to deal with these new so-called legal stores. They have no power. They don't even, I don't think they even require a, a license, I don't think. So why not ask that we consider giving our medical officer of health or our uh, MLS uh, department uh, some kind of control and, and then they're opening up. They don't open up till April 1st, we've got time. So it's, there's not as if it's a mad rush that if we opt out, we can't opt in uh, n next council meeting. I would say this, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, through you to the member. Um, we do have, the, 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 first of all, the, the deadline of January 22nd is a statutory deadline. It's not changeable by regulation, so they'd have to go back to the parliament uh, to change that date. So we do have to make a decision before that. Uh, I think you understand that. The deadline for stores opening, yes, is April the 1st. Um, it comes down to me to what happens after the 22nd of, uh, of April and, 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 and indeed on the 1st of April, uh, after the 22nd of January and on the 1st of April. I believe that what will happen is they will not uh, accede to, uh, just because we've not opted in, accede to the changes that we want to make for that reason alone. Uh, and we will be out the millions of dollars that we need to help enforce the law going forward because they've made it very clear that that money will not be available to somebody who opts out and then opts in later. And so I just think we're better off uh, overall, not just financially, but we're better off uh, to have a situation where we opt in. Uh, it is a regulated system. It has many imperfections, but that we then press our case for this uh, additional power, which is exactly what you were saying we want uh, through the Medical Officer of Health or otherwise, to make sure that we have tighter conditions that we could impose if we wish to do so on the issues that Councillor Karajanis or yourself raised. Uh, and I just think that this is a better course for us to follow overall than to follow the course where we opt out uh, and uh, then sort of, you know, hope, hope for the best but run a real risk of having all of these illegal, uh, illegal uh, dispensaries and the huge cost of enforcing the law. Well, and I guess the other question I have is the, uh, uh, the uh, time here is that uh, uh, we can still opt in uh, at a later date and we're also hearing, uh, the thing that worries me too, talk about uh, time frames. We're hearing uh, Councillor Wong Tan mention that uh, the uh, Premier is going to make some announcement today uh, as a result of uh, tomorrow because everybody's opting out. That maybe uh, there's going to, we should wait at least till tomorrow to see what announcement he's going to make uh, of changing some of the regulations. Uh, so if we opt in today, it, it, we're, we, we can't uh, change. We're in forever, as I've said before. That was your last question. I don't know anything about the Premier making an announcement uh, tomorrow. Uh, I do know of the conference call that I participated in, which, which they had one for AMO, and because we don't belong, they had one 
that we were able to participate in, and that's where I had a chance to ask questions about the money. And I kept asking, because I said, do you mean to say if we opt back in two weeks later or two months later, we don't qualify for not only the money we missed, but money going forward? And they confirmed, yes, that is the case. And I think you heard the officials confirming that earlier on. There will be no money for us going forward, millions of dollars uh, that I believe we will need in order to enforce whatever the regime is, whether it's their regime or some other regime. And so I just think we're better off overall. I, I, don't, I haven't seen any word of the Premier making a formal announcement. That would be a surprising state of affairs to me when they know that we're making a decision on this uh, today because of a deadline they set. Uh, but uh, I, I, that's all I can say, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. And let me begin by saying that four years ago around this time when we took office in the last term and I had the honour of being selected as the chair of the Toronto Drug Strategy. Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Cressy. That's all right. After we said, Councillor Kerjanis held the item down, so he speaks first. Okay, sorry. Councillor Kerjanis to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's two items, uh, two uh, motions that I have, if the um, staff can put it in. Um, the first one says that uh, each... Uh, that we as a city allow uh, wards to decide if they want to opt in to the provincially li licensed cannabis retail stores in their wards. Uh, I'm not sure if you, uh, what ruling you'll have on that one, because I do have a follow-up. Want to put my time on hold? Well, I can't, I can't comment. Uh, I will comment. Once I get the motion, then I could comment. Okay. okay. Madam Speaker, my second motion is that this council requests the province of Ontario to permit council to delegate to each ward councillor the authority to decide where to opt in to provincially licensed cannabis retail stores. That's something that we can go to the province and ask. Madam Speaker, overwhelmingly I've heard from my constituents that they are not looking for any cannabis location stores to be opened up. Uh, there's municipalities. I can't even hear myself, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Sir Cole, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sure. Madam Speaker, there's large municipalities that have decided to opt out. We heard today the mayor say that, uh, that Ottawa, I'm not sure if it was Ottawa or Oshawa that opted out. That's a large municipality. There's municipalities that certainly do not want uh, cannabis locations in their, uh, in their uh, cities, uh, towns. And similarly, I am uh, asking that uh, we support this motion to give the same rights to our neighborhoods and our communities. Madam Speaker, when we're representing something like anywhere between 100 to 140,000 people, that is a small municipality, that's a small neighborhood. We have neighborhoods that are certainly are not looking to have um, uh, cannabis stores in their, their locations. We, um, in this council, we approved a trial run uh, with uh, uh, having chickens in our backyards uh, was reminded by Councillor Thompson. So that there's a precedent that has been set on this. We even had a precedent that was set on this when we approved. We let uh, Councillor Fragadakis, when we were discussing the Airbnb, and we allowed um, uh, wards to go in or out. Every one of us that gets elected knows what is best for his ward. I realize that the mayor uh, probably wants to speak about the city, but we're not saying the city opts out. Uh, we're saying that we represent our wards. You, there's nobody else in this room that better knows his or her ward than the person that got them elected. So, Madam Speaker, I'm putting this motion forward. I encourage um, our colleagues to uh, think about this uh, clearly and uh, allow us to, to move in that fashion and ask the province for us to be able to opt in or opt out. This is not something new. It has been done in the, in the city before. So, uh, if we don't want something in our ward, we should be the one that has the, the final say along with our constituents. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay, thank you. So, Councillor Holliday, before you ask your question, I, I'm going to rule to uh, uh, the two way out of order. Okay. Yeah, legally you can't do word, but yeah, and that's why I said let me. So that's out of order. All right, thank you. Councillor Lai to speak. Uh, what about what about Councillor Cressy? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're right, because I skipped over Councillor Cressy, so we'll go to Councillor Cressy. Sorry, this is the second time you got up. That's, a, that's all right. Yeah. And, and let me begin by placing a motion. 
which is for as part of the follow-up on this for the city manager to report back on the potential for the city to own and operate our own stores. Um, I began my comments a few moments ago, and I'll come back to them, which was four years ago when we, I was first elected and had the privilege of succeeding Councillor Perks as chair of the Toronto Drug Strategy. At that time, it was still a federal conservative government, and it was a provincial liberal government, and we were having conversations about cannabis legalization. And it was still a very controversial subject. Well, here we are four years later talking about the model of regulation because it's finally here. Uh, and legalization is long overdue. I don't want to lose sight, as we have this debate, of the critical public health importance of the legalization of cannabis. That for a century, the war on drugs, the criminalization has had devastating consequences. A half a million Canadians, a half a million, have criminal records for simple possession of cannabis. And a disproportionate number of those are people of color. To go on to the fact that we spend $2 billion a year still to this day on the war on drugs, which is clearly not succeeding because it's not acting as a deterrence to anybody. And so when we talk about legalization, it is to both remove the harms associated with criminalization, which are significant and there are many, but it is to mitigate the harms of consumption. That's a public health approach to legalization. Cannabis is not benign. And so when you talk about removing the harms of criminalization but mitigating the harms of legalization, that is to ensure quality control, age appropriateness, advertising, but it's also to ensure that we don't encourage use. You don't legalize to encourage people to use, you legalize to mitigate the harms associated with use. And so getting the framework right, this is not insignificant. We are, in fact, the second country in the world to legalize cannabis. Only the second. Uruguay was the first. And we're the, second, we're the first country in the Western industrialized world. So how do you get the model right? This is a big thing. As the biggest city in our country, it's a big thing for us to get the model right. And so I think it's critical that you employ a public health approach, which means that if you over-regulate the system, you result in an increased illegal market. But if you under-regulate, if you under-regulate the legalization of cannabis, what you do is encourage consumption. And this provincial government has got the model wrong. They are under-regulating the legalization of cannabis. And we've heard throughout this discourse examples of that, that in this under-regulated free market approach, that there's no controls on the number, the distance from each other, the locations, the advertising, the public education component. This is significant. All of these are significant. So the province got it wrong. The previous government, I thought, got it right. They weren't perfect. Cannabis lounges and other things they had to work on, but they got it a lot better with the Ontario Cannabis Store. So the debate we're having now today, given the flawed model that we have, do we opt in or do we opt out? And I regret to say that I believe we should opt in to the imperfect model, and I'll tell you why. And I know many disagree here. There are some in this chamber who are making the case to opt out because they don't support legalization. They may not say it, but that's the truth of it. And so to them, I disagree. I support legalization. And then there are others, and I am very sympathetic to this argument. I've struggled with it, which believe that we should opt out in order to strengthen our leverage to negotiate a better deal. And I think that's a real argument, but I don't think with this government that we're going to get there in that model. But I also, but I also, from a public health approach, I heard the medical officer of health, and she has said very clearly that by opting out, we increase the harms associated with use. And so I think we make the best of an unfortunate situation here by opting in. We continue to push, we continue to push as a member of the FCM with our other Ontario municipalities. We continue to push all, as a government ourselves for a stronger regulatory framework. And because we're the second country in the world to do this, we're going to see as this unregulated free market approach rolls out, there's going to be a call to regulate further. And so there will be opportunities. But I think we have the, no other choice but to opt in now. But frankly, if I think again from the big picture, we are legalizing cannabis. This is a good thing. It is a hell of a lot better than criminalizing it any longer. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I'm going to have to ask members of council 
if, if I can have members of council attention, um, so what do you want to do? Uh, we're, we're supposed to, we're, we're supposed to break at six o'clock because those are the rules. I mean, it doesn't start until January that we, uh, we go to six. So it is six o'clock. So what's the, what's the wish of council? Finish? Okay, um, is, is the clerk staff okay with that? But we're okay with that if everyone takes their name off the list to speak. <laughs> I mean, let's speed it up. Right? Okay, so there's a motion, there's a motion to finish. Sean um, Faber? A recorded vote. The, the vote is to continue just to finish. It's it's actually there's only there's only three more items left. Yes, that's. But maybe if members of council, unless you have a motion, like may maybe we can try to speed it up a bit. I'm just trying to help. The motion to continue to work through the dinner break and finish the agenda this evening carries 21 to 2. Councillor Lai. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think I, I'm going to be very brief. I do have a motion, uh, if, please. Uh, this motion actually... Uh, was put on uh, before Mayor Tory put on his motion. I think this is more specific that the City Council request the province to consider restricting the location of cannabis store uh, at least 500 meters away from uh, education institutions, recreation and community and uh, religious centers. Um, my position here is to opt out because uh, I have no choice because as what, what 23 councillor I represent my constituents who have overwhelmingly told me that uh, they do not want to see cannabis dispensaries in our neighborhoods. And as their counselor, I think I intend to voice and support opting out. Uh, in fact, my personal position uh, is also uh, opting out because during my campaign trail, I mean, uh, they, I've knocked so many doors and I, I do believe that uh, have, uh, having these uh, stores in the, our neighborhood will threaten the community, and uh, especially community safety. So I would like to uh, continue to uh, in this way, vein and hope that we can work together around strengthening the law regarding the safety of this, uh, uh, the uh, cannabis stores. So I have made my pledge in my campaign that I will be a voice of my constituents at City Hall. So they have put their trust in me, in me and I intend to keep that promise. So I, I'm sorry I would have to uh, um, disagree and I know that we have so much discussion here for opting in and opting out and I, I will tend to uh, think that maybe if we do opt in now and then do an opt out, I mean, and then negotiate, we, we're not in a very good position but I think uh, I will be supporting and opting out of the, uh, uh, but just in case people are voting, if, if everybody's want to opt in, I think I, the motion that I'd I like to bring up to, the, uh, to, to pass the motion that uh, 500 meters away from, from the uh, 
schools, educational institutions, recreation, and community centers. Thank you. I think I'm quite brief. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I've got uh, two motions here. First one is uh, asking that the City Council uh, opt out of provincially licensed cannabis retail stores in Toronto until such time that uh, Toronto develops a regulatory framework for cannabis in consultation with the Medical Officer of Health, Executive Director, uh, Municipal Licensing and Standards, the Chief of Police and the City Council direct the City Manager report to City Council with a proposed regulatory framework by the next meeting of Council. Uh, I'm doing that because, uh, you know, I've talked to my local police officers in 13 Division. Uh, they said they already have incredible challenges. Now, Councillor Cole, you need to move all your motions. Okay, the second one. This is a copy, uh, really, of the motion that the City of Markham adopted. Uh, uh, Council requests the Executive Director of Municipal Licensing Standards in consultation with the Medical Officer of Health to report to the General Government Committee and Licensing Committee on uh, possible, uh, possible bylaw amendments, including penalties and fines, to prohibit the consumption of uh, recreational cannabis in, uh, uh, in uh, public places in the city of Toronto, such as city parks, trails, natural areas, sidewalks, and roads, and at least 150 meters from child care facilities, libraries, community centers, halfway houses, group homes, methadone clinics, harm reduction clinics, mental health facilities youth counseling services, and other at-risk community places. Uh, and an action is another, anyways, this is what uh, I'm proposing. Uh, I uh, believe uh, in uh, legalization. I, th I think it's, uh, you know, not uh, going to be the uh, perfect uh, nirvana for everything, but it's a reality we have to admit. And I think uh, the cannabis uh, retail stores, it's not the model I would have recommended, uh, but. I think in the long run, we're going to have to live with it. We don't have much choice. So I think that's the reality. So I'm not arguing about whether marijuana is uh, going to uh, destroy our youth, and uh, I'm not going to argue about all those, uh, you know, reefer madness issues we've had over the years. Uh, I, I just think it's, it's coming, and we've got to just do it as city councillors, first of all, in consultation with our voters. Uh, I don't think any of us have had fulsome public meetings or consultation with the voters on this because this has been discussed, debated, but there have been no real opportunities to get the viewpoints of all the stakeholders, all the resident groups in our community. So I don't know how we could rush to do this without at least engaging our communities in what they think, uh, like our BIAs. Do, do, what do they think about retail marijuana uh, on their main streets? Uh, and uh, talk about people whether they think uh, marijuana should be consumed in our public parks, uh, in our trails, uh, next to uh, libraries. We should, because right now, the only prohibition is that uh, 150 meters from school. That's all. And, and it's sort of surprising to me that we would be willing to give up more local control. We're saying that our licensing controls will basically not have any powers over this huge new multi-billion dollar business. Multi-billion dollar enterprise. Our licensing has basically said we have no say. Our medical officer of health is saying, well, it's not perfect, but it's the best we can do. I think we can do much better by having at least some local say and hearing from our constituents about the future of this mega business. And you know, we're not just dealing with a mom and pop shop. I know Councillor Holliday asked about this. I know Marlboro Cigarettes, their new name, has bought into 50% of the largest cannabis producer or distributor here in Ontario. Marlboro, you know, they're not bad at marketing, advertising, deep pockets. Uh, also, uh, you know, the, the thing is, uh, I just do not trust the Alcohol and Gaming Commission. If you've had experience with these people, they're a disaster. They're understaffed. They disregard the city councillors, MPPs, MPs. They're, they're understaffed, as I said. They will not do anything you ask them. I remember one time on Oakwood Avenue, Madam Speaker, we found a sawed-off shotgun in the back of the bar in the restaurant, the police officer, 13th Division, found a shot, 
So we asked for a hearing at the AGCO, and we said, why don't we suspend the license of that uh, uh, restaurant, which was a known hangout, as you know. Uh, uh, not that you went there, but you knew by reputation. Uh, anyways, we said, suspend the license for one month. Well, you know what the AGCO said? No. Uh, hey, thank, you. Owner, thank you, Councillor. The owner didn't even have an idea that the rifle was in the back, so you can't punish the owner. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Holliday. Thank you. Um, through you to the councillor. I just there's the motion about 150 meters. Um, if I could see that, please. Yes. Okay. So this is about smoking. I think it said lit, lit. Con consumption of lit recreational cannabis. I guess my question is, is, is there any difference between this and just banning smoking altogether within 150 meters of all these uses? And why not just go to that extent? Well, what it does, it just offers another layer of protection in that in some places our uh, Smoke Free Ontario Act or our local city bylaws restricting do not uh, protect uh, people, let's say they're having a picnic in the park, walking in the trail, uh, th that's why I'm saying that perhaps they don't want to be exposed to secondhand smoke, whether it be marijuana or others. We're just trying to ensure the public places that people have some rights uh, to their own privacy and enjoyment. What about <laughs> non-lit methods of consuming cannabis? I think you can vape it according to the website. I can't hear you. I, I, what about non-lit methods? <laughs> I think that's a, that's a typo, I think. No, I don't know, I, I, because it's important, because I think there's different ways of taking I'm just trying to understand if this is about the drug or if this is about smoking. No, it's about cannabis. Okay. So it has nothing to do with this, the smoke effect. It has to do with people consuming the drug essentially in public. Yes, because as you know, there can be a, a side effect. If you inhale the secondhand smoke from cannabis, you might have the same reaction as if you had the uh, whatever it is yourself. Well, it's about it's about smoking then. No, uh, but yeah, uh, smoking the cannabis. Okay, Th I, I think. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. Like so many things, uh, the Premier of Ontario has put the City of Toronto between a rock and a hard place. His uh, judgment on policy matters continues to give us impossible dilemmas, and, and this is one of those for me. Uh, by the way, that judgment has been so successful that just today, while we were debating the transit item, uh, the provincial bond rating was downgraded again. But anyway, I believe the province has got this one terribly wrong, and they've got it terribly wrong in two important dimensions. One, as you heard clearly from the Medical Officer of Health, the best way to proceed would be if there had been uh, a publicly owned and operated marijuana store of some kind. Um, I actually had the experience of uh, the Ontario Cannabis Store staff coming in and talking to me, I think it was June, uh, because they were looking at a location in my ward and they showed me what the store would be like and how they would operate it. There would be public health information, uh, there would be real control on not aggressively advertising the products out into the street or having products that are labeled with all kinds of uh, claims that have nothing to do with the health benefits or, or anything like that on the packaging. All of that would have been managed and controlled so that we would have got the kind of outcomes that the medical officer of health was talking about. And it's worth remembering that, you know, I people just don't know what these psychoactive products do uh, relative to a, something you buy in a box with a fancy claim on it. There's, if you read carefully the public health information, a lot of the claims that people selling this stuff make have no grounding in any science at all. And the Ontario Cannabis Store uh, was going to make sure that the, the materials attached to the products that they were selling gave you good information on what the effects would be and what the health impacts would be. And as we enter into legalizing uh, you know, a new intoxicant in, in the city of Toronto in the province of Ontario, I thought that was valuable. I thought that was important. The second thing has to do with our control over zoning and regulation and so on. Now, I want to be very clear. 
I believe in eliminating the stigma and uh, eliminating uh, all of the stereotyping uh, and moral panic, frankly, that happens around the use of marijuana. And I think it's important that we legalize it. But I also think that we are here as stewards of the public interest. Let me remind you, last term, we passed a bylaw that limited where places of worship can go. Four term, three terms ago, I was here in this councillor, and Councillor Saundercook brought in an income interim control bylaw that set rules on where daycares could go in his ward. I brought in something when Parkdale was uh, getting a new liquor license application every week and turning into Partydale and driving out all the other retail uses that the neighborhood needed, the hardware store, the, the barber shop, all those were being driven out and we brought in a cap on the concentration of bars. It worked, the retail balance was re-established and we've since lifted it. So the, pro the Premier has told us that we as a government have less control over the public interest in terms of the sale of marijuana in our community than we do with bars, than we do with daycares, and we do with places of worship. And those are just a few examples. I could go on all day. So the fundamental question becomes for us, do we negotiate with a premier who has proven to you know, break things first and ask permission second over and over and over again, who's been found by the American court system, bond rating agencies, uh, and regulatory agencies in the United States to be reckless in the way that he manages public assets? All this in like the short period he's been premier. Are we going to trust him to manage this one? No. You don't bargain with a guy like that by saying you win the pot and then asking if you can have a little, oh sorry I made a pun, and then asking if you can have a little bit of it back. You bargain with that guy by holding your cards and saying no, we're actually going to continue this conversation. We're not folding our hand. We're going to, as the largest market in the country, we're going to say we have a little bit of power here the, the, the industry that manufactures marijuana, the industry that sells marijuana, they're not going to be happy if we say no and many other municipalities say no. And the Premier's going to find himself in the position we're currently in between a rock and a hard place and he's going to come back to the table. So as much as it's, it's been, you know, I've worked for a decade to remove the stigma of drug use. Thank and you, Councillor. I think that we can't say yes today. Councillor Fillion. Thank you. Uh, this is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, if ever there was one. Um, of those two bad choices, I prefer the damned if you don't. Um, if we were looking at a publicly operated system or even a privately operated system, much less preferable, but if we were looking at that with sufficient safeguards that it was being done properly with sufficient controls, it would be a no-brainer for us. That is not what we're looking at. I think we have virtual unanimity in the room that this is not being done properly the way it is being proposed. And uh, it has all kinds of um, implications, negative implications for the communities that we are here to uh, protect and respect. So I don't think we have any choice but to opt out at this time. And yes, pass the mayor's motion and other motions um, asking the province to change their regulations and hopefully have a set of regulations that will then allow us to opt back in or opt in uh, by next month. I don't think we should be distracted by dollar signs anymore then we should make bad decisions on other issues that involve dollar signs. We don't improve, approve bad development because it brings in Section 37 money, or I hope we don't. We don't, uh, you know, we don't approve billboards on the Don Valley Parkway because we could make a fortune doing it, and we should not be adopting a bad system here. Um, we should be fighting for a good system.
Count Councillor Wong Tan. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I will be supporting uh, at least one of Councillor Cole's motion, and that is to opt out. Um, and I think it's important for, for council members to note that uh, his opt out is only for a limited time. He's asking that, uh, that, the, that the city staff, including the medical officer of health, the executive director of MLS, the chief of police, and city council to, to, to ensure that the city manager can try to uh, create more of a framework, a regulatory framework, so that we can get in front of the situation. And to have this item brought back at, at our January meeting. So I actually think it's probably the most balanced out of the, uh, the motions that are before us. And I think it's important for us to also recognize that there are cities uh, that have opt out, not necessarily because I'm, they're NIMBYs, I don't think, because I know the um, uh, Mayor, Mayor Crombie very well. And, uh, and I believe that they're opting out because they don't feel like they have absolute control over the situation. They're stuck in the same boat that we're in. This bad, th these choices between um, uh, opting out and, and opting in is just simply too black and white. Uh, the, the framework that's been put down uh, before us by the province is far too restrictive. And, and for that reason, uh, those cities have said no. And I think that, uh, that the Premier is now, um, I think, a little bit on, on, his, on his heels because there are so many c cities now saying no to him, uh, bar, you know, with the exception of Ottawa, which, which just said yes. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons why um, I believe that we'll be in a stronger position uh, because we are a big city that is also saying, if we, we, if we are, uh, we say no now and then push them back to the table to negotiate so we can actually have some of the powers that we, that we need in order for us to roll this out properly. Uh, I am supportive of legalization, not just of marijuana, but you know, uh, drugs, to be quite honest, because the war on drugs has not been successful. Uh, this is far too much criminalization, especially for, for certain populations that are, that are over-policed and targeted, um, and it has not necessarily worked. Um, what I actually don't like about this entire rollout, uh, to be quite honest, Madam Speaker, is, the, is, is something that I've said uh, even before the Ford government was elected is that I believe that this is going to go into the hands of, of big companies uh, that will make big profits. And, and a lot of people that have been, been involved with the, the illegal drug trade around cannabis, who are, who are marginalized, uh, who sometimes are people of color, uh, they have been most harmed. And their records are not being expunged. Uh, they are still being criminalized, while those who are now probably wearing suits, who have lighter skin color, they'll be richly rewarded with these licenses. And that, to me, is an issue around equity and, and, and justice uh, I don't think has been ever addressed, not by the province and certainly not by the federal government. And, and to me, that's one of the fundamental, fundamental flaws about this entire rollout across the country. Um, and, uh, and hopefully, uh, by way of we, us pushing back right now, uh, it will put at least a little bit of control back into the hands of the, of the city, so therefore we can get in front of it and do it right. Because there are things that we have to consider, and that includes community health. And that includes making sure that uh, we're able to um, protect uh, our main streets, uh, not necessarily from, from drug use and drug consumption, because that's not where we need to protect it from. Uh, but I also want to make sure that our main streets have a healthy balance and mix of retailers. I've received phone calls and emails uh, from landlords asking um, me whether or not they should be renting out their businesses uh, to cannabis uh, uh, stores. And they've, th they've done so because they've actually discounted their rents to restaurants and mom and pop shops uh, to, the, to the quantum of 30 or 40 percent discount, and they still couldn't make it. And now there is these new operators, well-financed operators, that are going to make a lot of money. They're going to pay more than the average shop owner, and that's going to drive another economic ripple through our main streets that we haven't even considered as of yet. Um, so, Madam Speaker, I, I think I've taken enough time, but thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Matlow. Um, I have a motion. I, I'll, I'll just read it out because I don't know if it's ready to go on the screen. Uh, uh, similar to Councillor Cressy's, but, but differing. The City Council direct the City Manager to report to City Council on the feasibility of requesting the province of Ontario to grant the City of Toronto exclusive rights to operate cannabis retail stores in the City of Toronto. First of all, I, uh, I agree with Councillor Cole, um, and um, I, I, uh, I absolutely, uh, you know, 
the province has said to us, we have this one-time opportunity to opt out. If we believe that we are comfortable with the tools that we have to protect the residents uh, of our communities as we move forward and make sure that we don't have an overclustering of a business district, if they're not too close to schools, or if, you know, if we believe that we like where we're going, then we can opt in at any day, uh, any week, we can choose to do that. But we only have one opportunity, as Councillor Cole uh, rightly uh, said, uh, to opt out and then, and then really focus on Rather than just jump into what they want us to do, we can say, well, this is where we want to go, and we walk in a straight line and see if they uh, budge us off. So I think that we need to do that. The reason that I move this, and I'm hearing that Councillor Cressy is liking the, kind of the, where I went with this too, is that um, uh, whether we opt in today, and I hope we don't, I think we should opt out now and then reconsider later if there's a, more tools in our toolbox for zoning, or if we opt in sometime in the future. What is clear is we can't impose uh, a sales tax on any, any specific thing like, like cannabis, uh, uh, nor is the province uh, looking at sharing it with us. But a revenue stream, if it's a reality, even if we don't like it, I mean, some, you know, some people uh, you know, feel, uh, well, actually know, to be correct, that uh, smoking pot is, I mean, any smoking is, is bad for your lungs. And there are a lot of people who just say, well, we don't want that at all. But the reality is, it is a reality, it's legal, um, and if it's going to be a reality, then why don't we not only uh, uh, seek revenue uh, from it, but also ensure that we can enforce and regulate and monitor and actually put our set of rules that we believe are appropriate for our city and our community planning in a way that uh, you know, uh, various people who want to open these shops up wherever they want to go uh, wouldn't do. In other words, uh, the, the, the former provincial government set up a framework to do it responsibly. What I'm suggesting is why don't we look at essentially borrowing from that framework that Doug Ford dismissed, which is a, a more a regulatory framework, and then bring it to the city of Toronto to replace uh, what now Doug Ford has said he wants to do for municipalities across Ontario. So again, opt out now and let's see if we can do a regulatory regime where we have a monopoly, we can regulate, we can enforce, and ultimately get revenue to support the city services that we, that we want to uh, provide to the residents of Toronto. We do have a question for you, Councillor Kerjianis. Clarification of the motion? Speaker, I, um, I heard my colleagues say that we opt out now and then um, come back in later on. Um, would he be supportive that uh, we ask the province uh, to um, go word by word? I have a concern about ward by ward uh, because, um, uh, and uh, this is not, I, I do not believe for a moment this is your motivation. I, 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 I think we're on the same page on, on this issue in general. But I'm concerned about if you empower a local ward councillor with, with that kind of yes or no say that the brown paper envelopes full of cash might follow. And I don't want I, I, I to set up a scenario uh, where, where that is even a possibility. That wasn't your intention, but I'm concerned that that might Councilor, be an uh, unintentional uh, consequence. Councillor, I, 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 I thank you for that. However, I, uh, I, take, um, uh, I take exception to the brown, uh, brown envelopes. Um, I don't think we can do that. Uh, it's certainly not something that's allowed by a code of conduct. So I don't think anybody in our midst would certainly be uh, doing this. So I think you might want to reconsider your, your words. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. You can apologize if you want. It's not your intention, but I'm just concerned that it could happen because things do happen like that. Your mic's All right, Mike's. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Erjanis, for those questions. And I think then we will go next to Councillor Nunziata to speak. We still have our mics on. Yep, we're just about to turn it off. There we go. Thank you. You know. Making a decision on, on this today is very difficult, and, I, I, and I'm sure it's difficult for a number of members of council. I, I, I wish we, didn't, we weren't here today to debate this. I wish that the Premier had just continued on what the previous government had um, uh, consulted with the municipalities on where it could be sold. I think that that, was, that, that, was, that would have been an easier sell than, than what we have now. And, th and that's the problem that we have. Um, 
and it was very clear by asking questions to the city manager and to staff that if we opt out and reconsider at a later date, it was very clear that we do not, as made very clear by the Premier, is that we do not get that revenue, we do not get that funding. And so if we don't get the funding, what's the point of us opting in, opting in at a later date when, we, when we're going to not even be able to get any of the, um, the funding, the resources that we need? The problem I have with this issue is that if I have a problem now in closing down the, the ones I have in my ward now, and, and I was told that if we get the resources that we need from the province and the funding from the province before the marijuana was legal is that we would have and we would have the tools that we need to close these establishments down if we don't then what's concerning me is i'm going to have not only do i well i have all the ones i have now i'll have double the amount they'll be everywhere and we won't have the resources or the funding to close these uh, uh, close them down that's the concern i have i i wish we could just say no to this but if we say no we're going to end up with all on every corner there won't be any regulations they open up everywhere they want and we can't close them down and i'm telling you from someone that's been experiencing uh, this closing down in my ward for the longest time and i've been unsuccessful in doing it so we have to think of that we have to think of what what we would be creating and I'm sure that your community would not want one open, 10 or 15 of them, just like we have the cash, back, cash money places. We have them everywhere. We can't close them. We've tried to close them, uh, Council Wong Tam. We can't. And that's what's going to happen with, uh, with these establishments. So I, I, it's very difficult. I wish we didn't have to vote on this, but I think we have to make the right decision. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nunziata. Uh, next, we have uh, Deputy Mayor Holliday to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to offer comment that I will be uh, supporting the staff recommendations in the report and just talk a little bit about uh, what we heard today in my own life's experiences in trying to reach this decision. There's no doubt many of us would have heard on the campaign trail um, that cannabis in Canada, even in the municipal campaign trail that cannabis in Canada is a divisive issue among people and people have different ideas and thoughts on what it is but unfortunately uh, in December 2018 we are in a state where it is a legal product in Canada and that decision is being made by the federal government so what do we do in Ontario and what do we do in the city of Toronto and what we're talking about today is allowing the existence of retail outlets in the city and we're not talking about places to go and consume this. We're not talking about bars. We're not talking about anything else other than retail outlets. And from the best thing I could gather from talking to staff, these are synonymous with an LCBO. The funny thing is, is we never had this level of debate that I've ever seen about a liquor store in the city, but we're having it now in terms of these outlets. So then I think about, you know, my, not my role as a counselor, but even a role as, as, as a dad, as a, as a parent of three kids. You know, the world's full of temptations, and cannabis is going to be one of those. Um, but on balance, we have to make a decision about either setting the conditions to have an underground economy and a supply of this stuff, because it would be naive to think if we didn't accept these retail stores in Toronto that, well, suddenly Torontonians would just say, well, you know, I'm not going to use the product anymore. I just give up on it. I can't buy it. No, they'll find other ways. It'll come through the mail. It'll come just across the border for whatever neighboring municipality allows it. And most concerning, it will come from the underground trade. And the problem with the underground trade, and again, I'm going to talk as a parent, that if this got in the hands of my own children, I'd rather them, being, I'd rather them use a product that came from a supply chain that we know is reliable and has not been tainted with something else or the dose hasn't been altered. And so as difficult as a decision of this, and as difficult and divisive it is for the people of my ward, on balance, I think the safer bet is the advice that's been provided by our staff. And it was cemented in concrete evidence. We know that a number of these, can these illegal distributors have shut down on the eve of perhaps 
a legal regime coming forward, and that's a positive sign. That's a positive sign that the action, this policy initiative, has somewhat suppressed the underground trade. And I think the most important balance point in my decision to support um, not choosing to opt out is the fact that the supply that does get in our youth's hands, and it will, is something that is more likely to be from a safe source. And at the end of the day, it is the safer thing, it is the more prudent thing, and it's the realistic thing to do. Um, I hope councillors will give some careful thought to this and very careful thought to the idea that we would have a patchwork regime in Toronto because I'm not sure that that would work and achieve any policy outcomes that are helpful for the citizens of this city. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Uh, thanks, Speaker. And I've got a motion there. And that City Council requests the province to provide the revenues to each municipality from the legal sale of cannabis. The revenues be allotted to municipalities by number of retail outlets in each municipality rather than population. So the way it's set up right now, and I have the chart that was provided by, the, by our CFO, is that we would get 15% of the revenue from the Ontario excise tax after they took off their $100 million. And we were no doubt have more than 15% of the stores that will be opening in this city or in this province. And we already have so many stores that are illegally opening in, the, in our city. So I think I'd like to make sure that it's based on how much revenue we're producing, which is the number of stores, not just how many people we have living in our wards. I just want to review what kind of a mess that we are currently in with this. You'll recall that the pronouncement that marijuana would become legal was made in October 2015. That's over three years ago and immediately what happened was there were stores that opened overnight throughout the city of Toronto and I happen to know that because perhaps some of you don't have a lot but I've had clusters of stores on the Danforth and different zones and on East Chinatown and on Broadview and by clusters I mean three and four stores all in the same place and I think you have that as well speaker and they're very hard to deal with that clustering and waiting for the province the previous government to first of all for this feds to say well here we're going to let you regulate it and then for the province to say here's how we're going to regulate it we've had these conversations previously, um, has just been a long, excruciating time. And they finally got around to figuring out how they were going to regulate that and sell it. And I happen to agree that the Ontario Cannabis Store would have been, instead of going to the bootlegger, instead of going to whatever, you'd be going to the AG, the, the Liquor Control Board to buy your booze, you'd be going to the Cannabis Store to buy your weed, and that would be the way to do things. However, this all got turned around and shifted around, and now we're being forced into this particular position to make a decision today without the restrictions that we would like to have. And the restrictions I know we need to have have to do with proximity of one store to the next store. Proximity of each store to the school proximity of the store to Jimmy Simpson Recreation Center or Antibes Recreation Center, all the recreation centers that we have. Next door would be great to open up, wouldn't it? If you were an operator, but not so great for us. And so I know that there is the motion from the mayor and I will support that, that we opt in and ask for the ability to regulate where, how these stores will be operated in the city because there will be a lot of stores. And the amount of pressure that comes from the businesses in having a cluster of stores that are open late, where people are hanging around, where they're smoking marijuana in the street when people are trying to go into a restaurant, it's just pretty unfair to small businesses that are trying to make a go of it on the main street. And I do think we have to look at, economic development has to look at what Councillor Wong Tam told us is that retail outlets 
are now chomping to get into locations and will affect the viability of all of the small businesses because these might look like small businesses, but they are large money businesses. Every single chain, every single operator, every single one of these uh, franchises that will be set up. So uh, that is what I would request that we actually aren't at the bottom end of the stick with all of the shops and dribbly little bit of money from the taxes. Thank you. Okay, so if we can vote. <coughs> I'd be on the top. Our first motion is by B, by Councillor Cole. Recorded vote. The motion does not carry. The vote is 10 to 14. voting on 5b and uh, so I just voted incorrectly so I would ask indulgence of someone to uh... okay so motion to reopen on favor carried okay let's do it again 5b recorded vote Councillor Layton, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 9 to 15. Okay. Our next motion is um, motion one by Mayor Tory. Recorded vote. Councillor Peritza, please. <coughs> the motion carries unanimously 24 in favor. Motion to be. Recorded vote. The other one I ruled out of order. I know. The motion does not carry. The vote is 5 to 19. Motion three by Councillor Cressy. Recorded vote.
The motion does not carry. The vote is 10 to 14. Motion four. By Councillor Life. Um, recorded vote. Yeah. The motion does not carry. The vote is 12 for each side. Therefore, the motion does not carry. Motion by Bay by Councillor Cole. Courted vote. Councillor Ainsley, please. Councillor Lai. Councillor Karagiannis, please. The motion carries 22 to 2. Motion 6. Huh? Yeah, I recorded them. Councillor Grimes, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 11 to 13. Motion number seven by Councillor Fletcher, recorded vote. The motion carries 23 to 1. Item is amended. All in favor? Recorded vote. Councillor Lai, please. Councillor Matlow, Councillor Bradford, please. Councillor Pruitza, please. <laughs> the item is amended, carries 20 to 4. 
Okay. <laughs> Councillor Perks. Yes. CC 1.7 Operating Variance Report. Yes, I have some questions of staff, please. Okay, questions of staff. Uh, first, uh, I'm not sure who's going to be taking it. I have some questions about the land transfer revenue. Um, so in the variance report, it's projected, I believe, will be down $100 million or something like that. Mr. Farag, I guess, is going to... Yeah? Operating. Through the speaker, <clears throat> yes, we are forecasting that by year end, MLTT revenue will be uh, underperforming budget by roughly $100 million. By $100 million. And that's not a matter of, of $25 million per quarter. It's actually the, the curve is descending. Well, in fact, we have updated information with respect to the November year end. Or, or sorry, the month end. And uh, that's underperforming at about $78 million. So um, we're projecting that uh, roughly another $20 million uh, will, will be short in December. So the, the end of the year is much worse than the beginning of the year? It has been, yes. I mean, we reported out uh, the first quarter uh, variance report. You may recall we reported out in May. And at that time, we were actually tracking a, at a positive variance. Right. And uh, in July, August, and September, uh, the market softened considerably, and we're facing, uh, we think, up to a $100 million shortfall. So, so I would be right then in assuming that even if the, the slide stops and we just stay at steady state where we are November, December, we're going to be out by more than $100 million next year. That's really incredibly difficult to forecast what will happen next year. Uh, I'm, I'm saying, let's pretend that the kind of performance we've seen in the last two or three months and what you're projecting in December, if that became the new normal for all of 2019, the hole we would have to fill would be worse than $100 million. On the basis of the performance in the last three months, that may in fact be the case, yes. May. Oh, I can never get you, Joe. Um, okay, uh, I don't know who the next questions are. They're about, uh, in the report, there are three or four areas and I had a note ready. PFR, court services, facilities, um, where uh, we're get, we have a positive variance, but the positive variance is attributed in part to uh, the difficulty of finding staff to fill out the complement. Is that, am I reading that right? Well, there's PFNR. <gasps> Speaker, if I, I'm losing time here as well. Staff arrive. Okay, okay, just one sec. Just one sec. Through you, Madam Speaker. That's correct. The third quarter variance for PFNR has a positive variance, but we are projecting to year end a uh, negative variance of 1.6 million. Uh, the positive variance in Q3 is some of it is uh, related to staff, but it's a, a moment in time uh, around the staff vacancies. We are projecting to year end around uh, 130 staff vacancies to about 3% of our salaries, which is our gapping target as well. So okay. year-end, we will be where we should be. But you were, you were behind on hiring them earlier in the year, and you hired them towards the end. Uh, is it a similar story in court services? Yes, it's a similar story in court services. So again, we didn't hire as fast as we had hoped. I think we had quite a few promotions out of court services this year, and that that Okay. staff took a while to be placed. Uh, facilities? Yes, through the speaker, it's the same uh, for <coughs> facilities as well. So, okay. So there's a, a consistent pattern here of we allocate a budget uh, and then uh, we're unable to hire fast enough to get the full strength to achieve that, that complement that we're after. I guess to the CFO or city manager so, uh, Pete, if you could move out of the way, Don, Don, Pete, Don, Pete. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, through the speaker, um, yes to your to your question or your comment that uh, we do, as you know, uh, budget for gapping. But the the issue here is whether or not that gapping figure is accurate. That's one point. There's another point here I'd like to make, though, uh, Councillor, and that is. 
Um, there was a motion put forward and passed earlier this year which requires me to report semi-annually to the executive about this very matter. So I'll be coming next year uh, with answers to the question why can't we hire at the rate in which we're supposed to be and I understand that this has been an ongoing problem. Okay, well, because you're the new guy, I'll give you one more shot at it. Just Council when you're looking at it, please be Council aware this Perks, is the sixth year Council in a Perks, row. Councillor your time is up. Oh, and I had one other one. Okay, we, we want to try to get this agenda complete. Councillor uh, Pasternak. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a continuation of uh, Councillor Perks' question, some of the uh, vacancies in key departments. I see... City planning, where our office gets uh, a vast number of calls, a backlog of application uh, review. Uh, there's 43 positions uh, currently uh, vacant, if I read this report correctly. What moves are underway now to fill those vacancies and get up, caught up on some of the planning applications? So, we're, so through the speaker, we're projecting a year end around 34, which is uh, actually slightly down from what the operating variance report suggests. Uh, the, uh, the churn in the division is quite high with retirements, turnovers. We've got uh, an attractive skill set in our staff, and they, they move around a bit or on to other jobs. Uh, but that is well within our range. In fact, it's on the lower end of our historic range, and we're doing, uh, we, have active, uh, we have active recruitment underway and uh, competitions underway. We do our level best to fill those positions. Are the, are the universities not graduating as many uh, planners as in the past? Is there, is there uh, a containment? I think through the speaker, you, you may have noticed the, uh, the real estate and development industry in the GTA is quite robust. Uh, these uh, graduates are coming out of universities and they're getting jobs. Uh, and we're in that competition. And we have uh, to deal with our own housing affordability issues in the city. And uh, there are a lot of complications in... Uh, making sure that we're able to attract and retain uh, the employees that we have at the City of Toronto. Okay, thank you. The only other division I would, that sort of caught my eye is, is IT, with 124 uh, vacancies um, critical to the operation of the city. Uh, we can feel it certainly on floor number two. Um, I'm just wondering whether there's, there's a robust initiative to start filling those so we can make sure that our systems are secure and, and there's good response time to our needs. Yeah, through the chair. So within IT, we are actively uh, in recruitment for positions. Um, we've recruited over 100 positions so far this year and uh, remain active in recruiting for key roles. Okay, thank you. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, question to staff with regard to the MLTT. Um, can you talk a bit about, you now there's three components to the MLTT, commercial, residential, and condo. So can you talk about those three components on how they have been performing or underperforming uh, as part of this overall uh, loss of MLTT that works? Certainly. Um, so typically the resale market comprises about 50% of our MLTT revenues. And the volume uh, over the course of the first um, nine months has been uh, probably about 12% less than a typical year. And we've also seen uh, modest appreciation in prices. So uh, the explanation that I could give you as to the, the poor performance of MLTT revenues relates to the resale market. The other components, uh, as you very well know, uh, relate to new housing that comes on stream. That comprises roughly 25 to 30 percent. And uh, that is somewhat predictable. It's been relatively robust in the city of Toronto. And the third component is related to commercial industrial transactions. Uh, again, that comprises about 25 to 30 percent. And highly variable, um, cannot be predicted with any degree of certainty. So with regard to the commercial then, because I know in years past, um, you can have one, two, or three uh, commercial sales that really bring in a very a big bulk of, of some of our, our surpluses. Would, on the commercial side, I would assume then, again, it's not a lot of transactions, but it probably, we haven't seen the kind of transactions that we may have been expecting. Would that be 
fair to say? I think it's probably a, a fair assessment to make. Um, again, uh, the transactions happen without any degree of certainty or predictability, so it may very well be that uh, towards the year end, we may see some commercial transactions that are done for um, tax reasons. Okay. Um, and I recall in last year's budget, um, this was, a, again, it has been a topic of discussion pretty much every budget for the last number of years. Uh, but didn't we build in a, a bit of a buffer understanding that this may actually happen? So we, not that we're anticipating the size of the loss, but we're anticipating that MLTT may not perform where we had thought. So didn't we build a bit of a buffer into the bu last year's budget, as I recall? Yes. In fact, we, uh, we allowed, I think it was either 40 or $50 million uh, of land transfer tax revenue to go to the capital uh, budget, um, and that was intended to provide uh, a safety mechanism in the event that there was some underperformance so that we could delay our capital program by a commensurate amount. Uh, and this message, I guess, will go to the uh, city manager. Um, as, as you're beginning to build the 2019 budget, um, are you looking at any opportunities uh, to, to protect against this volatility in the MLTT? Um, you know, and, and our reliance really on that MLTT performance as part of the operating budget. So you're looking at that as we go into the 2019 process? Through the speaker, yes. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Pertz. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'll just make a couple of quick comments. Um, I want to, I, I, I appreciate that the city manager says that he is going to uh, address the issue of uh, our complement being short by even more than our gapping numbers. I do want to express some frustration. In some of the departments, PF&R planning, uh, this has been something we have uh, for six consecutive years, six consecutive years, been told by staff leadership that they will address it. And uh, the result is that this council approves service levels that we don't deliver. And uh, we need to have the right answers on the table. If we're not paying people enough, tell us that. If uh, we're not doing enough training so that people can move into new roles, tell us that. But, but don't tell us, oh, we've got it under control, and then have me have to stand up and hold another variance report, as I do every year, it seems, because the same problems keep re recurring. The comment I want to make on the land transfer tax is different. Sure. Uh, we put some 40 or 50 million dollars of it aside for capital projects. That's not a buffer. That's capital work that we should have done this year that we will not be able to do this year. And while we're talking about having ambitious programs for building transit, buying more rolling stock, doing Vision Zero, fixing our community centers, all of those projects that everybody keeps piling into the capital budget because people need that work done, uh, saying that, you know, well, we can, you know, suck up any loss in the, in the land transfer tax by having a smaller capital project, that means we will not be delivering the level of service that this council has approved for a growing city. I agree. The problem with the land transfer tax reliance that we have had hasn't been that every year it's flat and reliable and it comes in. No, we've been relying on every year being a record year, every year being better than any previous year. That's actually how we've been budgeting. It's as if we go to the casino and say, oh, I'm going to put all my money on red. You get red. You put all my money on red and assuming you're going to win every time. Because we've been lucky with a hot real estate market, some members of this council have been telling Torontonians we can eat our cake and have it too. We can improve services without increasing property taxes. Well, the time has come where we're actually going to have to choose. And I look forward to that discussion because you won't be able to tell people that they can eat their cake and have it too. You're actually going to have to make up your mind what kind of city you want to be the governor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, this is a long report. It is a report, uh, third quarter variance, that looks at uh, we're really a snapshot across the city of how we, our financial viability is doing. Um, we see these reports coming to budget uh, you know, quite frequently. Of course, it had to come here directly instead of going to budget. 
Um, we look at every division, every agency all across the city. And when you look at the report, it's a long report, over 100 pages long. Uh, by and large, most of the, uh, the divisions and agencies are doing quite well. Um, they are meeting their targets uh, a little bit over, a little bit under. Um, but they're performing well. There are some concerns uh, that need to be addressed, but that's the opportunity in the variance reports is to look at the performance as we move forward through the year. But when you're looking at the variance report, um, we are in surplus uh, for the end of the year. Uh, staff have predicted that we're going to be in a surplus, uh, which is positive. Um, and I do recognize with the MLTT, uh, it has softened, uh, and it is not delivering uh, where we were expecting when we uh, built the budget last year. And there are a number of changes why. A lot of it has to do with changes with the provincial government and the federal government. Now, this isn't a surprise. This has been a discussion. It's been a debate. It's been part of the debate uh, over a number of years, and I understand that. Uh, but it was not a surprise that this had happened. It may have been a surprise the, the extent or the size of the, uh, where it was at, but this has not been a surprise. Um, and we had built uh, a buffer into this. We, we are looking at, number one, when I say buffer, it is looking at the reliance on the MLTT. And that's where I agree with Councillor Perks, is that we should not be relying on this MLTT the way we have in the past. I understand that. Uh, and we look, we're seeing now with the volatility of that. But we are looking at trying to address that with regard to last year. And as we get into this uh, budget season, uh, you will be seeing, as a city manager, we'll be looking at options to look at removing ourselves away from the reliance of the MLTT. Listen, when the money comes in, it's great, we can use it, but when it's not there, we cannot rely on it to balance the budget. So we're going to be looking at a number of things to do that. But understanding that this year's budget will be tight. Uh, we say it every year, we, we have challenges that we have to face, but I think this uh, year's budget, which will be primarily uh, in an election year, a staff-driven uh, budget, uh, and it'll be a shorter process, a shorter time, um, but it'll be a tight budget, no doubt. And as we have done in years past, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. But in years past, when we make the tough decisions, we have never, in the last four years, uh, cut or reduced services. If, in fact, we have increased services. We have increased and en enhanced the services that we wanted to do. Uh, but we will continue uh, to, you know, to, to, to invest in the kind of key services that we want, but at the same time keeping taxes low and keeping life affordable in our city. We have been doing that over the last four years, and the commitment over the next four years was, is to continue that. Okay. On the item, on favour? Carried. Count Councillor Layton, yes, we're at your item now. We did. I have just a couple quick questions of staff. There's no recorded vote. To, to the chief planner. This is uh, rezoning it. I can't remember the number. Five, seven, and nine Dale Avenue. There you go. Um, why are staff recommending approval of, of the application? Uh, through, the, through the speaker, uh, staff are recommending support of the revised proposal for uh, four principal reasons. We've uh, previously reported on this in July, and the principal reasons include uh, the conservation of the streetscape heritage character of the site. The, the revised proposal achieves that goal in its immediate context. Uh, the, in, the revisions to the applications contribute to the park-like setting that is a principle from the South Rosedale Heritage uh, Conservation District, an important principle to uh, respond to and the changes to the proposal deal with front yard land improvements to the front yard uh, landscaping and the west side yard setbacks. Uh, thirdly, the, the building uh, has been broken up into two um, main parts uh, and the gap between the two main parts of the building has, has been widened such that you can see through the building into the ravine and that builds upon uh, and, and reinforces the goal of the HCD. And finally, uh, there are individual attributes of the property, namely uh, uh, a tea house that exists in, uh, partially in the ravine area, uh, planting beds and other attributes of the uh, property that are uh, representative of the work of a prominent firm at the time, and those, uh, and those attributes will be conserved in the proposal. So taken together, uh, we feel that it conserves appropriately and responds uh, to the uh, to the growth plan, the provincial policy statement, and the city's official plan. So I, I'm going to ask it specifically, but you may have just answered it there. What, what staff response uh, to to the request for Part Four designation for Seven Dale specifically? Okay. 
um, staff's response at this time to the Part 4 designation. Uh, we believed uh, originally through the application process that the most uh, prudent way to deal with this was within the district plan itself and we have worked within the settlement to conserve individual attributes which actually exceed the district plan uh, as well as conform with the plan. So we believe that's an appropriate response on this site. Thank you. Uh, are, are you able to, is the chief planner or the solicitor able to comment on what our success might be if we rejected the settlement? I believe you may have some advice in that respect in the confidential attachment, but I prefer not to speculate in public. Okay, thank you very much. So you would like to, Councillor Layton, release it? Uh, yeah, just speak to the item. Okay. Uh, this has been an impossible <coughs> item for a, a new local councillor <coughs> with a word of this magnitude, with the complexity of this file to to really do justice to. I'd like to thank staff uh, for their hard work on this over the years. Um, sometimes, and for those, uh, for, for councillors who are newer to, uh, to this arena, I think you'll probably find quite quickly, sometimes the smallest developments are the most challenging. And they're challenging to everyone, to staff, they're challenging to developers, they're challenging to the community. And staff advice on, on this item is based on two years of work, uh, but it evolved over time. And it has, has at times recognized the heritage attributes of the, in, uh, of the, the, the site as a whole, um, as well as uh, a, an individual building on the site. And it has been, I'm sure, very difficult for them to, to navigate some of, those, uh, uh, some of those judgments. I'm going to be, I, I hope everyone has read the reports on this. Uh, I, I just wanted though, I, I'm gonna be uh, voting with the local community on this. And I tell you, it, it, it hasn't come easily. Um, and this isn't to object to the application itself and the approval of what is to come. Uh, but more about what is, is lost. And uh, I think that it's important for me to demonstrate uh, to the development community uh, just uh, how applications of, of this sort and, and changes in information as they come uh, will be treated, uh, in particular in, uh, in an HCD. Uh, I would, I would there, is a, there is a portion of uh, the confidential attachment that I suspect will become public uh, that, that attempts to address some of the shortcomings that, uh, that, that have been identified. And I, I won't go into them in, in great detail, but we've been working closely with staff on that. And, and through that, I hope that we don't end up with an application uh, that uh, is like this again in front of us. And thank you very much for holding it and for your couple minutes of time. Thank you. Would you like a recorded vote? Oh, Councillor Wong Tam, you wanted to speak on this? Briefly, Madam Speaker. Um, as the outgoing councillor of the area who's represented the area for eight years, I can concur with what Councillor Layton has just said. Uh, this, uh, this particular application uh, caused a, a lot of stress and, and, uh, and friction amongst the community. I think what we can uh, take uh, some encouragement from is that, uh, that there is a lot of engagement and especially through a, almost a nearly two year working group uh, that was largely convened uh, by city staff and attended by the applicant and a number of, uh, of residents who, uh, who all gave their time willingly to participate in good faith to negotiate to what I think was, a, uh, what was an outcome. Um, this was probably the, one of the most unusual files that I had ever uh, been a part of and, uh, and this item was before you uh, members uh, in the last term. Uh, it should have been probably dealt with then, uh, but it was not. And, uh, and so therefore, uh, it was, uh, it's now before us again. But I can tell you that uh, all opportunities for consultation and engagement have pretty much been exhausted. I think that there are probably uh, some forces that will not be able to be satisfied uh, simply because there were some, some comments provided by staff early on uh, that probably gave them some, uh, 
some, some belief that they were heading in one direction. Uh, and, then, and then based on some modifications, revisions to the application, uh, then, you know, opinions started to change. All that being said, I just want to, members to note that there is a confidential attachment uh, before you. Um, and that confidential attachment uh, is, um, uh, I believe we should adopt that uh, as per the suggestion and recommendation of staff. I believe it's probably the very best outcome uh, that could uh, be, be put forth before the community. I also recognize that Councillor Layton is in a very difficult position. Um, however, um, given the fact that we have a staff report, that is giving us a certain uh, recommendation. Um, I, th I do think that that is the, the very best outcome uh, given everything that the community as well as city staff have, uh, have negotiated. Um, I believe that this is uh, uh, something that we, we should support. Um, and, uh, and I don't have any hesitations in saying so because I know the staff have done the very best that they can uh, to get us to this place today. Thank you very much. Okay, on the item recorded vote. Councillor Peritza, please. The item is adopted 18 to 4. Okay. <coughs> so our next item is on page 5, CC 1.27, Councillor Fletcher. You held the item down? Yeah, I think we have to go on camera for that. You want to go on camera? Yes, yes. Yeah. Do okay. Yeah, we only have two more two more items. Councillor Perks, page six, MM one point three. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I've been in conversation with Councillor Bradford and I believe he has a solution that lets us get out of this and we can do it quickly. Okay, Councillor Bradford. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'd like to move the motion as amended. Do you have an amendment? I have an amendment. Um, we are going to be uh, requesting City Manager to undertake the following actions in response to the collapse of the pedestrian bridge at Crescent Town. Um, you know, this is about public safety. We have to do everything that we can. Uh, to respond to this and to make sure that uh, our procedures and uh, everything that we have in place top to bottom is as safe as possible. Um, so we uh, uh, moving the motion to use an internal auto resources to undertake an internal review of the circumstances and actions uh, with, with respect to the parties involved in the Crescent Town Bridge collapse uh, in November. Okay, so on the amendment, on favor, carried. Oh, that's the item. You want a recorded vote? Recorded vote. Councillor, by allow your vote, please. The motion carries 21 to 1. Councillor Robinson, MM 1.11. One. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, I'll try to be brief, but just some, um, you know, year-end uh, review of uh, Vision Zero and our road safety plan in Toronto, which is a comprehensive plan, not a piecemeal one, which is basically what Council was doing prior to our adoption of Vision Zero. And uh, we, have, we have a rough year on the roads again, but uh, we're down from 2016, but unfortunately we've exceeded just barely uh, 2017. So I wanted to put some of these motions forward um, to ensure that we're fast-tracking, accelerating, 
and, and pushing these issues forward. Uh, the first motion is related to... Um, oh, sorry. Looks like we have questions to staff. Absolutely. I, I just started because I was directed yeah, to... Yeah, nobody had their name up. Okay. Pardon? Yeah, they're up there now. They weren't up there earlier. <laughs> Come on, this is the last item, members. Last item. Councillor, Councillor McKelvey. Great. Yeah, second last. So I just have a few questions for staff, and I'm assuming this is members' motion 1.11. Give them a chance to send Yes. 1.11. Okay. Yes. So your question to staff. They settle? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the second part of this uh, is to ensure accelerated implementation of all remaining school safety zones by the end of 2019. And uh, my question is, there is the active and safe routes to school pilot program that is currently operating at five schools, including Moorish, which is uh, in my ward. And my question is, how is Data being, is any data being collected in real time and is that data being then used to make decisions for this rollout that's proposed through all the other schools in 2019? Uh, through the speaker, there is data that's being collected uh, continually around uh, speed and around volumes. Um, certainly the school safety zone, the, different than the pilot project that the one you're talking about at Moorish, had a specific um, frame and a specific set of outcomes uh, related to the grant funding that we received through the Bloomberg Partnership. Uh, those five schools are separate than the rollout of the full school safety zone program, which is about assessing a broader area beyond the immediate 150 meters in front of the school and using uh, signage and uh, mobile watcher speed signs and pavement markings to enhance that area and do a thorough and comprehensive review. So we were funded last year to do 100 schools under that program, and uh, we will continue to work to get uh, the, the balance of them done uh, probably in through 2020 just because of the volume. And the lessons that are being learned through that pilot program will be rolled out to the other schools in the future as well? Uh, there's a pretty robust monitoring program that's a requirement of the grant and of course one that we would do as well and so certainly lessons learned will be rolled out to other schools as we do those assessments and identify which are the uh, actual um, investments that we want to make there that are going to solve the problem at those specific school locations. So not all of them are, are going to be the same. And it looks like this motion is dealing mostly with structural elements uh, for traffic calming, et cetera. Is there anything in here as well that's dealing with more of a social consideration, so encouraging children to walk to school, for example? We partner with Green Communities Canada on a travel planning, route travel planning program. It's in 15 schools, I believe, this year, and we're looking, I know TDSB leads that program, and we're looking to expand those efforts as well, because as you point out, the education of the students is as critical and as and important as um, as the implementation of the signage and the striping and the physical improvements. Great. And then in particular pertaining to item three that is talking about tra the transition of the crossing guard program from transportation services to Toronto Police Service. I've already had numerous calls about shortages of crossing guards as we move through this transition. Is there anything that's being done in the interim because right now three months is a long time for some of these schools to wait for crossing guards? So Toronto Police Services is still uh, managing the crossing guard program. Transportation in the 2018-19 school year is responsible for backfilling those guards that either have retired or they haven't showed up for that day. And so we have a contractor dealing just with the backfill portion. The volume of backfill has been much more significant and so we are looking at many, many strategies to make sure that especially into the beginning of 2019 we do not have uh, the kinds of shortages that we've had in the first part. Uh, we are also working on a uh, request f to actually take over the program in transportation. Again, Toronto Police Services is leading that effort right now. And so we have learned a lot from uh, the actual volume of this backfill and also what we're going to need to do on the go forward that we're building in to that uh, request for proposals right now and working uh, with the city manager's office and police services to hope that transition can be as smooth as possible. And my final question is in pertaining to item six here. 
and it specifically calls out ways and I'm just wondering why other uh, mapping programs aren't being looked at for example Google Maps and others that are also in use why specifically just ways so uh, we actually so ways in Google I believe I think uh, Google's ha has pr has purchased ways but we have a, an agreement with okay. ways to have a data we have a data sharing agreement with ways now in order to ensure that our uh, construction information and our crash data can be fed into ways in a much more uh, comprehensive manner uh, and so we will we continue to meet with them uh, on a relatively regular basis and so we'll continue to do so and, and are happy to explore options for other other providers as well thank you you're welcome thank you deputy mayor Min and Wong hi thank you um, some questions um, how many uh, speed limiting devices have we put in so far Through the speaker, and what do you mean? Oh, 99 what? Watch your speed. Oh, uh, through the speaker. Of uh, the watch your speed signs, are those the speed The whole thing, devices? the whole Vision Zero, I put in this, put in that, that can be attributed oh. to spending on Vision Zero. Yeah, we have a, we have a lot. Uh, 99 mobile watch your speed signs. We've put in uh, 343 community safety zones. We've completed um, 35, more than 35 curb radii reductions, which narrow the crossing distance for pedestrians. We've done, uh, as I mentioned, well, the total of uh, mobile watcher speed signs is 188, both the temporary and the permanent. Uh, we've put in 80 leading pedestrian intervals, which is the uh, signal timing that gets pedestrians across the street, gives them more crossing time. We've cleared out the backlog of speed humps. We've done 91 segments which is what the backlog and the 2018 proposal was. We've completed the five schools, the active and safe routes to school pilot. We've installed 53 senior safety zones at signage and pavement markings and signal timing. Uh, we've put in 56 school safety zones. We've done, uh, we're in the process of completing 12 cycling corridor enhancements. We've done 76 successful pedestrian signals, installed uh, 59 red light cameras, and inspected well over 7,000 kilometers of sidewalk. Uh, as well as uh, rolling out education and safety campaigns. And, spe and how much have you spent? We have spent, thanks for asking, uh, we have spent, we've committed uh, 18, wait, we've committed uh, 24 million under the acceleration program because we've also done some lighting, some street lighting upgrades, enhancements on uh, pedestrian safety corridors and school safety zones. Uh, and we have spent to date uh, a little over 11 million. 15. What? 15 million. We've spent 15 million and we have committed the rest to complete uh, in 2019. So I have no reason to, to disbelieve the facts that Councillor Robinson put in her motion, but there's been 63 deaths this year, yes? Uh, we are at 63 total 64. deaths, 38 pedestrians, yep. So, so my question is, is um, what should we be looking at in terms of success? So, how, so is, if that number is supposed to go down, when is it supposed to go down, and by how much? Well, I think um, we have uh, uh, a number. So Vision Zero uses, as you know, a number of tools in order to address uh, preventable fatalities and injuries on the roadway. Yes. Uh, engineering improvements are critical among them, especially okay. those that help to reduce speed and shorten crossing distances. Yes. So that we certainly need to do more of. Raising awareness and education so that we can affect a culture change is certainly something we need to do more of. Uh, and then uh, certainly we're looking, continuing to look at automated speed enforcement and addition of red light Sorry. cameras, which have Madam proven Chair, to just, be uh, Maybe I can be, I, I think uh, Ms. Gray is missing my question. So at the Vision Zero is supposed to reduce the number of accidents and fundamentally hopefully reduce the number of deaths. And I, I'm just curious in terms of, you're telling me what you're doing, but I'm just, I don't have any measurement. You're saying the, 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 what you're doing itself is, a, is, an, is an end in itself, but it's a means to an end. The end, the, the end is the reduction of accidents, fatalities, and injuries. And I'm saying, what is your measure of how, sh how many, de you know, how should it come, come down? When should it come down? There's no, there's no benchmark to tell us that this money that we're putting in is actually reducing the number of injuries. Maybe there is. Maybe you can tell me. 
what should we expect for the money that we're getting? Well, I think we giving. track every year what those injuries and fatalities are. We have better data collection to understand what the specific issues are and then can propose a countermeasure at locations that are going to make a difference. And so I think what we're going to see over time is that the number will start to go down. We know our partner cities like in New York who have been very aggressive at road redesign and safety improvements have seen the numbers go down quite dramatically. We also know that there are those years when the numbers don't necessarily go down as well because it is also about culture change, which is not something that you can affect uh, effectively in a year's time. By how much should we expect? Like, I'm just saying... The target zero because we don't think that any loss of life... That's a target on, of where we want to yep, go. Yeah, because we don't think that's that not any... A, sorry, Madam Chair. Just to be clear, should, uh, should this council say we're giving you... Because Council Robinson's motion wants us to expedite spending, and I'm all in favor of that. But I'd like to know, you know, you're putting up signs here and there and all these counters and things like that, and you're hiring all sorts of people and you, all sorts of engineers. Yep. 63 deaths, that's a lot of deaths. Oh, that is, it's a horrible thing, uh, 64. I just want to know, next year, are we going to see the numbers go down? Like, what, am I, what, what should this council, what should the public expect for all this money that we're investing? Well, I think that we should start to see the numbers go down. And I also think as the population grows, a much better way to look at that is about a rate and not about a number. Because as we know, as the population grows and we have more people who are using the system, we are probably going to see more exposure. And I think what other cities have found who have done Vision Zero is that that number is something that is critical to track. And the types of investments that we're making are exactly the same types of investments that those cities are making as well. And so we will continue to work towards zero because we don't believe that any loss of life on the roads is acceptable. Could you you tell us what that number should be next year? I don't know what the number should, will be next year. I hope it's less than this year, but I can't tell you what it's going to be next year. So there's really no way of measuring the investment then? Well, I think there is a way of measuring the investment. I think we can measure uh, whether speeds are going down. We measure it all the time. We're looking at near-miss collisions to understand if the way that we're designing the roads is actually having an impact on people's behavior. We're doing focus groups. We're doing surveys to gauge that change. So I think there is a way to measure it. And when we come back to this council uh, mid-next year with, a, with our Vision Zero 2.0 plan, I think we will see many more specific uh, details about that. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Ms. Gray, I won't be long. Much of the questions I had the Deputy Mayor um, had asked, but uh, it, it has come to my attention that um, in the Scarborough area of the City of Toronto, we have seen a higher percentage of uh, individuals who have been in occurrences uh, involving traffic, bicycle, and so on, that has, in many cases, been fatal. Could you perhaps help us to understand why that would be, particularly in Scarborough, because we have, I understand we have wider roadways and so on, and then more narrow in the downtown core, because oftentimes when you listen to the media, it seems to be that the suggestion it's happening more in the downtown core, but the numbers I had recently, which was alarming to me, that it is, in fact, in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. I think what we've seen uh, this past year is that 40 percent of the crashes that have been uh, fatal or uh, killed or serious killed or serious injury crashes have been in Scarborough. 40 or 46 percent? I thought it was 40 percent. I, 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 I heard 46. 40, I just want to make sure I have it's, that on. It's, it's a big number. Yes. Um, and most of them have been seniors. Seniors, yes. Most of them uh, have been more alarming seniors. As well. So uh, a combination of things. I think you point out accurately that the blocks are quite long, right. multi-lane roads, the speeds tend to be higher. Right. Uh, a lot of people are going to be crossing at desire lines and they want to uh, go from the bus stop to home and they don't necessarily want to walk the long distances to get to the intersection to make a cross, which isn't the choice we would want them to make. Uh, part of it is working with the TTC, which we are doing on moving stops. Right. Part of it is looking at what we can do to slow speeds and narrow those crossing distances. Right. In some cases, it's about mid block crossings right. uh, and traffic signals, all things that can be challenging because uh, of the way the land uses are, are arrayed, I think, in Scarborough. And then um, also, because it's seniors, uh, they tend to have uh, a lower rate of recovery when they do get hit and injured. So that's another piece of the puzzle. So, so you're assuring us here today that the work as part of Vision Zero is you're working towards addressing this issue that is obviously creating um, this fundamental challenge and difficulties. In my ward alone, we've had a number of fatalities, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so on the issue, and you, you, you talked to the deputy mayor around 
um, electronic devices and so on, road cameras and so on. I've seen in, in, in places around the world where I don't see a police officer on the street, but I see people, their driving behavior is reflective of the understanding that they're being monitored. Now, we're not doing that yet here, per se, to the degree that I see elsewhere. With respect to Vision Zero, mm -hmm. at what point will that become part of our reality? Because it appears to me, even when I drive through my neighborhood and areas in the, in the ward uh, on a Saturday or a Sunday, if I'm going 35 or 40 kilometers, somebody wants to go 60 through a neighborhood. When then can we be expecting to see uh, some changes, and I realize it's challenging, but I'd like to see if you... Well, no, I appreciate the question because the first thing we did this year was roll out more of the mobile watcher speed signs. So that gives people information to make a better choice about their speed, and as I said, we did 188 of those in the last six months of this year. And then we are actively working both uh, internally here at the city as well as with the province and the police on automated speed enforcement. And I think that once we have the authority to go ahead and move, uh, move ahead with automated speed enforcement, we're testing technology technology right now. We're not issuing any tickets or warnings, but we're testing right. technology. But we will be coming back to Council in January with a report that talks about our plan for automated speed enforcement in 2019. Sure. I think I have two more questions. One, I wanted to see if we can get some of that information, the data that you were providing um, to the, the to Councilor Bin and Wong, yep. um, to us fundamentally, uh, as, uh, to, to help us be able to maybe report out to our community. But on the educational piece, <laughs> Because I've seen people, in, in my own case, I've, you know, unfortunately came close to hitting someone that I didn't see who actually just darted out in front of a truck. And there was no way that I could have seen that person. Thank God it didn't happen. But how are we um, planning to help to educate uh, our citizens about the fact that it's a collaborative approach to road safety and safety in general while we tend to look at the drivers, but also we need to also look at pedestrian and how people are utilizing the roadway, not just darting out into the road and so on. How, how are we uh, focusing on educating the population? Because we have a, and I see the advertising for, I think the basketball announcer who does the, 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 the trash piece. I don't see us doing something for road safety in this manner. I'm just so, wondering, do you, is there a plan? Yeah, so in fact, we've rolled out two campaigns this year, and we're going to continue to push those out. The first is about how to use uh, the, ro the road, and so we're going to be sending those out uh, pretty broadly. We put them out on bus backs, we put them out on transit shelters, and we have a big social media campaign. And then uh, just about a month and a half ago, we launched our big Art of Distraction campaign, including uh, some installations out uh, in Scarborough, one at uh, Victoria Park. Uh, and we will continue to utilize and leverage that campaign much more broadly in 2019 as well. So we did the initial launch in November when, of course, the light levels are lower. We tend to see an increase in crashes, and we will continue to roll out those materials. And we can get those out to you so you can get them out to your constituents as well. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our, our members of council, um, our regular um, schedule for council is that we adjourn re at 8 o'clock. So we might have to come back tomorrow. No, I know, but that was that was until 8 o'clock. Yeah, that was not ex yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. No, I know, but if we knew that we were going to go beyond 8 o'clock, we would have had our break. Yeah. So I'm sorry, but this is not what the intent of that motion was. And it looks like we're going to go quite longer because we're going to go in camera as well. So I think we might have to just come back tomorrow. Yeah, I think that's, well, it's 20 to 8, and we'll move a motion to come back tomorrow. Councillor Fletcher? Just a very quick question about the, the uh, crossing yeah. guard program. Are, is the school board aware of that? Because I've had schools say they don't have a crossing guard and they're told by the police that that's not their responsibility and phone 311. So we have schools calling 311 at this point, which is upsetting for everybody. I wonder if you could address that. The, the schools should be aware. It is still the police's program. We're happy to get in touch with schools directly if there's confusion about that. I think, and the police. They're the ones who are also confusing the schools. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
That was fast. Councillor Robinson. I've got four or five. And like that, we want to finish the yeah, agenda. Yeah, I'm going to go really quickly. Automated speed enforcement, we've done all the approvals. We've run a pilot. You can't actually penalize people because the province is holding that up. Is that correct? And we're, where is that at? We are waiting for the regulations to be confirmed by the province. I don't have a time frame on when that's going to be complete. So you still don't, still don't have an answer? Nope. Okay. The placement of your speed signs, uh, can councillors influence those or what, how do you determine where they go? We did the mobile signs, which we did. We were able to do four per ward, in fact. We were uh, starting out, we thought we'd only be able to do one, and then the rest we put in locations where the safety data told us that we were having speeding issues and needed uh, reminder signs. Okay. And then uh, that lovely summary you did of all the work you've done um, with numbers, et cetera, would it be possible for you to summarize that and send that to every city councillor so they can have a snapshot of the work transportation has done on this file? Absolutely. Would that be feasible? Thank you. Yeah, super fast. So, Councillor Robinson, you were asking questions? Oh. Okay. Okay, Councillor Robinson to speak. Um, I, then I got, we have time for two speakers. Okay. Councillor Robinson. I'll be very quick. Um, again, the motion before you, it basically recognizes the work that's been done to reduce road fatalities. Uh, clearly acknowledging there's much more work to do and this motion includes directions and requests on the budget allocation, accelerated rollout, enhanced research partnerships, year-round construction uh, contracting which will help facilitate traffic calming much more quickly, something I found out from a, a junior staffer, uh, traffic navigation technology and school crossing guard improvements. So that's a nice summary of what uh, this motion is related to. It's a good year-end summary, uh, things we have to focus on, highlight and work on. As I said, um, in 2016 we had 78 deaths on our street, last year 63, this year 64, so there's much work to do. And uh, Council certainly has implemented the plan aggressively. We've increased the program funding multiple times and accelerated it six times. If this happens through the budget process 2019, it will be seven times accelerated. So um, basically, uh, we, we look at school safety zones. My understanding is they can't pull, it, pull that off by 2019, but they're working hard to facilitate that. School crossing guard program, uh, Councillor McCalvey, I've heard the exact same thing, and so that's why I moved that. And then talking a little bit here about uh, more research, best practices, international best practices, and lastly, looking at technology and how it impacts our local roads. So I hope you'll support these motions before you. Thank you very much. Councillor Kergianis. Thank you. I, I would be amiss if I didn't thank uh, uh, Barbara and her team. Uh, last year I had a death in uh, my ward and they moved quickly. And uh, I have to tell you the work that they've done it's, it's immense. I, I thank them very much and uh, also speaking on behalf of my community, they really, really appreciate what you've done. However, I'll be knocking at your door very soon with more schools. Dr. McKelvey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I stayed late tonight and missed the Charlottetown Junior Public School concert because this is such an incredibly important issue for our ward, including for my daughter's school as well as all of those schools around us. It's the number one thing that I heard at the doors throughout uh, the ward. I hope that everybody here realizes just how important the safety of our school zones are and how important it is to protect our children. And I hope you'll all vote yes for this motion. And I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Robinson for bringing this forward today because it's incredibly important. Thank you. Thank you. On the item, recorded vote. <laughs> Councillor Karagiannis, please. Councillor Crawford, Councillor Pruitza.
The item carries unanimously, 23 in favor. See, it was carried unanimously. The point is we could have, we could have dealt with it in two minutes. Okay. Um, our last item is CC 1.27, appointment of deputy city manager. Councillor Fletcher would like to go in camera. So, I have to put a motion through. Yeah. We have to vote on it, yeah. Okay, put the motion on the screen. Okay, can somebody read it out? Councillor Fletcher? the whole and closed session to consider CC 1.27 appointment of a deputy city manager reason for confidential information personal matters about an identifiable person okay recorded vote This is a recorded vote to go in camera. The motion carries 19 to 4. Okay, let's vacate the council chambers.
Okay. Okay, this meeting is resumed. City Council has completed its closed session consideration of item CC 1.27, headed appointment of a deputy city manager. No motions were made in closed session. We will now proceed to the public debate on the item. Councillor Fletcher, you would just like to move the item? Yes, I would, uh, Speaker. I'd like to move the item. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, recorded vote. The item carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Yes, really Councillor Thompson, you have a motion to introduce certain bills. I do, Speaker. That leave be granted to introduce Bill 5 to 70 five. and 72 inclusive. Shall leave be granted to introduce these bills? Recorded vote. Councillor Matlow, please. The motion to introduce the bills carries, unit, carries 21 to 1. Shall these bills be passed and declared as a bylaw? Recorded vote. Councillor Thompson, please. Deputy Mayor Min and Wong, please. The motion to enact the bills carries 21 to 1. Councillor Peruzza, you have a motion to introduce a confirming bill. Uh, I do, Speaker, and I have to tell you, I haven't been asked to do one of these uh, since I was first elected here some many, many councils ago. So I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy to do it. It feels like I'm, 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 it's like a maiden event of sorts. So I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do that for the class of 25, of 25 all right? Yeah. The leave be granted to introduce a bill to confirm to the point of introduction of this motion the proceedings of council on meeting one on December 4th, 5th, and 13th, 2018. Shall leave be... Shall he be granted to introduce this bill? Recorded vote. <laughs> Motion to introduce the confirming bill carries unanimously 22 in favor. Shall this bill be passed and declared as a bylaw? Recorded vote. Councillor Layton, please. A motion to enact the confirming bill carries unanimously 22 in favor. Okay, thank you to members of council, thank you to staff, and Merry, Merry Christmas. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>